Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming in this morning. I hope we have a fantastic day. It's a great crowd, and I think we'll probably get a few more people in as we go. Uh, my name's Tim Bryant. I'm from the Department of the Senate. And in conjunction with the Rule of Law Institute of Australia, we are co-hosting this symposium. Uh, my job is just to do a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over. So, um, just to let you know that today's symposium is being live streamed on the uh, Parliament of Australia website and proceedings will be published in a future issue of the Senate Journal, Papers on Parliament. Tea and coffee will be available in the foyer during the break at 10 past 11 uh, and toilets are also located in the foyer up the stairs uh, or the lift, there's a lift there and if you make your way back along the corridor as well you'll see some toilets further down. Uh, it would be appreciated if you could please silence all mobile phones for the duration of the symposium. Uh, I'll be making that adjustment myself when I get off the stage. Um, if anyone does use a hearing aid, we'd encourage you to sit at the outside ends of the rows to take advantage of the hearing loop, uh, which is in operation in this room. If anybody needs any assistance today, please come and see me or any of our, uh, my Senate colleagues and we'll do our best to help you. Uh, just a reminder about car parking, those of you who have used it, um, we understand if you need to pop out occasionally to uh, move your car if you want to keep the parking costs down to a minimum. Um, and that's really it from me. So now I'd like to ask the Clerk of the Senate, Dr Rosemary Lang, and the Chair of the Magna Carta Committee, Mr Nicholas Cowdery, AMQC, to get proceedings underway. Rosemary. Thank you, Tim. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you very much for coming today. It's a great crowd. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we meet and pay respect to all Indigenous elders past and present. Can I say at the outset that the President of the Senate, the Senator the Honourable Stephen Parry, sends his apologies for not being able to be here this morning, uh, but unfortunately urgent matters intervened. Now this year we can't have escaped the fact that it's the 800th anniversary of the sealing of Magna Carta in 1215 by King John of England. The Parliament of Australia is proud to be the custodian of one of only four surviving copies of the 1297 exemplification of Magna Carta and one of only two 13th century copies held outside the UK. And if you haven't seen it yet, it's um, on this floor, just back along towards the entrance on the Senate side. Can't miss it. The Parliament's acquisition of its Magna Carta in 1952 was the result of a rather unlikely and quite fortuitous alignment of events involving a determined and energetic parliamentary librarian seeking to build a, a national collection, a Magna Carta from the county of Surrey separated from its companion documents which were later destined for the British Library, an impoverished Somerset private school seeking to capitalise on an unexplained Magna Carta that it found in its uh, midst, a warm regard for Australia in post-World War II Britain and at the time much looser export controls than exist now, and uh, an Australian Prime Minister willing to make £12,500 sterling available from his own department to purchase the manuscript for the nation. Now, once Magna Carta arrived in Australia, it was housed in an argon gas enclosure built by the CSIRO. It was state-of-the-art technology for the time, and it's lasted well. It's still in that original casing with the original argon gas. And it was then put on more or less permanent display in, members, in King's Hall in Old Parliament House from 1961. Magna Carta soon became a parliamentary fixture. Critics of the purchase suddenly became defenders. Claims by the National Library to ownership were fended off and Magna Carta was committed to the care of the, and responsibility of the presiding officers of parliament in 2005. There's much about Magna Carta to capture the imagination of those who have inhabited this building. 
Prime Minister Menzies declared it one of the great documents of our history and marvelled that it could be how old and yet how modern. Leader of the opposition, the, on, the Honourable um, Bert Evatt, said it was a priceless possession that embodied the rule of liberty under law and hatred of arbitrary government or despotism. Former clerk of the Senate, the late Harry Evans, wrote of Magna Carta that all written constitutions, including our own, and all declarations of rights are its descendants. Sir Kenneth Anderson, in 1968, Parliament is the most precious thing in our way of life, and it stems initially from the Magna Carta. Now, this might not be literally true, with many finding that the antecedents of Parliament lie elsewhere in assemblies of, of magnates and high churchmen from Anglo-Saxon times, but there is much in Magna Carta for modern parliamentarians to ponder, including the levying of taxes by rulers requires the consent of the realm and the need for avenues for the redress of grievances, functions that the parliament continues to perform today. Former President of the Senate, the Honourable Sir Alastair McMullen, and Speaker of the House, the Honourable John Maclay, wrote in 1959, remarking that in tracing the evolution of a thousand years of parliamentary government, one will find the emphasis remains always on one clear principle, namely that of the monarch acting with counsel and consent. In its more modern form, that great principle is epitomised in the immortal words of Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, for the people. So in today's symposium, we consider Magna Carta's journey through the centuries and what it means to us in modern Australia. Does it deserve awe and reverence? Are there grounds for the lofty ideals attributed to it? What does it mean for the law, the parliament and the executive? How has it appeared in print, in translation, in visual representation and in the popular imagination? We will cover all this today. Today's symposium on Magna Carta is the final public event in the parliament's year-long celebration of this very important document. It's also the result of collaboration between the Senate Department and the Rule of Law Institute of Australia. And I'd like to thank Nicholas Cowdery, Robin Speed and Richard Gilbert for their very generous assistance in arranging today's symposium. The colourful Magna Carta banners around the room are also the work of the Rule of Law Institute. And I encourage you all to take a closer look during the break for morning tea because they're quite lovely. So now I'd like to hand over to Nicholas Cowdery, Chair of the Magna Carta Committee of the Rule of Law Institute of Australia, to also say a few words to get us going this morning. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's my pleasure also to welcome you to today's symposium. Uh, in this Magna Carta anniversary year, it has been my privilege to serve as chair of the Magna Carta Committee of the Rule of Law Institute of Australia, of which I'm also a board member. Uh, the Institute, founded in 2009, is the only national body of its kind. It is an independent, politically non-partisan, not-for-profit association formed to uphold the rule of law in Australia. It aims to promote discussion and understanding of the importance of the principles which underpin the rule of law by engaging with the community and with government. It operates a very active website, comments on bills before parliament, writes media articles and reports, holds an annual conference on current rule of law issues and provides speakers at other conferences and meetings. And I acknowledge the presence here of two pivotal players in the Institute's development, Robin Speed and Richard Gilbert. Importantly, the Institute operates education programs in schools, principally in New South Wales and Queensland, but occasionally elsewhere. And it pursues initiatives to provide school and university students with an understanding of the importance of rule of law principles and how they relate to contemporary issues. It employs three full-time qualified teachers for these purposes. 
With the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta in 1215, well, at least 800 years of the idea of Magna Carta, uh, the Institute saw a crucial opportunity to reinforce those principles through the celebration of the events of that year and their legacy through the ages in so many parts of the world. It has featured prominently in our education programs this year and the Institute's teachers have been speaking about the importance of ideas from Magna Carta in schools throughout the states that we have contacted and there are a few legal studies classrooms that do not now have a poster copy of our Magna Carta hanging on the wall. We've held and supported many other events throughout the year and it's a great pleasure to be joining with the Department of the Senate to host today's symposium. The Senate has been an enthusiastic partner in this commemoration year. Uh, as an aside, you may also be interested to know that the International Bar Association, which is based in London, is holding three Magna Carta conferences this year, with the next one in a fortnight's time in Sao Paulo in Brazil. You can see that the ideas, or the idea of the essential characteristics of a free society, traceable back in many respects to the Magna Carta, is an idea that has taken hold in all parts of the globe. I shall have the pleasure of chairing the morning session of this symposium. There will be four speakers focusing in various ways on Magna Carta and the law. And I shall introduce them in turn as they come to speak. But before I do, I would also like to draw your attention to the exhibition the Rule of Law Institute has displayed. Uh, pay no attention to the quill pen uh, in this one over here. Uh, the document in 1215 was never signed by a quill pen or any other means, of course. It was sealed by the King's seal. Um, one of our education officers, Jackie Charles, uh, is here and she will be available to discuss any matters uh, relating to the Magna Carta that you might like to raise with her during the breaks in the course of today's proceedings. Jackie's sitting at the back at the moment. You also have a poster provided uh, left on your seats. Uh, it is a copy of a reproduction, so please bear with me, of the original Salisbury Cathedral Charter of Liberties of 1215, one of the four surviving original 1215 documents kept at Salisbury Cathedral. Uh, and that reproduction was made for the Institute by a very talented calligrapher in Sydney, Mrs. Margaret Layson, who has had the hobby of calligraphy throughout her life. She's a lady in her 80s now. She was a professional engineer, and I understand the first female engineer to serve on an oil rig in the North Sea. A very interesting connection between her professional occupation and her hobby of calligraphy. But uh, late last year, she made the reproduction of the Salisbury Cathedral document uh, in same size and identical reproduction. Uh, and that reproduction is presently on display in the Supreme Court of Victoria in Melbourne until the end of this month. It's been travelling around to various uh, places for people to see. Um, you, you will see from the poster that you have that there are many lines of medieval Latin script with many abbreviations in the words that are contained in it. Uh, and Mrs. Layson, I'm told, was able to do three lines at a sitting uh, on a table in her garage in Sydney. Uh, and it took her about 40 minutes to do a line. So there's a, a lot of work and a lot of care gone into the reproduction. And then the posters that have been taken from that reproduction have some of the chapters highlighted with a short commentary at the bottom 
to emphasize the important ones for you. And Jackie will have additional posters for you if you would like to take some extras away to give to other people. So with that introduction, um, it's now my great pleasure to welcome uh, the Assistant Minister for Multicultural Affairs, Senator the Honourable Conchetta Fieravanti-Wells, uh, to deliver the keynote address this morning. Uh, I am going to tell you something about the Senator that she doesn't want me to tell you, <laughs> so she will no doubt be squirming as I do this, but we learnt just as we were beginning this morning, that when she was performing in a school play which related to the Magna Carta, she played one of the barons. So, Senator, the mind. floor is yours. Thank you. That's why it's so vivid in my mind. Uh, look, thank you. Um, very, very much uh, to you, uh, Dr. Rosemary Lang, and to you, Mr. Nicholas Cowdery, for your kind and warm welcome, and for inviting me to deliver this keynote address at this event on behalf of the Attorney General, Senator the Honourable George Brandis uh, QC. Regrettably, the attorney was unable uh, to be here today and has asked me to pass on his best wishes. Can I also, in starting, uh, add my acknowledgement uh, of our country? Can I also acknowledge my fellow speakers, Professor Martin Krieger and the Honourable James Spiegelman and other distinguished guests. 2015 is a year rich with important centennial anniversaries. It is, of course, the centenary of Gallipoli. It is the bicentenary of Waterloo. And only a few days ago marked the 600th anniversary of another great English victory at the expense of the French, the Battle of Agincourt. It is also the 250th anniversary of William Blackstone's commem uh, commemorat commemoratories on the laws of England and a seminal treatise on the common law of England. And this morning, we gather to mark the 800th anniversary of an event which has attained mythical status in the century since, the genesis of the Magna Carta. As we celebrate this symbolic charter, we reflect upon how far modern society, in particular Australia, has come since the rather unremarkable day when King John affixed his seal to the Magna Carta in Runnymede, England on 19 June 1215. In the 800 years that have passed, Magna Carta has provided inspiration and support for progressive developments in democratic governance worldwide. It has been looked to symbolically as a guarantor of freedom and a regulator of arbitrary executive power. It was invoked through the constitutional struggles in Britain in the 17th century between the Crown and Parliament, culminating in the Bill of Rights of 1689 and the Act of Settlement of 1701. It influenced the American Constitution and Bill of Rights in the 18th century. And it was reasserted in the 20th century in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. In 1948, Eleanor Roosevelt, chair of the Human Rights Commission responsible for drafting the Universal Declaration proclaimed, we stand together at the threshold of a great event in the life of the United Nations and in, and in the life of mankind. This declaration may well become the international Magna Carta for all men everywhere. Australia has inherited the traditions which have evolved through constitutional struggles abroad and has been a leader in the advancement of human rights in the modern day. Following the aftermath of World War II, Australia played a key role in the development of the United Nations. Australia's President of the United Nations General Assembly, Doc Evatt, played a major role in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the United Nations and prepare for our upcoming appearance for Australia's second Universal Periodic Review, we reflect upon Australia's strong engagement uh, with the UN system. 
We are lucky to be a liberal democracy founded on the rule of law, but not all countries share this experience. This is why Australia is seeking a seat on the UN Human Rights Council for the 2018 to 2020 term. To strengthen our global leadership role and to share the benefit of our strong liberal democratic traditions. We have long been a leader for global abolition of the death penalty and would seek to use a seat on the council to further this work. We would also play a leadership role on five other key themes, freedom of expression, good governance, gender equality, rights of indigenous people, and strong national human rights institutions and capacity building. And so as we commemorate the anniversary of the Magna Carta and the United Nations, we also celebrate the liberal democratic principles and values that underpin our modern society. The separation of powers, representative and responsible government, the rule of law, individual liberties and the independence of the judiciary. Just as these common values are enshrined in the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, so are they in Magna Carta. How then did a single event in English history so long ago come to be so influential? We must begin with the story of the events on that, on that day, on 15 June 1215, when a group of aggrieved English barons wrote to me, rode to meet King John on a grassy stretch of meadow beside the River Thames. King John was desperate to put an end to the rebellion that had seen the city of London fall to rebel barons. The barons in turn hoped to extract concessions from the king on a host of issues. The document we call Magna Carta today is considered to be both a restatement of the old laws of the English past and a treaty of peace between these rebel barons, the church and the king. Magna Carta was heavily influenced by the Coronation Charter, confirmed by King John's father, Henry I, in 1100. The Coronation Charter was an earlier peace treaty, which set a strong precedent for further royal concessions and set a course towards modern constitutional democracy. The original Magna Carta was over three and a half thousand words and 63 clauses long. The first clause granted liberties to the church and subsequent clauses granted liberties to free men, referring to a limited class of powerful elite, barons and subjects of the church at the time. While the class of free men may appear narrow by today's standards, the liberties granted to them nonetheless represented a significant restriction on the power of the monarchy. While not the only formal charter of liberties granted by a medieval monarch, Magna Carta, it is um, the most detailed and the longest lasting of all of these documents. Lord Denning, one of the most influential judicial minds of the 20th, 20th century, and a favourite of all law students the world over, has said that it was the greatest constitutional document of all time. Most recently, Lord Judge described Magna Carta as the most important single document in the development of constitutional and legal freedom and adherence to the rule of law in the common law world. Our own former Chief Justice of Australia, Murray Gleeson, has described it as a defining document in a long history of legal constraint upon lawmaking capacity. Important though Magna Carta is, it, is, it has also been the victim of many exaggerated claims. In reality, Magna Carta was a failed treaty. Barely nine weeks after it was confirmed at Runnymede, King John had it quashed by Pope Innocent III. It was reissued on King John's death in 1216, then 1217, again in 1225, and was finally made into statute law in 1297. As one of the great fathers of English legal history, Frederick, Frederick Maitland famously said, it is never enough to refer to Magna Carta without saying which edition you mean. 
Indeed, it was named the Great Charter several years after the initial 1215 settlement, not in recognition of its importance, but because it was long. Irrespective of historical contests and differing interpretations of the significance of Magna Carta, its continuing status as a symbol of individual liberty and the supremacy of the law is a testament to its continued contemporary relevance. And so what is the continuing importance of Magna Carta for us here in Australia in 2015? Magna Carta continues to be considered by the Australian courts in cases concerning issues ranging from bankruptcy, criminal matters and native title. While there has been some judicial disagreement as to the contemporary relevance of the Magna Carta in Australia, there can be no disagreement with Justice Isaac's observation in the High Court of Australia in 1925, when he proclaimed Magna Carta to be the groundwork of all our constitutions. Magna Carta's enduring relevance to Western democracy can be explained in large part by our shared constitutional heritage. From England, we have inherited history, constitutional forms and traditions and political values. And with them, a system of democratic government, the rule of law and the principle of legality. Unlike other nations, our constitution was not drafted in the context of rebellion and revolt, but we share common roots in Magna Carta. It is some of these legacies which I would like to reflect on now. It is said that Magna Carta represented a grant of liberties to all free men of the kingdom. While some have been hasty to point out that the term free men carried a very different meaning in 1215, its mere existence was evidence of an early conception of the principle of the rule of law, the principle that all authority is subject to and constrained by law. The most oft-cited clause of the Charter, Clause 39, is said to embody this principle. No free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. Magna Carta asserted that the powers of even a king ruling by divine right were still, still subject to some limitation and, to use a modern word, some form of accountability. And in so doing, it marked a fundamental change in attitudes to the crown which over subsequent centuries would develop into limitations on government more broadly. In modern day Australia, this principle of accountability applies to the executive arm of government. To quote Robert Menzies, to ignore the constitution, to treat its structures and the limitations it imposes upon the powers of the Commonwealth Parliament as of no account, to endeavour by clamour to prevent recourse to the courts for its interpretation is to violate the whole conception of the rule of law. In Australia, executive accountability is guaranteed in part by the diffusion of power through separate arms of government, parliamentary scrutiny mechanisms and importantly, scrutiny by the Australian people through the right to engage in vigorous debate and the right to vote. Indeed, Australia was one of the first countries to implement secret ballots for elections, a system that is at the core of the democratic process and a system which can be traced back to the principles embodied in Magna Carta. The legacy of Magna Carta has also been inherited by Australia through the common law and the principle of legality. The time of Magna Carta was marked by tyranny and rebellion in which individual rights, in particular rights against the state, were not well understood. Magna Carta was pivotal to the establishment of these rights. During the 17th century, perceptions of Magna Carta evolved from being a compact between the monarchy and rebel barons to an affirmation of individual liberty. 
perhaps the most famous parliamentarian of the period who espoused this interpretation of the Charter was Sir, Sir Edward Cook. As Attorney General in the front line of the conflict between Parliament and James I in the early 17th century, Cook argued that the imposition of constraints on the King's power was consistent with notions of personal liberty. The rights and freedoms implied and inspired by Mag Magna Carta, due process, fair trial, the presumption of innocence and equality before the law are now firmly entrenched in our constitution and common law. The principles of precedence and legality have provided strong protections for common law rights and freedoms in Australia. Statutory provisions are not to be construed as abrogating important or fundamental common law rights, privileges and immunities in the absence of clear words or a necessary implication to that effect. While we are fortunate to live in times where individual liberties are well protected, this anniversary serves as a reminder that we must hold firm to these rights and freedoms, which were conceived long before Australia came to be. This year, as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Australian Law Reform Commission, it is reviewing the Commonwealth Statute Book for consistency with traditional rights and freedoms. In keeping with the spirit of Magna Carta, this review will seek to prevent an improper curtailment of these fundamental rights and freedoms. As the Prime Minister recently noted, it may seem paradoxical that we celebrate the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta at a time when laws are being adjusted, sometimes controversially, to ensure the security of our nation. But it is in these challenging times, as it has been throughout the course of history, that it is most important to look to enduring values and principles, those of the Magna Carta. It is incumbent upon all of us to ensure that its values and its vision are preserved for the next generation and for every generation thereafter. Thank you. Might I invite the, the next three speakers to come up to the uh, head table, Professor Krieger, Justice Spiegelman and Professor Clark. May I uh, introduce our next speaker, Professor Martin Krieger from the University of New South Wales on the topic of Magna Carta and the rule of law tradition, of which there has already been some mention. Uh, professor Krieger is the Gordon Samuels Professor of Law and Social Theory at the University of New South Wales and adjunct professor at the Regu Regulatory Institutions Network of the Australian National University. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Sciences and is on the editorial board of the Hague Journal on the Rule of Law and the editorial committee of the Annual Review of Law and Social Science. And as I said, he will speak on Magna Carta and the Rule of Law tradition. Professor Krieger. Thank you, Nick. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I think that covers everyone. Uh, those of you of a certain vintage, my vintage, and actually I can see a few in the audience, might recall uh, a line or a couple of lines from the James Taylor song, What a Wonderful World. Don't know much about the Middle Ages. Look at the books, turn the pages. Don't know much about no decline and fall. Don't know much about nothing at all. Well, there are a lot of us about, and so it's a bit odd, a priori, in, that this moment, this year, this whole year, culminating in today, we are, many people all over the world, and particularly the Anglophile world, are celebrating a document, or as we've heard, a bunch of documents. Few people have read, 
Those, among those few who have read them, many don't understand. And among those few that do understand, they have different and controversial views about what the meaning of these documents are, is, and uh, what their significance is, was then or is now. Because there's a simple question to which there's no simple answer. What have those fusty documents of 800 years ago got to do with us? And my answer will be more than you think, less than you think, and different than you think. Uh, and I'll seek to develop an argument which su supports those conclusions. My argument has five parts. First, I'll say, I'll just recall, and we've heard already some, I'll just recall some voices that have spoken about Magna Carta. I hope many of you will have uh, page to pages of purple passages which I've selected uh, from, on the one hand, what I call votaries or true believers, and on the other hand, skeptics. And I'll be referring to them. If you haven't read them now, you can take them on the way up and read them for the rest of the day. Uh, then I will uh, move to a, a point that I want to make, which I hope is not as banal as it sounds. I certainly do hope that because it sounds pretty banal. And that is that everyone is from somewhere. I'll seek to explain the significance of that. From there, I move from the first part of my title, Magna Carta, to the second part, the rule of law tradition, which I'll deal with in three stages. First, saying something about tradition. Secondly, saying something about legal traditions. And third, saying something about the rule of law tradition, out of which will emerge an estimate, my estimate, that uh, the Magna Carta deserves two cheers, and the rule of law tradition deserves three cheers. So combined, they deserve, I guess, five cheers. Anyway, it's a good combination. So let me start with what brings us here. There have been extraordinary things said, not only about the nature of Magna Carta, but about its significance for us. Many of them were just said uh, by, by the senator. Uh, Baroness Margaret Thatcher, as you'll see in your first purple passage, says that we in Britain, not an accidental emphasis, because she said it in Bruges, the capital of non-Britain, Europe, uh, are rightly proud of the way in which, since Magna Carta in the year 1215, we have pioneered and developed representative institutions to stand as bastions of freedom. This year, her successor, David Cameron, says that uh, it's a document that would change the world. Back then, it was revolutionary, altering forever the balance of power between the governors and the governed. Unless you wonder why a conservative prime minister should be so keen on a revolutionary document, he then goes on in the passage that I quote to say, after all, it's something every person in Britain uh, should be proud of. Liberty, justi justice, democracy, the rule of law, we hold these things dear, and we should hold them even dearer for the fact that they took shape right here, that is there, uh, on the banks of the Thames. But you don't have to be on the banks of the Thames to share these sentiments. And so we've heard that uh, former Chief Justice Murray Gleeson shares them, that um, Sir Robert Menzies shared them, that the, you haven't heard, but it's clear by the presence of the institution to which I belong, proudly, the Rule of Law Institute, it shares them. Uh, and I also have passages from uh, the present Chief Justice, Robert French, and from, again, his predecessor, Sir Gerard Brennan, who speaks of the Magna Carta as an incantation of the spirit of liberty. Well, you can't get much better than that. This is a document, or as it progressed through the 13th century, a number of documents, which have taken on what these days we called iconic status. But many people, or some people at least, and these are my skeptics, think that it's a false icon. And I quote three of them, but there are others. The first is a very distinguished constitutionalist from Chicago, uh, Professor Tom Ginsburg, who has an op-ed piece in the New York Times with the title, Stop Revering Magna Carta. Like the Holy Grail, he writes, the myth of Magna Carta seems to matter more than the reality. Uh, 
historian, the second person who is quoted in your list, uh, Dominic Selwood, a barrister, historian, novelist, says, and I'm sorry to say it in this house, but it's printed, the cult of Magna Carta is historical nonsense. No wonder old Oliver Cromwell called it Magna Fata. He says, despite widespread uh, beliefs about its origins, it actually contained very little of significance, didn't guarantee freedom to all true-born English people, subject the king to parliament, enshrine the notion of trial by jury. We get the drift. Finally, and most significantly, because of his eminence both as a, uh, as a judge, as a lawyer, and as a mega distinguished medieval historian, is Sir Jonathan Sumption of the UK Supreme Court. And he confesses in the beginning of a speech that it's impossible to say anything new about Magna Carta unless you say something mad. In fact, if you say something mad, the likelihood is that it will have been said before, probably quite recently. So you mustn't expect any startling new line from me, least of all in a centenary year, when something portentous is said about Magna Carta every day. And I'm sure today will be one of such day. The distortion of history to serve an essentially modern political agenda, which is what he attributes to lawyers as distinct from historians who know the truth, lawyers manufacture the truth, he says. Uh, this is all high-minded tosh. I'm not English, but I understand that's better than low-minded tosh, but it's not much better than that. Uh, and it, why do we do it? Well, he says, when we commemorate Magna Carta, perhaps the first question that we should ask ourselves is this. Do we really need the force of myth to sustain our belief in democracy? Do we need to derive our belief of democracy and the rule of law from a group of muscular conservative millionaires from the north of England? He doesn't say this, but remember, since we talk this language these days, dead white male barons. What do we need them for? Well, he says, uh, they thought in French, they knew no Latin or English, they died more than three quarters of a millennium ago. I hope, he says, we don't need them. So you have this squaring off between true believers on the one hand for whom, in a sense, it's all there. Everything that we value is there. And those who say nothing much happened then and it's just myth-making, particularly myth-making, Sumption insists, that developed in the 17th century. Magna Carta had a good run in the 13th century, its century, also in the 14th century. For next two centuries, people forgot about it. Then Sir Edward Cook was in a fight with James I, who was insisting on the divine right of kings, and he had a spark. He said, well, we can hit that. We can uh, oppose that with Magna Carta. Doesn't believe in the divine right of kings. And he bent his muscles to that effort successfully in, in Britain, as we know, uh, and the whole story, says Sumption, was his term swallowed whole by the Americans who made of it a career, a distinguished career, but after all, a 17th and 18th century career with nothing much he believes to do with the document that we're celebrating today. Now, two observations to make about this set two, this apparently, uh, this dichotomy between true believers, among them very intelligent people, and skeptics among them very intelligent people. The first is that each, in a sense, acknowledges something in what the other is saying. Many of the true believers will, after they've said it's all there, they'll say, it inspired or our principles are derived from, or they use organic metaphors of uh, a procreative sort. Uh, it was germinating there, or uh, it was there in embryo. Well, of course, a lot of embryos result in stillbirths, but this is thought to suggest a kind of organic, inevitable development from these dead white males uh, in 1215 and us. But the qualifications are significant. On the other side, of course, the skeptics know that we didn't just invent it yesterday, that they're talking about something. But they, I believe, are both wrong about the significance of Magna Carta and for the same reason. They make the same mistake about the significance of old and distinguished documents. And it's that mistake which I'll try to suggest a way to repair and try to supplement in what comes next. And now I come to my next banality. There will be a list of banalities, but I won't signal them all. But this one I can't get away from. It's called the second of the uh, parts of my, of my argument. Everyone is from somewhere. Many years ago, actually 25 years ago, I was writing a piece on 
Revolutions and the Continuity of Law with a Polish colleague and friend, Adam Czarnota. And his argument, or what he was trying to convince me to agree to, was that no revolution ever did anything new until the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. And I'm a shy man, I demurred a little, I said, but surely something happened in, uh, in, in, in the United States and France that was more than a little murmur. And he said, ah, once we learnt we were all equal in the sight of God, the rest is just interpretation. It's a smart remark, but of course, as an explanation, it's no use at all. Because from celestial equality, you can have inquisitions, you can have crusades, you can have colonialism, you can have slavery, and we had all of those. And not by people whose consciences, whose Christian consciences were hurting them, but very often their practices were justified by the people who had these beliefs. And in fact, those who believe that celestial equality, equality before the Lord, uh, should have some some implications for equality before the law, uh, and those who denied all of that quoted the same texts. So, as one uh, German sociologist, Hans Joas, puts it, maturation over centuries is not a sociological category. It's just a metaphor which, without more, explains nothing. We could have forgotten Magna Carta. There are a lot of documents in the 13th century, but we didn't. And so, those people who simply take us as though that we have this uh, untarnished uh, relic, it's not a word they would use, but an untarnished deposit which has come to us to frame our present ideas from the 13th century or qualify it with notions of embryology, uh, sorry, not embryo, yeah, I guess, uh, embryonic growth or, or germination, etc. It's all too swift. That's not the way history and traditions operate. And therefore, for skeptics to say, look, there's a bit of a difference between what the barons were on about saying that you should close fish traps in Britain except on the seacoast, which is one of the provisions of Magna Carta, it's, it's like shooting fish in a barrel to show these differences. It's easy sport. But it's easy sport for the same reason that the uh, true believers are, I think, uh, exaggerating, and it's easy sport which forgets something fundamental that the true believers believe, that is that there can be significant, long-lasting connections between ideas, beliefs, practices, as they're encoded in documents from a very long time ago, and uh, things that happen uh, much later. How is that possible? Well, the missing link is tradition, and so I'm going to say something about tradition. It's a word that everybody knows, but it's not a concept that people explore very much, and I think it deserves exploration just to get a handle on, on tradition, what, what, what they involve. One, uh, I should say one other thing. We shouldn't forget, and I understand Professor Sanderson will be reminding us, that Magna Carta was not the only game in town in the 13th century. It drew on an existing language, existing concepts, some of which came from Greece, some of which came from Rome, some of which were around in a larger Western legal tradition. In the same century as Magna Carta, there was the bull of, the golden bull of Hungary, not, one that many of you are likely to have heard too much about, uh, of 1222, very close in time. There was the German uh, statute for the uh, benefit of princes in 1232. This was the Magna Carta was speaking a language which was not unique to it. And it was not, we were not the only country in which it was spoken, even though it was not spoken in English. To come back to tradition. One uh, British philosopher, Michael Oakeshott, says that all activity, or practice, begins in an already existing idiom of activity. Questions and problems arise within the idiom of activity, and they can't arise without it. Uh, skeptics say, for example, make, some skeptics make a lot of the truth that Magna Carta was not the first enunciation of some of the liberties and some of the constraints on kings that was found in England, already was there for a couple of centuries, in Europe, and before that in the Roman Republic and in Greece. 
And of course, how could you, in the middle of a war, which is what it was between a king and barons, imagine that you could come to terms of agreement in the language of Mars made by Martians? You couldn't do it. You had to draw on thoughts and ideas that were already present. And then for the Magna Carta to be picked up by Cook in the 17th century, which Sumption says, that's really the start of it. Well, of course, Cook uh, was responding to 17th century problems which he faced, or which he believed the country faced. He was appalled by James I's uh, claim to the divine right of kings. He opposed it with a resurrection of what he called the ancient constitution of the law. Now, that's true. So this was 17th century renovation. But if Cook had been making his claims in Russia, a country which I study, either in the 13th century, and the Mongols had just invaded around the same time as, as uh, Magna Carta, if they made their plea to uh, the Mongol rulers, they wouldn't have got far. If they made their plea to Alexander Nevsky, who ruled on behalf of those rulers as their vassal, he wouldn't have got far. If they made their plea in the 17th century, when Cook was arguing with James I and Charles I lost an important part of his anatomy, this was not what happened in Russia at that time. And it wasn't, not because James I or Charles I or Oliver Cromwell or, or, or Cook were better people than Russian leaders. It was because, arguably, Russian political state traditions do not include, have not included, certainly then, notions of reciprocity and rule. Between rule and reciprocity, which is a large part of what we're talking about when we talk about Magna Carta, there is a lot of room for lawyers to exploit and political theorists to, to develop. And it happened. And in the West, it did happen. And that's a very important thing. In the East, it did not happen to the same way. The thing that distinguishes what Cook was doing in the 17th century to what Kukovsky was not able to do, sorry, there is no Kukovsky, but uh, in Russia, also in the 17th century, was the language, the ideas, the concept, which were common ground in Britain, which were not available everywhere, though they were available somewhere. Now, this idiom of activity, law schools very often despair, I know, because I've spent, I've been a inmate of a law school for a very long time. They despair often of teaching their students anything much other than to think like a lawyer. And learning to think like a lawyer is in large part becoming in your head and in your practices part of a tradition of thought, a way of thinking about certain problems. It's different, as we'll see in a moment, from thinking like an engineer. You don't just go for something because you think it's a great idea. You draw on the law or what you claim to be the law. Now, one of the mistakes I think people often make about, one of the reasons you have this set to between uh, true believers and skeptics, true believers think, well, how could that have anything to do with us unless it's transported without deformation to us? I mean, if it was in 1215, Either it's got nothing to do with us, or we must have got it all there. And the skeptic says, but we didn't get it all there because all this stuff you talk about, parliamentary government, representative government, no one had heard of it there or could even think of it there. Both are right. But what connects the two are traditions, which are very often misunderstood as a tradition is something past and unchanging. Intellectual traditions, traditions of thought, normative traditions, traditions of, of uh, of value are one, one uh, philosopher, Alastair McIntyre, who's written very insightfully about tradition, says, traditions are traditions of argument. What goes through, tra traditions involve continuities of argument over generations often about the goods that they entail. It's not that Suddenly, we learnt the truth in 1215, and we've been blessed ever since. There were arguments then, as I'm sure Professor Sanderson will tell us. Manderson, sorry. Uh, see, there's a distance between the real and the interpretation, even at this level. Uh, the arguments about the, the specific contents about, of Magna Carta, arguments about the role of kings, arguments about the rights of subjects, etc. Traditions carry arguments across generations. That is what they do. And 
They're significant, not because they're unchanging, they constantly change because people bring new arguments or resuscitate old arguments, but because the argument is available and the argument is afloat. And in this context, it's particularly notable that one, uh, the man considered the greatest of the historical uh, uh, writers on, historians writing on Magna Carta, uh, Professor Holt of Cambridge, said Magna Carta was too, th he didn't know about McIntyre's understanding of traditions, but it fits very well. He said, Magna Carta was two things. It was a document, but it was an argument. And when it was reiterated, the argument was reiterated. It was very often answered, and it was sometimes forgotten. But it was available to be resuscitated, to be amplified, to be twisted in ways that the originators may never have been able to conceive but in ways which depended, drew on the tradition of argument which connected them uh, to e each other. Uh, Aquinas, uh, McIntyre has a nice phrase about St. Thomas Aquinas, great uh, Catholic saint and theologian, who was born roughly the time of Magna Carta. And McIntyre, just in passing, says, Aquinas wrote out of a tradition. It's a very important thing to do. You don't, no one just invents this stuff out of whole cloth. He wrote out of a tradition and he wrote into a tradition. So certainly things, certain things which your kindness insists on, for example, the importance, uh, the distinction, which is an old one, between the ruler and the tyrant, an enormously important distinction, uh, which fed Magna Carta, which passed Magna Carta, and which is part of this tradition I'm talking about. Uh, you write out of such a tradition and over time, if you're significant enough or taken later to be significant enough, you write into an ongoing tradition. So of course, the skeptics are right. Magna Carta is not any unmoved mover. It wasn't unmoved because a lot of the lines were there before. And it was drawing on beliefs and arguments which were current in contemporary 12th century traditions after the separation of church and state, the, the, uh, the papacy and, and the uh, monarchy a century and two centuries before, this fed into the conception that there were limits on temporal power. Many other things fed into the conception. If Magna Carta is so important for that litany of virtues that David Cameron uh, enunciated, liberty, justice, democracy, the rule of law, all of them coming from the banks of the Thames, how come Switzerland's got it too? It's not only Switzerland, Liechtenstein, I imagine. I don't know much about Liechtenstein, but I'm sure it has it, and I'm sure it didn't owe it to Magna Carta, but it did owe a lot to a tradition of which Magna Carta was a very significant element, both uh, informed by and informing later generations. Uh, and this, secondly, now I'll say something about the fact that this is not just a tradition of the sort I mentioned, it's a legal tradition, and that's also not imp unimportant. It's not irrelevant, because lawyers have a specific concern with the past and a specific way with the past. They're concerned with the past. A lawyer is not like an engineer, says, oh, that's a good idea, let's do it. A lawyer has to draw on interpretations, of course, it's not there telling you what to say, draw on interpretations of existing authoritative law, both if it's authoritative, because he says that's what the law is, and because it's a source of ideas. That's the way lawyers operate. But it's a specific way with the past, because lawyers aren't historians. Their brief is not to find out exactly what the people who wrote those words meant at that time, still less in 1215 but to draw on the concepts which they find they can uh, make coherent with the existing law to deal with contemporary problems. Now that's what happened in the 17th century where Sir Edward Cook opposed uh, the king when the king said, surely I have, if, if law is a matter of reason, I have as much reason as anyone, more in fact, I think, believed. Uh, and Cook said, but law is not judged by abstract reason, but by what he called the artificial reason and judgment of the law. He drew on that, and he may have mythologized to some extent what he called the ancient constitution of England, within which, or as a record of which, he took 
Magna Carta to be. All this stuff was a deposit which has come down to us and which should rule us and which should deny James I's postulated divine right of kings. There's an argument that he actually believed that, or anyway, that that's what he said, that we had this deposit, Magna Carta hasn't changed, and we've got it now. Recent scholarship has suggested that Cook was actually in a minority then among the leading interpreters of what's called the ancient constitution of England, many of whom, particularly the later historian uh, Hale, who immediately accepted and insisted that, of course, law changes over generation. It could not not change, and as did understandings of Magna Carta. He says, from, this is Hale, from the nature of laws themselves in general, which being to be accommodated to the conditions, exigencies, and conveniences of the people for or by whom they're appointed, as they insensibly grow upon the people, so many times there grows insensibly a variation of laws, especially in a long tract of time. The matter changes the custom, the contracts, the commerce, the dispositions, educations and tempers of men and societies change in a long tract of time. So what does it mean to say we've still got the common law or we've still got the Magna Carta if it doesn't mean exactly what they meant then is exactly what we do now? He put, the, he uses this, he wasn't the only one to use it, but it's a very nice metaphor. The common law survived changed just as, and I'm quoting, the Argonaut's ship was the same when it returned home as it was when it went out, though in the long voyage it had successive amendments and scarce came back with any of its former materials. So what made all its, parts, all its elements part of the same law was not identity over time, Magna Carta there and here, but rather continuity. And that continuity had to do more with continuing authority, argument, development, amendment, than it did with some pristine, uh, with some sort of magician's hat out of which pop ever more clever or, or handsome rabbits. One day representative government, one day uh, jury trial. They weren't in there, but the Magna Carta was not irrelevant to them. And it was not irrelevant to them, it's much more complex story then than either the uh, devotees or the skeptics have. And it's also a noble story. And it's a noble story, seems to me, I don't think that's a term out of place here, because Magna Carta has been understood and to some extent from the beginning was a contributor to a very specific sort of legal tradition with which I'll end, a rule of law tradition. Often, particularly if you're in the bowels of law as a practitioner, law is just a matter of this rule and that rule and so on. But if you try to uh, stand outside any particular legal system, and you look comparatively at legal orders, you'll see, well, there are a lot of common rules, there are a lot of common principles, there are certainly a lot of common problems, but there are different styles, ways of thinking. There are encompassed within law different views of the right relations between authority, citizen, subject, and so on. I already mentioned that Russia did not, in its long tradition from the 13th century, there's an earlier tradition too, but the 13th century, things changed with the Mongol invasion, did not have any conception of reciprocity between ruler and ruled. And it didn't have much conception of any independent status, even of aristocrats, the so-called boyars. They were servants of the Tsar at the mercy of the Tsar. The rule, law was not highly ideologized, people weren't talking law all the time, but to the extent that law mattered, it was top down. It was a, uh, an instrument of rule from the top. Now, that is one way of thinking of law, and there are many others comparatively spoken. Rare in human history, and rarely developed as, as sort of intricately in both ideas and practices and institutions, is a conception which I'll call as a shorthand a rule of law tradition, it's a complex story, but which says power is an issue. The exercise of power is an issue for us all because it can so easily go awry. And so one of the real ambitions, tasks of political institutions and legal institutions is not to emasculate power, you don't want to make it that the king can't defend us against enemies or keep the peace or something, but somehow to temper it, 
to moderate its exercise. Why is that important? You might think, why do you need that? Lee Kuan Yew was not so keen on tempering power. And the former rulers of, of still rulers actually, until November the 8th, of Myanmar, have a very highly developed conception of law where it's that sort of law. It's law and order. It's not this more complicated reciprocal. Why is arbitrary power a bad thing? Well, the tradition which goes back, which absorbs, not in one single line, but with false starts, with arguments, with counter arguments over centuries. Again and again, there have been people who said, moderating power is a very key ambition for public institutions. Arbitrary power is shocking. It's shocking, horrible. I can go on this at length. In fact, I can tell you I can go on this at length because I have gone on this at length, but I won't here. For at least four reasons. It threatens freedom. It inculcates general fear. It, uh, it denies subjects, as they used to be called citizens, dignity because it treats them arbitrarily so that uh, as though they were uh, dilapidated houses, rabid dogs as one. But there's a distinction between p treating even a criminal who you send to jail as a subject of the rule of law and treating them as a dilapidated house or a rabid job, a dog. The philosopher Jeremy Waldron makes that uh, analogy and I keep messing it up and talking about dilapidated dogs and rabid houses, but you've got the picture that there is a big distinction and the rule of law tradition you can think of as a kind of meditation over a very, very long time. First of all, about why tempering of power might be important. Power needs to be controlled and there needs to be some relationship between and, and constraint of power holders that respects the existence and the interests and the views of subjects. These are all elements of what I've called uh, a rule of law tradition. And now to conclude, if I can find where I was planning to conclude. Yes, I'll read something. Uh, this leads me to my two and three cheers. Whatever the detailed targets and beneficiaries of Magna Carta, the barons and so on, hostility to the arbitrary exercise of power by the king was manifest in many of its provisions, centrally. That's why King John was so unhappy with it. There are other expressions one could use, but unhappy will do. It might not have been a general thought among the barons that this is about arbitrary power. They're more interested in this privilege, that privilege. It may not have been a general thought among the barons who negotiated the particular provisions of the charter, but many of its chapters exemplified a general principle, what I'll call for shorthand principle of the rule of law. That principle was already part of the arguments that raged in Western, among them English, legal traditions, and it continued to be a matter of argument and institutional experimentation over centuries. The line wasn't straight. The arguments were often lost. Power and interest trumped them and co-opted them often enough. We know that from the history of any country, including England. However, there were, there were victories, many of them coming to be institutionalized in our legal system. We talk about habeas corpus. We talk about trial of jury, trial by jury. These are cemented. Uh, and institutionalized in our expectations of political power. That seems to be more than enough reason to celebrate the contribution of Magna Carta to the rule of law tradition, without which it, Magna Carta, would not have existed, which made of it what it has become, but to which it gave argument, momentum, and heft that were both symbolic over the centuries and real. For a moment, King John's wings were clipped. That doesn't make me a true believer, well, I am a true believer, but doesn't make me a votary, since the document would have been of no account without the tradition, and there's much else to look for. So, let's say we discover, because archives are opened in Russia, what did we discover that in 1230, there was a Magna Carta in Cyrillic, in Russian? Well, who cares? So it's not the document that does it. Uh, there's, so, the document would have been no account without the tradition, and there's much else to look for, to look to, for the rule of law features of our tradition than that document. But it also doesn't make me a skeptic. 
The rule of law, to repeat, is a noble achievement, and the significant but indeterminate contribution of Magna Carta to it deserves celebration. It didn't do it on its own, but then who of us does anything much good on our own? Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are running a, a little ahead of time, so there are a few minutes if anybody has any questions at this stage for Professor Krieger. There must be some questions that came from that fantastic presentation. Yes. Martin, that was a fantastic presentation. You can stop there. <laughs> Martin, that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, what I want to know is, uh, of the, you mentioned a whole lot of other cultures and legal systems across the world. Do any of them have an 800, the 500, or a 600 celebration? Well, paradoxically, the Hungarians are now wheeling out the golden bull. Uh, but not for the right purposes. Uh, there was, in Hungary, I, mean, I don't want to go on too much about Hungary, it's a sad story, but uh, after the collapse of communism in 89, for a brief period, nine years, the Hungarian Constitutional Court, newly formed, uh, was the strongest, more at least most ambitious, active constitutional court in, in uh, the world, and certainly in the post-communist world. And the then uh, president of the court, was trying to draw on, in a country which after all has very long authoritarian traditions, trying to draw on the golden bull to say, look, we've got that. But that's part of, actually, I think it does support my argument. If you don't have the connecting tissues, then the document doesn't have... The... So, skeptics, I mean, Assumption is a very clever fellow, so I'm sure he's got his facts right. Uh, but to forget the significance, or to ignore, or to deny the significance of this just because people exaggerate it is, I think, uh, an error. And actually, um, look, I, I don't know enough about comparative, comparative uh, legal history. I do know that you could find in Western European countries, several of them, France, uh, a whole lot of prior history which, um, which could be drawn on to distinguish maybe not France from Britain, but France from Russia. It certainly looked different to famous Marquis de Custine, who went to Russia in the 18th century. He was just amazed by the lack of law there. He went from France to there. He just couldn't find it. What the Tsar said seemed to, to just go... Uh, to go without saying, and one of my perplexities more generally, so I work on screwed up countries or ex screwed up countries trying to think, well, how could you actually generate some rule of law values? It's not an easy job, and part of the reason it's not an easy job is not that you don't have the document, you may or may not, but you've had traditions where these arguments don't have purchase. Thank you very much for this widespread of the look beyond Britain on the continent in Europe. Uh, I can add, by the way, I can add the arrangements in uh, uh, Kingdom of Aragon, which is around 1300. Yes. And in Denmark, you had a similar development. Uh, and much of that really goes back to the arrangement between uh, the uh, uh, conquering Germanic tribes in northern Italy facing uh, highly developed urban societies. They didn't exist anywhere else in Europe, but they had survived the fall of the Roman Empire, and the rulers had to accept that these cities were ruling themselves. And later on, of course, you get the development of the free cities in many parts on mm -hmm. the continent. Well, I'm grateful for that. Well, thank you very much. Would you please thank Professor Green. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is the Honourable James Spiegelman, ACQC, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New South Wales and Lieutenant Governor of New South Wales from 1998 to 2011. Uh, between 1980 and 1998, he practised as a barrister in Sydney, 
was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1986. Uh, going back a little further, between 1972 and 1976, he served as Senior Advisor and Principal Private Secretary to the Prime Minister of Australia and as Permanent Secretary of the Commonwealth, Department, the Commonwealth Government's Department of the Media. From 1976 to 1979, he was a member of the Australian Law Reform Commission. Uh, Justice Spiegelman has served on the boards and as chair of a number of cultural and educational institutions. In November 2012, he was appointed a director of the board of the Lowy Institute for International Policy. In 2013, he was appointed a non-permanent judge of the Court of Final Appeal of Hong Kong, and he is currently uh, chairman of the ABC. He is also, importantly, and it must not be forgotten, he is the patron of the Rule of Law Institute of Australia, and so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Justice Spiegelman. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> and the topic I was asked to speak on is Magna Carta and the Executive. <clears throat> I thought perhaps I would add a few examples to uh, the list of uh, anniversaries that uh, Senator Ferravanti Wells gave us. As, <clears throat> as Martin's already pointed out, uh, 2015 was the year in which Genghis Khan conquered Beijing on the way to creating one of the biggest empires the world has ever known. 23 September this year was the 800th anniversary of his, the birth of his grandson, Kublai Khan, who uh, founded the Yuan Dynasty of China and created the extent of China that we know today. So all in all, 2015 was a big year for executive power. And we ought to approach this anniversary of the Magna Carta with some degree of humility. Uh, this is my third address on the Magna Carta this year. In the first one that's published in the Australian Law Journal, I, I set out the history of the first century or so. But uh, what I advanced there were certain themes, which in my view are all of constitutional significance and which underline the Magna Carta and which are directly relevant to the theme of Magna Carta in, and the executive. There are four such themes that I want to develop today. One, uh, one is that the king is subject to the law, also subject to custom which was during that very period in the process of being hardened into law. And Martin has elaborated on that to some degree. The second theme is that the king is obliged to consult the political nation on important issues. Thirdly, the acts of the king are not simply personal acts. The king's acts have an official character and accordingly are to be exercised in accordance with certain processes and within certain constraints. And finally, the king must provide a judicial system for the administration of justice, and all free men are entitled to due process of law. As you've heard, the concept of free men at that time was a minority of the population. The, uh, the long-term significance of the Magna Carta, in my view, lies in these themes, not in the text, uh, particularly as they were developed over the centuries in the course of English constitutional history and not dissimilar point to that that Martin has uh, propounded at some length. Sometimes that development was with reference to the Magna Carta and sometimes without such reference. We must not forget the Forest Charter into which uh, four clauses of the 1215 text of the Magna Carta were expanded um, because it was just as important in the uh, political and social environment of, the, of that era and for centuries thereafter. Both of these are intensely practical documents. They list and resolve a range of specific grievances and are almost devoid of statements of high principle. The charters are, however, the first, uh, first of a long line of similar documents in English constitutional history many of which are either referred to, rep replicate or expand the provisions of the charters. And, and in, that was because those charters almost immediately acquired a totemic status as a statement of proper conduct on the part of the king. 
In detail, however, the charters are pragmatic and time-bound. As a result, many of their provisions gradually lost all significance. It's important to recognise that the Magna Carta was preceded by statements of the grievances, grievances on the part of the barons, including in written form. And over the course of later centuries, the nobles, for as long as they constituted the political nation, and then the broader political nation, as that de uh, developed, similarly demanded resolution of specific grievances to restore compliance with proper conduct, and sometimes for reforms to the processes or policies of government. The, some of these demands were granted, some were granted only to be abjured, some of those were regranted in whole or in part later, and sometimes the process was accompanied by violence and even the deposition of a king. Now, eventually, the process that led to Magna Carta was subsumed in parliamentary procedure. As parliament required a recognisable shape, the pro process at first took the form of a petition to the king to remit, remedy specific grievances. In my paper, which will be available in some form, uh, in written form, I've set out a list of about 50 documents, which in my opinion rec replicate the process that I've described, namely specific grievances in written form, leading to a very pragmatic response um, by uh, the, the kings of the day in terms of accepting some or all of the grievances. And these documents are called by various names. Uh, in, in the case of the Magna Carta, they were preceded by what historians still call, call the unknown charter, although it's been known for over a century, and the Articles of the Barons, and that led to the Magna Carta and eventually the split out of the Forest Charter. Subsequent documents were called by various names. They were called provisions, uh, remonstrances, uh, articles, um, uh, v various things, and eventually the terminology of acceptance became that of a statute. I think the word statute was first used at about 1236, but uh, there were various events during this period. Just as the 1215 version, of the, the, the version of the Magna Carta that matters is that of 1225. There are a lot of important provisions in the 1215 charter that we commemorate this year that were cut out and never appeared again. Uh, so that uh, uh, it was similarly the case with the subsequent documents, or the, what I call the successor documents of Magna Carta, um, namely, for example, I won't bore you with the details, but the provisions of Oxford and the provisions of Westminster uh, forced on uh, Henry II were, um, uh, were annulled after the death of Simon of Montford and the restoration of Henry III's authority. If I said the second, I was wrong, it was the third. The renunciation in 1306 by Edward I of his agreement to a bill of 1301, which is expressly and in terms asked for the enforcement of the uh, Magna Carta. Uh, and, and, and had declared void all statutes which were inconsistent with the Charter. Then in 1322, Edward II um, re revoked his promises to re remedy a long list of grievances which were called the Ordinance of 1311, eventually leading to his campaign against the nobles, culminating in his deeper de position and murder. There are other such examples. Under the Tudors, this process was in abeyance because of the strength of the monastery in large respect and the stability of the society. But the interaction between the political nation and the Stuart kings is obviously too long to try to summarise, uh, but the, uh, it was, uh, this climaxed in the death of a king in the same way as in the 14th century, uh, Edward II and Richard II were both murdered. There are a number of such uh, documents in, uh, in, the period of, um, uh, in the period of the Stuarts, including some that referred to the uh, Magna Carta in terms, such as the Petition of Right of 1628, and uh, during the, uh, the prosecution address on the trial and leading to the execution of Charles I. But it's important to recognise that these, these th documents of that era, the Petition of Grievances, the Petition of Right, the Bill of Rights, bear the same character. They are statements of a pragmatic kind listing a specific list of grievances with virtually no statements of high principle. Leading to my first theme, I'll deal with this briefly. The theme one was the rule of law. 
Martin has dealt with that adequately. Frederick Maitland, who characterised the import of the Magna Carta in one sentence, in brief, it means this, the king is and shall be below the law. This was not a new principle. It wasn't a principle, as I think Martin said, established by the Magna Carta. And indeed, royal autocracy was not a general feature of early medieval Europe. But, and subsequent iconic legal texts that lawyers know as Bracton and Fortescue would state the proposition without reference to Magna Carta. However, it was an important underlying theme of the specific pragmatic uh, promises that John uh, made in the original charter and subsequently repeated by his son or on his son's behalf in both charters. And then a similar process is implicit in the large number of successor texts that I've identified. It's uh, uh, the refusal of the political nation to countenance an absolute monarch is best exemplified in the very lengthy uh, record of the deposition of Richard II, including 50 articles of impeachment, uh, which contain references to the charters. And the record asserted that Richard would, and I quote, at his own arbitrary will do whatever appealed to his desires, and it expressly said with an austere and determined countenance that his laws were in his own mouth or occasionally in his own breast, and that he alone could establish and change the laws of the realm. Shakespeare in his Richard II captured the idea in the lament of Richard that the breath for worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. Such views returned with the Stuarts. Divine writers were heard. James I had uh, written in defence of the divine right of kings in a quite a learned and literate text. He was probably the most literate of any king of England or queen of England that I know. Uh, but when he was James VI of Scotland, infected as he was by a civil law tradition then. But he understood when he assumed the throne of England that this theory was not accepted there. He maintained the king was above the law. He accept, however, he accepted the long established restraints reluctantly, and he was determined not to allow any um, extension of those restraints and any ambiguity would had to be resolved in his favor. But he didn't try to change them. His son did and uh, shared the fate of Richard II. The principal mythologist, as you heard of the Magna Carta in the 17th century was uh, Sir Edward Cook as both a judge and administrator. His first statements of this were not made when James was King of England. He started off discussing the Magna Carta as part of his approach of ancient constitutionalism, which he did not invent. It was common amongst lawyers at that time. He started talking about this uh, when Elizabeth was King and he was her uh, attorney, uh, it became her Attorney General. But he had this, the Magna Carta is uh, exhibit A in his theory of the, anci uh, the ancient English constitution, and it was, as Martin said, an alternative to the approach of James I and an important one. Uh, I won't bore you with the, the bizarre histor historicity of Cork. He made a lot of things up. He fabricated documents that are clear, including some of his most iconic uh, uh, reports of legal cases were either his address to the, ju uh, the, the judges rather than his, uh, the, the decision of the judges, uh, but all of these have passed into common law history as true record of the common law of the era. His, um, whatever uh, he was bought, all of this was bought by uh, subsequent uh, uh, generations of lawyers and has passed into history, uh, even though a lot of it was folklore. The rule of law issues under the Stuarts included that assertion of a royal prerogative not to enforce the law, indeed to dispense with the enacted law. And uh, one of the steps uh, that led to the 1688 revolution uh, or invasion by the Dutch, we don't usually think of it as invasion, but that's what it was, was a purported exercise by James II to suspend the operation of legislation discriminating against Catholics. That should give pause to those who take Magna Carta as a direct source of liberties, um, which it is not, it's an indirect source perhaps. The import of Magna Carta as a source of the principle that the king is subject to the law was superseded, I think, by the Bill of Rights of 1689 and the political structure that emerged after that uh, 
uh, after that uh, event, or the event of the 1688 invasion. Uh, and it's entirely appropriate that that document took the same form of a list of specific, specific practical grievances pragmatically resolved without any statements of high principle. The English approach of developing the common law by incremental steps based on real life disputes is also a feature of the development of the English constitution and the Magna Carta's contribution to that um, uh, development with one possible exception is of that character also. Uh, and that's just the way the English constitution has developed over uh, from the Magna Carta and its successive documents. The second uh, theme that I, I wanted to raise was the duty to consult. Um, that obligation was a, clearly of feudal origin. Uh, what was sought was assent, not consent. Nevertheless, particularly with respect to taxation, the strength of the monarchy, which varied considerably, determined how close assent had to be to consent. And the original Magna Carta imposed restraints on the king's ability to raise revenue in particular in many different ways, but it also implicitly gave or affirmed consent or assent to the limits that some clauses expressly identified and to the practices which it did not change. The express provision in the 1215 text, which is still used by people today, uh, requiring the consent of the realm for a form of taxation including precise details as to how that realm would be summoned to give consent, that was deleted in 1216 and it never reappeared. It's not part of the Magna Carta tradition that we inherited, but it's still used often, including this year by several people who should know better, as an example of uh, the long-term significance of the Magna Carta. The duty to consult was, as it were, implicit in the process by which the, uh, the peace treaty, as it really was in some respects, was negotiated by the list of demands, the concessions made, and the demands not agreed to. Um, but that duty was what we would now call a constitutional convention. That's not the terminology of the era, but it's a similar sort of thing. Under the uh, John's son and grandson, Henry III and Edward I, the charters were confirmed on numerous occasions, reissued under Henry III and then confirmed on many occasions after that, often accompanied with an additional document, rec remedying new grievances or recognising them. This occurred usually in express exchange for a grant of taxation. The principle at assent of a council, which eventually became assent of the parliament, was required for taxation was reinforced by a century of systematic practice on the basis of what the Magna Carta, not established, but reaffirmed as a duty to consult. And it wasn't until Edward III's confirmation of the charters in 1297, which is the very copy we have here, and to which the 1225 text was annexed and which became the first entry in the statute book. It was not until that confirmation that the king made an express promise that certain taxes would only be imposed with, quote, the common assent of all the realm and for the common profit thereof, unquote. Now, those last words, for the common profit thereof, are completely new as far as I know. And a, a very interesting concept of public benefit has crept into this process of giving consent to new taxation over the course of a century. The, um, the struggle of succeeding monarchs over the centuries to find sources of revenue which did not need consent was perhaps the most basic political dynamic uh, of the f for about five centuries. Advisers to the Crown kept dreaming up new tricks to raise revenue which led to resistance. Some things don't change much over the century. Uh, and there were always complaints. But uh, the process was particularly apparent under the Stuarts. James I exploited to the limit his power to extract revenue in the exercise of prerogative power without parliamentary approval, for example, by levies on imports, grant of monopolies, etc. Charles I continued this practice, perhaps most famously by extending the obligation to pay ship money from coastal regions to the whole nation and making it an annual rather than a one-off levy. He also revived long lost battles to expand crown revenue. For example, he tried to extend the royal forests 
which had been cut back under Edward I, very reluctantly, but forced on him, some three over three centuries before, almost three and a half centuries before, he, he, he tried to extend the royal forests again. These were very important. Uh, at the time of John, it was probably, or Henry II, it was probably about a, a quarter to one third of all of England was set aside for a royal use. And it was an area in which uh, ap an absolutist monarchy governed. Uh, he had his own judges. The common law had no role in the forests. And they were a vital source of royal revenue. And that's probably why uh, uh, Charles I and his advisors tried to re uh, revisit the extent of the royal forests that had been cut back three centuries ago. One another example was that uh, has a historical precedent. Charles I couldn't get parliamentary approval for additional taxation, he tried to proceed to force subjects to advance loans. This uh, led to the fam famous uh, Five Nights case, which I won't spend much time on, I'll come back to, uh, where in the courts the submission was that, uh, of course he didn't have the, uh, any right uh, uh, to enforce loans, but uh, you, co uh, you couldn't get habeas corpus because the king could imprisoned without cause. And this was a really vital moment, but it appears by trying to go back to the system of forced loans, Charles I ignored to his own detriment the fact that it was the demand of Richard II in 1297 for forced loans that began the conflict that led to his deposition and death. However, what happened under the Stuarts by the time of, uh, particularly by the time of the uh, revolution of 1688, was that the duty to consult, which as I said was originally a duty uh, of ass assent, not consent, was transmogrified into a duty of concurrence. And a duty that, uh, uh, that what mattered was the king in parliament especially in areas of importance such as the, uh, um, such as revenue raising. And in a sense, that meant that the Magna Carta had been superseded by the gradual development of parliament over those centuries, culminating in, in, in that period. Now, the monarch no longer merely consulted the political nation. It, the political nation was part of the process of decision. And uh, this, however, there was a residual executive power the scope of that residual executive power remained contentious, and it still does today. But it's much less than it was uh, once. The third theme was the scope that of the sovereignty. Um, the kings of uh, the period we were starting with found it very difficult to distinguish the personal role of the monarch and his or her formal, or formal status as what we now know as a disembodied crown. Uh, as early as 1308, a group of barons promulgated a written declaration known as the Boulogne Agreement, distinguished, distinguished it between the crown and the person of the king. That treatment of the king was not then common in Europe, and this links in with one of Martin's principal themes. As that Lancastrian warrior turned Chief Justice, Sir John Fortescue put it in the late 15th century, in France the king was regal. But in England, the king was both regal and political. And it was the political monarch who was subject to constraints. And gradually, over the centuries, the extent of the prerogative, the regal monarchy, monarchy was restricted in scope. But of course, as I said, some elements of that remain and uh, they are relied upon from time to time. That's another lecture. The largest number of clauses in the Magna Carta and virtually the whole of the Forest Charter are directed to overturning the past abuse of power by the king, particularly by the extraction of revenue through exploitation of the incidents of feudal tenure. And these abuses appear, to an unknown extent, to have breached customs on the proper limits of the exercise of royal power. However, in this and in the successor documents, not all of the provisions concerned long-standing limits. Uh, they must have, and I'm sure they did, reflect changes to what was regarded as proper and even fair, and that altered over the course of those centuries. Gradually over time, these particular specific 
provisions with which the Magna Carta and the Forest Charter dealt became less important. In case of the Forest Charter, uh, they were basically the king lost that argument and uh, the, the scope of the forest was uh, substantially uh, reduced in size by the t uh, end of Edward I's reign and the, f uh, the abuse of royal authority within the Charter was significantly uh, attenuated. And of course, many of the other provisions were rendered irrelevant by social and economic changes. But as the successor documents show, there were always new grievances. There were, from time to time, attempts to override the King's authority uh, with little effect. The 2015 text of the Magna Carta established a committee of 25 barons, which would in effect take over the government if the King failed to honour his promises in the Charter. Now, they knew that time that the, basically this was a list of political promises and uh, horror to behold, sometimes they understood that political promises are not always kept. But uh, that provision for enforcement, which was the real problem with the two charters, disappeared in the next version of 1216 and never to return. But that example would cropped up from time to time uh, whenever the king was weak. Uh, they didn't last long until the, the settlement of uh, the parliamentary system uh, in the late 17th century. And, for example, under the provisions of Oxford of 1258, Henry was forced to agree to a council of 24, which was established to reform the government, but in effect took over the government for a period, until uh, then similar proposals came uh, under Edward II and also after the long reign of Edward III uh, at the time of Richard II during, his, um, uh, during one of the confrontations he had with the barons, uh, not the one well, eventually leading to his death. But conflict over the scope of the prerogative uh, is, was a feature of the reign of the Stuarts, and I've discussed this at some length earlier. Uh, we've heard from Martin that the conflict was basically between a different approaches to the uh, legitimacy of uh, the, the uh, um, political uh, power, executive power, whether it was a top-down to use Martin's term, the divine mandate of the kings, but or in the view of the lawyers, of whom Sir Edward Cook was only the most extravagant example, a much more rational approach to this was taken by John Selden at the same time. The pr prerogative was a principle of the common law, developed over the period. Uh, 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 the, it was a principle of organic legitimacy rather than a principle of sovereignty. The focus at that period was at first on the interaction of the common law courts with the prerogative courts as manifestations of the prerogative. This was whilst uh, Cook was a judge. When he was sacked by James, he became parliamentarian, and from that time on, he took the parliamentary courts rather than the, uh, uh, the, the, the support of the, uh, the courts as such. But uh, uh, James uh, asserted his defiant authority, as I've said, but he was much more mor moderate than his son in the way he, um, uh, he, he insisted on it and emphasised and acted on it. This may have been because he, he really had a great love of hunting and wasn't in London all that much. But uh, in modern democracies, as we know, the sovereign people have replaced the individual hereditary sovereign as the source of political legitimacy but the scope of permissible executive conduct unsupported by legislation, particularly on what the executive believes to be, to use James's first words at the time as to the extent of his prerogative, which was, Parliament has no right to interfere in, quote, matters important, unquote. We still get that often enough, and uh, it arises from time to time. In this respect, unlike my first two themes of the rule of law and the duty to consult, this theme of uh, the scope of executive power has not been superseded. And it's still with us in recognisable forms uh, that you can see in the Magna Carta, albeit in completely different ways. Finally, the uh, King's Peace. The provision of justice was a primary duty of a feudal monarch. Detailed provision for the justice system constituted the second largest group of clauses in the Magna Carta and was a primary objective of the Companion Forest Charter. 
Distinctively, this was one of the few fields in which the political nation of 1215 wanted the king to do more rather than less. And uh, this was also true of most of the successor documents. The numerous specific provisions about the law that I've listed elsewhere, but they are over, uh, pro probably about 20, concern particular aspects of the law that I won't go into the detail. But there was, of course, the, uh, the uh, one statement of general principle, I think the only one in the Charter, really, and that's what's Clause 29 of the, the t only text that matters, which is the 1225 text. It's a combination, an amalgamation of Clauses 39 and 40. The words don't change, but it's Clause 21 is the, nine is the, the number that matters about lawful judgment of the peers or by law of the land and refusing uh, to, uh, promising not to refuse or delay right or justice. These words have never lost their force. The detailed provisions that in a charter, in, maybe not that one, clearly constitute reforms, many of them, rather than the restoration of previous custom. They ask for new things to be done. And in that respect, they're probably quite distinctive. But that is also true of many of the subsequent provisions of, uh, of what I call the successor documents. And, um, you know, many of them referred to the Magna Carta, these successor documents, not least the 50 articles of impeachment of Richard II in 1399, where what he had done was described as a list of, and I quote, frauds and deceitful tricks of the said king, unquote. Now, it was the opponents of the absolute pretensions of the Stuarts who gave six, uh, the name of Edward III six statutes that appellation, and they are really important statutes. Uh, they preceded, uh, they were based on the Magna Carta. A number of them expressly referred to the Magna Carta. It is quite surprising to me that one of the best historians of the Hundred Years' War, like Jonathan Sumption, chose not to mention any of this in his speech that uh, Martin's referred to. But uh, they were really a, an expansion of the Magna Carta's provisions of the, uh, of the uh, due process of law and appropriate for that era, a subsequent era where society and the political structure changed. Indeed, it was the statute of 1354 under Edward III that extended the protection of Clause 29 to the whole population. And the original charter, as you've heard, provided a, 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 only for uh, the justice for free men. Uh, the, the gender issue didn't change at this time. More than, uh, but, uh, and they were still only a minority of the population, but it was under Edward III that it was extended to the whole population. Now, I've referred to the challenge, I'll just wind up, that, of the uh, forced loans and the five nines case. And of course, it was as a result of this that the parliament, under the stimulus of a number, including Sir Edward Cook in the parliament, drafted the petition of right of 1628. When the House of Lords sought to undermine the force of that position by a petition by inserting a qualification, quote, saving the king's sovereign power, unquote, Sir Edward Cook responded, sovereign power is no parliamentary word. Magna Carta is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign. Now, a document that has no sovereign is a good description of a written constitution. Uh, and anyway, that charter was not a constitution in our understanding of the concept. However, it was of constitutional significance. And so was the statement of the petition of right, which just like Magna Carta was a series of demands arising from the practical grievances of the day. And of course, the, uh, the uh, numerous specific reforms, um, I'll, I'll pass over that. The, uh, uh, and it was uh, the parliament that enforced that. In the Five Nines case, the courts sat on their hands, but it was the parliament that uh, reinforced in that era the, uh, the restriction on the ability to, of the a king to imprison someone without charge. Let me conclude with this. Two weeks after D-Day, 1944, George VI, returning to Windsor Castle from London, was fuming at the latest frustration of his royal wishes administered by Winston Churchill. 
As the car passed Runnymede on the way to Windsor, he gesticulated out of the window and proclaimed, and that's where it all started. <laughs> now, over the course of then, seven and a half centuries, many of his predecessors had been similarly exasperated by the Magna Carta. It's by no means clear how much actually started at Runnymede and how much was simply confirmed. However, the written text proclaimed on many occasions throughout the land was the start of a long process of constitutional development carried through by the successor documents of which we remain the beneficiaries to this day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, are, are about to break for morning tea, but there are two comments I'd like to make, uh, you might like to take away and think about uh, as we do. The first is that the chapter 29, which is the original chapters 39 and 40 of 1215 contracted into one, is actually part of the law of New South Wales. It's the only part of the Magna Carta that has been specifically enacted as law in New South Wales. I can't speak for other jurisdictions. And the second comment is this. We have heard almost nothing so far in this symposium about the church and its role in the creation of the original Charter of Liberties of 1215, which became the Magna Carta in 1217, to distinguish it from the Forest Charter, as Jim has explained. Uh, Archbishop Stephen Langton, the head of what was then called the English Church, not the Anglican Church, it was still the Catholic Church, of course, in Rome, but the head of the English Church had been stirring behind the scenes for years to have the liberties of the Church restored and reaffirmed by the King, who had been taking Church property and otherwise helping himself to the, the uh, benefits of the Church. And Langton played a very significant role with the barons and with the merchants of England at that time to bring John to the table. So he shouldn't be forgotten. And when you look at the original document, you will see that the first operative provision of the 1215 document is to affirm the liberties of the church. After that, everything else follows. So on those... A uh, few words. We'll break for morning tea. My instructions are that we should be back here at 11.35 for the next speaker. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> we will resume the symposium. Thank you very much for returning on time. Uh, and our next speaker is Professor David Clark, uh, who will also be addressing the broad theme of the Magna Carta and the law. Uh, Professor Clark is a graduate of the Otago and Oxford Universities and a professor of law at Flinders University in Adelaide. He first published on Magna Carta in the Melbourne University Law Review in 2000. Since then, he has contributed to the American Bar Association's 2014 book, Magna Carta and the Rule of Law. He's published a paper on Magna Carta and court delay in the Pacific in the 2015 book, Magna Carta and Its Modern Legacy, edited by Robert Hazel and James Melton, and a paper on Magna Carta in New Zealand, which you will have <coughs> realised is his home country, will appear in the Canterbury Law Review in 2016, next year. Professor Clark has delivered lectures on the Charter at the State Library of New South Wales and at the Law Society of South Australia in the course of this commemoration year. He has published on the history of constitutional landmarks such as habeas corpus and the Bill of Rights of 1689. And he's interested in how earlier legal instruments come to be reinterpreted and applied in modern circumstances. So it's very fitting that he will be speaking to us today on Magna Carta and its uses since 1803. I'm not quite sure why 1803, but I'm sure that will become apparent as we go along. So, Professor Clark. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Rosemary and Nick for organising today's proceedings. I think, given what we've heard earlier, there is a theme emerging, and that is the idea that Magna Carta ceased to be a medieval document a long time ago, that it broke free from its medieval roots, and it became transformed in the course of its long history into something more general, and this partly explains uh, its survival. I think perhaps the best remark ever made by an Australian about Magna Carta was a comment by Senator O'Sullivan in the Senate in September, on the 11th of September 1952, when he said, the greatness of Magna Carta does not lie in what it meant to its framers. Its greatness emerges from what it has meant to political leaders and jurists down the ensuing centuries, during which the civil and political rights of the people have developed and the rule of law has been established. And it's in that light of that theme I wish to make my presentation. I'm going to concentrate on Australia, just to start with. It's 1803 because Jeremy Bentham, who never came to Australia, wrote a paper criticising the system of justice in New South Wales, in which one of his fundamental criticisms was that the people of New South Wales had been denied Magna Carta. And I don't think he meant literally the, sta the document or, or the statute, but the ideas that lie behind it. But before I go to the rest of the Australian story, which is an important story, as we all know, uh, it might be worth rehearsing a few things. One reason for survival is renewal, and we've heard that from our previous speakers. There were, of course, not uh, merely five versions of Magna Carta in the 13th century, but one sixth version, which, of course, is often ignored by English writers, namely in November 1616, a version of Magna Carta was produced for Ireland which, by the way, still remains part of Irish law and was, in effect, an, partly an adaption of the English Magna Carta. So, for example, still referring to the freedom of the English church, referred to the freedom of the Irish church, instead of the liberties of London as the liberties of Dublin. In addition to that, it referred to a number of other things that were specifically Irish. And the Irish have kept their connection with Magna Carta right to this day. Uh, it was reaffirmed in a modified form uh, in an Irish uh, statute in 2007. Also enforced by commissions after the document was launched, complaints were often made about breaches. Kings issued commissions of inquiry uh, into these allegations. It was extended in the 14th century, as Jim has mentioned several times, 
most famously in 1354 and 1368 when the phrase due process of law was added to our constitutional vocabulary. But of course, what they meant by due process of law uh, was utterly different from what we mean by it. Uh, and I disagree with um, Justice or Lord Justice, Lord Sumption's claim that nothing new can be said about Magna Carta. Um, he's just wrong. Uh, in 2015, a brilliant book was published in London called Magna Carta by a very distinguished English historian, David Carpenter, who drew together an enormous amount of recent uh, historical information about the document and the era in which it was created. And the other thing uh, Sumption hasn't mentioned and I obviously will, is that because it has a long post-1215 history, there's much to be said about that. And it's not mad. It was also reaffirmed by English parliaments, often. And indeed, one calculation by an Eng uh, American historian of a subject thought it had been uh, reaffirmed at least 50 times in English statutes. And then lastly, and this has hit, hasn't yet hit the been published, the Selden Society, which as you may know is devoted to publishing English legal manuscripts, is about to publish a work by John Baker, who's England's most distinguished current uh, legal historian, on readings in the Inns of Court. Readings were of course lectures or expositions on uh, statutes, and there are quite a number of them during the period 1400 to 1604, when which many people felt that Magna Carta had fallen into uh, disuse or at least out of public view, but amongst the lawyers and the legal profession, uh, it was still remained alive. And as we've heard extensively, it became part of a, a constitutional mythology, uh, not least by Sir Edward Cook, who remember in his chapter in his institutes devoted to Magna Carta said of chapter 29, out of this root, many good laws of England were framed. And he was therefore aware uh, that many things developed since 1215 until his own time. It was also used uh, by critics of the English system, and we'll see this as a theme in Australian history as well, to criticise the system of government because it becomes elevated as a symbol of a number of values, most notably, but not exclusively in the 17th century, uh, the link to the rights of free-born Englishmen. Uh, and these, of course, uh, led to a number of major changes in the constitutional history of that age, which Jim has told us about extensively this morning, and no doubt will appear in his very scholarly paper when it's published. In Australia, it has similar uses. So when we get to the 19th century, uh, it was often used by critics of the colonial system of government, both law and politics. Uh, for example, one of the big complaints uh, by the freeborn settlers I'm losing, deliberately using that phrase, that is people who actually didn't arrive here as convicts but who were born here, uh, was the absence of jury trials. There were, of course, juries during this period, but they were, of course, constituted by military officers. Uh, what they were wanting, of course, were civil, civilian juries, which they claim were guaranteed by Magna Carta. Utter nonsense, of course, because juries, as we understand them, didn't exist in the 13th century. Uh, but this is part of a tradition of invoking Magna Carta to stand for other things. And while some things might be mythological, remember, myths have value. They're not just wrong, they have other functions. Another complaint, of course, of the denial of civilian courts, but also, of course, about the system of raising taxes in the absence of a representative system of government. And this is a theme of complaints about Magna Carta through, right through to the 1840s. I should tell you that I found this material on a magnificent site, namely the digital newspaper database of the National Library of Australia. Australia is a world leader in making this material available free of charge, as we are in making legal material available through the legal database Ostley. So you can consult these things here. By the beginning of the 19th century, the statutory versions of Magna Carta were wholly intact in England. The first uh, repeal of a provision per occurred in 1828. 17 of the chapters were removed in 1863. And by 18 1970, only three substantive chapters remain in English law. Two of them, the one about London, and the other one about the English church, of course, have no application in Australia. But the other, Chapter 29, as Nick has mentioned, is part of the uh, inherited law of New South Wales, and I can add 
the inherited law of Queensland uh, and the inherited law of uh, Victoria, all of whom which have uh, Imperial Acts application statutes, which specifically mention this. Uh, the beauty, by the way, of the Victorian statute, it actually contains the text. In the other three states who don't have imperial legislation statutes, uh, the general rule is, a, is that an English enactment in existence on a certain date, in South Australia's case, it's 28th of December uh, 1836, is automatically part of the jurisdiction unless or until the state parliament removes it, which in this particular case it hasn't. Political uses were very prominent uh, in the 19th century, particularly in the run-up to the uh, successful containment of responsible government. Uh, in 1842, there was a grand remonstrance, a very significant 17th century term, uh, launched by the Parliament of, South, of the Legislative Council of, South, of New South Wales, listing a series of grievances in the mode in which Jim has explained was common in earlier centuries. Uh, and of course, a part of that was a plea also for a responsible government. Uh, and I, uh, and I, something that was granted to the Canadians in 1840, uh, so they made the complaints about this absence um, as uh, early as 1829. And in that remonstrance, part of the complaint is that we were denied, the people in New South Wales were denied uh, the benefits of Magna Carta. In the eight, 1850s, of course, the uh, number of colonies were given the right to write their own constitutions. And one of the things that they wanted, of course, was to institute elected lower houses, uh, which of course duly occurred. And one of the great innovations that Australia has made to constitutional practice around the world is we taught the world how to vote. Let me explain a little. Obviously voting existed in other places, but a secret ballot system which, by the way, was first inaugurated in South Carolina in 1716, but then disappeared, was something that the Australian colonies brought into existence. So in January 1856, Tasmania, not Victoria, passed the first secret ballot law. A month later, so did Victoria, and in March that year, so did South Australia. Uh, the Victorians were the first to implement the ballot. It was an unusual system. You had a list of names on paper. Previously, people used to have to vote orally. Uh, and they were asked on the ballot paper to cross out the names of those candidates they didn't want. Now, people, there are problems with this. First of all, you had to be literate. And that wasn't a requirement in order to be a voter. But the other problem was that they would put the lines in the wrong places. Uh, so in 1858, a genius in South Australia called Sheriff Boothby um, invented the idea of a voting machine. And he demonstrated it to the Parliament of South Australia, who were enamoured of the idea, but for the fact that it would bankrupt the colony if they had to build them. <laughs> so he came up with Plan B. And this is the thing that was truly significant. He said, let's have a list of names with a small bo square box next to the name, and you put a cross in the square. That's the Australian ballot system. In 1872, the British Parliament adopted it after an inquiry which called Victorian and South Australian witnesses into the operation of a secret ballot because it had been running in the colonies in Australia for a number of years. It was adopted in 1874 by the Canadians. It was adopted in 1902 by the Commonwealth Parliament. And it was adopted by 40 out of 44 American jurisdictions between 1888 and 1910. And it had a dramatic effect. This is one of our great innovations. And it flowed from the campaign, not merely to have representative government, but to have a, an efficient and uncorrupted uh, system of electoral management, which we still have. I know there have been hiccups, as in Western Australia recently. But the fact is, our electoral administration in this country is a world leader. And it's worth remembering that. Uses in education. Of course, one reason that Magna Carta remained alive in the colonies is that it mostly English. Remember, it's an English statute, not a Scottish statute. The British sub people who came here 
uh, learnt about it in school, and it was very common to learn about it. There are often plays, reenactments of Runnymede, uh, and other kinds of reimaginings of what happened uh, uh, in 1215. Um, it's also, I should just add, um, still part of a history curriculum, though it had to be put in there after complaints that it was missing. But I reviewed the history textbooks last year uh, to see what they had to say about Magna Carta, and most of it is rot. <laughs> <laughs> For example, the king signed. Uh, there's no signing. Seals were attached by people um, on his behalf. Uh, and various other uh, statements have been made. I'll come to some of those in a moment. Um, so it's one thing to put something into a curriculum. It's another thing to teach it properly. And I hate to be snobbish, but once upon a time, school teachers were educated people. <laughs> That's a personal comment, obviously. Um, it's, next thing to know is it was often the subject of howlers, and I came across many. I'll give you my two favourites. That no man could be hanged twice without his consent. <laughs> Apparently once was enough. <laughs> you didn't have to ask them for that. And then my personal favourite is a king could not order taxis without the consent of parliament. <laughs> It puts parliamentary entitlements into perspective, doesn't it? <laughs> and if there are any people present who are in receipt of such things, let me say as a taxpayer, I'm grateful for your nervous laughter. <laughs> it was also a key part of legal education. It was a, a formal requirement that all students for admission to the profession of the 19th century and for much later had to study constitutional law and history. And history meant English constitutional history, and they read standard English books on constitutional history, which of course were dominated by this Whiggist tradition of which Martin has made allusion earlier. Uh, the idea that there was some special genius in English people who not only invented this tradition, but carried it uh, through to our present day. They read, for example, the works of William Blackstone, uh, so in 1846, for example, when they were teaching jurisprudence at the University of Sydney, the then lecturer happened to be the editor of the fourth edition of Blackstone, which is not something generally known. We have a continuing interest in Blackstone, of course, in Australia, because uh, one of my colleagues uh, in South Australia is currently editing a new critical edition uh, of the commentaries. Uh, next thing, of course, it's the subject of foundation myths. And let me say something about this. It's quite often read in the newspapers, the foundation of our liberties, foundation of other things. It, of course, is a building analogy. When a builder builds a building, they lay the foundations. They know their foundations because they know what comes next, the rest of the building. It's fantasy to suppose that a bunch of barons, one English writer called them warlords, uh, in a field in Runnymede in 1215, thought to themselves, let's lay the foundations of a legal system, we'll call it the rule of law, in a country we don't know exists yet because we don't still think the world's flat. That's just fantasy talk. And it's attributing to people uh, either a gift of prophecy or something else. It's obviously not true. Um, the same with the origins of democracy, which figures in almost all these high school textbooks, by the way. There's nothing democratic about the barons. They weren't elected. They were there by hereditary right. Uh, elections, as we understand it, did emerge in the 13th century. There are books on electoral law in the 13th century. But of course, the ordinary people had no say in the matter. And the vast bulk of the population uh, didn't do any voting until we get to the 19th century. And indeed, many of the inst institutions of the rule of law, which we associate with the rule of law, are of course a, a, a characteristics of later centuries, but I won't um, go into that. Same with human rights. It is a term, by the way, only appears first in the English language in 1629. Uh, it was first used in the English Australian Parliament in 1904 when King O'Malley, who as you know was a, an American who faked his origins in order to be a British subject, but a major person in our public life, uh, mentioned the phrase in the course of the uh, debates in Parliament on the Conciliation and Arbitration Bill. And it was first mentioned in an Australian newspaper in 1817. And there are hundreds of citations of the phrase right to the 19th century, courtesy of this wonderful uh, database. 
It didn't necessarily mean by uh, human rights what we do, but it is a caution because one of the beauties of learning history is it prevents you from falling into the mistake of supposing that some things are always new, actually they may not be. Uh, some things are unchanging, they usually aren't. It's been used on both sides of contemporary and recent political arguments. There are proposals to have human rights um, statutes by the Commonwealth in 1970s and 80s. They didn't succeed, uh, but both sides of the argument invoked Magna Carta, interestingly enough. The proponents said it's part of a long tradition. Passing a Human Rights Act merely extends and develops that tradition, and it has been a developing tradition since 1215. The opponents argued, of course, that Magna Carta, along with various other important constitutional landmarks didn't require to be extended because they were already adequate. Now, the fact that the, both sides of the argument can invoke Magna Carta to pursue a different objective is indicative, I suggest, of the malleability of the Charter itself. Before I get to this, I will tell you a quick story because it's, um, it illustrates the a theme I'm trying to get across to you. In, 1827, there was a wedding in Sydney. That's not sensational. But the sing wedding singer was, sang a song that so enraged two of the drunk guests, they beat him up. That's not important either. What is important is the attackers were brought before a magistrate in Sydney who then sent them onto the court of sessions for trial. But of course, the magistrate decided to review the song and did approve of the lyrics. But he also said, and I'm doing this for memory, that Magna Carta gives every Englishman the right to sing. <laughs> now, there's nothing about singing in the 1215 document, and we've obviously come a long way from Runnymede, but it does tell you about the way in which it's being thought of, namely, as emblematic of a general right uh, to freedom. Now, he said this to an audience of Irish people, because they were the people at the, at the wedding, and they all applauded, according to the newspaper. Sometimes it's been used in less um, desirable ways. There has been a strain through our history of uh, uh, religious conflict occasionally between Catholics and Protestants. And Catholics from the 1840s on would argue that actually, since Magna Carta represents liberty, uh, and since Cath uh, England at that time was a Catholic country, and since Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury who led the barons, uh, Led the, uh, led the uh, movement against the king, Catholics were clearly true friends of liberty. Uh, the Protestants, of course, disputed this by pointing out it was a Catholic pope, innocent, on the 24th of August, 1215, who annulled the charter. And amazingly, this argument surfaced in a Protestant and Catholic newspapers in the country for nearly 100 years. Um, it was matched by um, much distortion. It has, of course, also been invoked whenever it's been thought that civil liberties and rights were under attack, uh, most notably uh, in uh, 1915. And I'll tell you a 1915 story in a moment. But uh, much of the legislation at that time, of course, was designed to give the uh, executive power, a much more enhanced executive power to the government. Uh, and it was very clear from statements made uh, in August uh, 1915 that's a, a year after the war began, of course, by the then uh, Prime Minister and other speakers in Parliament, that one of the things that Australia was fighting for was the preservation not only of our way of life uh, and uh, its prospects, and as the Prime Minister said, our sunshine, among other things, but also our law. Um, my 2015 story has got nothing to do with Magna Carta. I've got to share it with you because it is the 100th anniversary. Amongst the howlers I came across, was a young genius, probably Victorian, who wrote this. In 1915, the Aztecs shot turkeys in the Dandenongs. <laughs> well, at least he got the first letters right. You can look, at, there's many more, by the way. If you want to amuse yourself, I suggest you look them up because they're great, to say the least. Um, and of course, it's also been invoked by uh, contemporary parliamentarians, who, uh, some of whom are named on my paper, but I won't embarrass them by naming them today, um, uh, in criticising anti-terrorism legislation. Now, of course, remember the promise in, in Chapter 29 is to abide by the law of the land. And as a West Australian judge once pointed out, that means the law of this land, namely Australia, not England, and it means contemporary Australian law, 
not 13th century English law. Uh, but nevertheless, it's been used in that way as well. And I go into that uh, in some detail in my paper. Um, so what conclusions can we reach? Well, it is part of a tradition to which we've added. And obviously, following from what Martin was saying earlier, a tradition is not a static thing. That's why it survives. If it had been completely unchangeable, uh, it wouldn't have survived this long. So traditions are malleable. Uh, they repay elements of the past, but they often ac acquire um, new accretions in the course of history. It's part of the reasons that this country enjoys, to use a famous constitutional phrase in our constitutions, federal and state, peace, order, and good government. We are the masters of civil peace in this country. We are not the only country who has done this. As Martin's rightly pointed out, there are a lot of countries in Western Europe which are very successful democracies, which enjoy internal peace, uh, and which have no direct connection with the Magna Carta tradition at all. Uh, and that's uh, true of those countries, but in our case, it partly flows out of this uh, tradition and the ways in which we've made adaptions to it. And lastly, and uh, this is a point um, previous speakers also made, it also tells us about the flexibility of a common law tradition. I'm not talking about the formal common law as a bunch of uh, principles, say the law of tort or contract. I'm talking about a tradition here, which obviously includes in our case, change through legislation. So we're not just talking about common law as distinct from statute law, we're talking about something broader than that. So the reasons we should be thinking about this in a clear-eyed manner, because we've heard uh, several instances earlier of the mythologies which can be uh, rightly uh, criticised, uh, and so therefore we should look at Magna Carta in a clear-eyed manner, uh, is also to bear in mind what it has wrought in, on this continent after all, we're a continental-sized country. We're diverse. We're, people come from almost all over the world, including me. Uh, and by the way, I am an Australian citizen, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> and I get an each-way bet with the World Cup. <laughs> uh, and we manage to live in peace. And it's not just because of the rule of law, of a separation of powers. These things are extremely important. It's for other reasons. Let me mention two elements of the rule of law often ignored, and then I'll finish. One, you need, and we do have, an efficient, effective, and non-corrupt public service. Think how important public services are for the implementation of government policy. That's a sharp end. And this is, although we are rated as the 11th least corrupt country in the world, we're not the 190th corrupt country in the world, just so we were aware of that. And the other element of the rule of law, which hasn't been properly explored, but is crucial, is that the general population has to understand, if they don't know the details of the law, that's all right, but they have to understand the basic rules of a system. To me, this is always illustrated when I go to vote, in which I find a moving experience and not a chore. There are no goons threatening us. The army hasn't been called out to protect us. It's very efficient. And afterwards, you probably get a free snag. Some people run barbecues at the back of the uh, polling booth. Uh, it's a civilised way of dealing with things, even though we know politicians engage in squabbles. And you know what they say about their promises. Half of them you hope you'll keep, they'll keep, and half you hope they won't. <laughs> I leave you to judge which is which. But it is a peaceful process. And that is a, an accomplishment in which we all share. Thank you very much. <laughs> Top left hand corner. Nope.
No. Where's it gone? Bottom right. Bottom right. Is that Stephanie? No. It's not. It should be this one, top right. Top right, yeah. yeah. Is that it? Okay. That's not. It's disappeared on us. Someone with the same name has overwritten. Yeah. Should you see we... what I mean? Perhaps we could have a little leg stretch for a moment while we sort out the video. It's really, it shouldn't take any Yeah, only take us a second. No, it's right. It's good when it works. I think we had this, <laughs> what happened is we had the file with the same name from some of the other speakers that overwrote the original and replaced the file. Okay, but oh yes, we tried to drag it across, didn't we? Like that. We'll do it across there. Sorry about that. Okay, we can just set up the slideshow the slideshow mode. Okay, you can do that. Okay. Yeah. And happy to use that. All right. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We can we can resume. We, we have the bells and whistles back in place. They're great when they work. Not quite sure what that is, but I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about it in due course. Um, our next speaker is Professor Desmond Manderson, who is a future fellow at the ANU College of Law and the ANU College of Arts and Social Sciences. When, when I say future fellow, I don't think that means he's going to become a fellow in the future. I think he's already a future fellow. Um, he uh, is an international leader in interdisciplinary scholarship in law and the humanities. He's the author of several books, including Songs Without Music, Aesthetic Dimensions of Law and Justice, uh, Proximity, Levinas, and The Soul of Law. I didn't know law had a soul, but there we are. <laughs> must get the book. Kangaroo Courts and the Rule of Law, that might strike more chords with people. And his work has led to essays, books and lectures around the world in the fields of English literature, philosophy, ethics, history, cultural studies, music, human geography and anthropology, as well as the law and legal theory. That might be starting to make more sense, I don't, I'm not sure. Throughout this work, uh, Professor Manderson has articulated a vision in which law's connection to these humanist disciplines is critical to its functioning, its justice and its social relevance. And in his paper, uh, which I'm instructed is called The Image of Magna Carta, but which your program shows as being the other 1215, I'll leave it to the professor to make a choice, uh, Professor Manderson contends that Magna Carta was only the second most important legal event in 1215. And I invite him to come and explain all that to us. Professor Manderson. Thanks. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, I, I am... It's difficult. It is difficult trying to say something interesting uh, after 800 years of commentary on the Magna Carta by many people who know a lot more about me than me about it, not a lot more about me. Uh, and it's particularly difficult in a symposium where, you know, I'm now about the fifth or the sixth speaker. And not only that, it's not even January, it's almost November. So we've had a good 12 months of all of this, which is why I've put up this image from the British Library's um, uh, gift shop for their Magna Carta exhibition. It's a genuine Magna Carta dummy um, <laughs> with every word of the Magna Carta inscribed in micro writing on the dummy. And I sometimes feel like one of those babies that's been silenced by the damn Magna Carta in my mouth, 
we are rather rendered mute in its presence. And that's why um, in, in an effort to try and say something a little bit different about it, um, I wanted to, to, to explain how in my view the Magna Carta is, is important, I think we all agreed on that. It's so important I think that in the development of the rule of law, it is the second most important document of 1215. Um, and I want to sort of explain that um, claim and talk a little bit about the most important document of 1215. But first I want to say that um, I think it's wrong to say that the Magna Carta has become a myth. I think the Magna Carta has always been a myth. And not just always in the 17th century, but always in 1215. It was already a myth in 1215, where the barons were referring back to the coronation oath of Henry I. And if you look at the coronation oath of Henry I, he in turn was referring to reinstating the laws in the time of Edward for the Confessor. So this look back, this appeal to memory and to a kind of a nostalgic vision of what things were like in our grandfather's time is something which goes right through and in fact is one of the important sources of the legitimacy um, of the Magna Carta, as I say, not in the 17th century or the 21st century, but already um, in 1215. Um, so that, that mythological status, that appeal to memory, and you know, I think there's a paper here somewhere about the role of grandfathers in the law and the way in which the grandfather is this figure of a link between the past and the present, this person on the edge of our own lives who can be relied on for stories which may or may not be true, but connect us to some other period in the past. And it's really the oldest living relative that connects us to some other time. So the figure of the grandfather, I think, um, is very important. But of all the myths, I think that the, you know, the most important myth, the most enduring myth of Magna Carta, as many people have already demonstrated, is the myth of exceptionalism, of um, the British exceptionalism. That would be nice if that worked. All right. Uh, that's from the um, Marshall's book, Our Island Home, Houston, uh, Cook, and Thatcher, as we've mentioned, all these people referring over and over again to Magna Carta as the genius of, of English liberty. Um, and here, a very famous print from 1792 by Rowlandson on the contrast between English liberty, in which we see the Magna Carta and the scales of justice, and French liberty, which leads to tyranny and misery. Or we could refer to Rudyard Kipling, um, whose poem about the Magna Carta ends, and still when mob or monarch lays to rude a hand on English ways, the whisper wakes, the shudder plays across the reeds at Runnymede. But Magna Carta, of course, was not a particularly exceptional document in the 13th century. And in fact, it was one of a, of a whole pan-European trend towards uh, arguments about uh, limits on um, sovereign power uh, right across legal ju jurisdictions, uh, in both in relation to the canon law and the civil law. The struggle between the king and the notions of the limits of his power everywhere in 13th century Europe. Similar documents, of course, the Golden Bull, Andrew II in Hungary, but also in Sicily, Simon de Montfort, Statute of Palmyre, the King Louis IX, Frederick Barbarossa. Many of these documents could be brought into evidence for the significance of these kinds of documents at a moment in the development of legal consciousness. And that's really what I want to talk about, to set the Magna Carta in the context of this development of legal consciousness. And I think I, I just want to say to begin with that we have to understand that one of the characteristics of late medieval and indeed into Renaissance thought um, was that it was fundamentally proverbial and textual rather than hierarchical. Everything was a question of the co competition between texts, the dialogue between different texts, and debates about their meaning. And, and the understanding of that dialogue was fundamentally horizontal rather than vertical. So rather than a hierarchy of documents in which commentators were placed very much in secondary position, the commentators had an authority which they shared with the authors of documents and were able to contribute to the development uh, of meaning. Uh, and this was true, for example, with the discovery of Roman law in the 12th century, Gratian's decretals themselves, a series of commentaries on existing canon law, and then the subject of its own glosses, its own commentaries, and this layers of textual apparatus and conversation builds up and is, is characteristic, as I say, of medieval thought. So while there were statements in, in the 13th century and in the 12th century, 
along the lines of princeps legibus solutus est, the, pre, the prince is unloosed from the laws or unleashed from the laws, or a phrase like what pleases the prince is law or has the force of law, that justice is uh, in the hands of the potestus absolutus. These are not to be seen as absolute claims of authority, but of gambits, of conversational claims that were then worried over and argued about. And it's only in a much later context of the 16th and the 17th century that a lot of those statements were taken literally in a way that they would never have been taken in the 12th and the 13th century. The medieval world was essentially in love with balance. And here we see the great visual constitution of Siena by Lorenzetti in, in 1377, in which there's this wonderful sense of the balance between different authorities and different powers, right down to the people down the bottom, all of whom hold on to this little thread, this golden cord that connects them each to each other and then to the foot of the figure of wisdom um, or the prince in the middle. So the medieval is in love with balance, and that is the essential uh, characteristic of that world. It's the 16th century and the 17th century. It's the Baroque, which is in love with power. And it's under that context that the rhetoric of the medieval world, its textual play, its, its rhetorical style becomes used, taken literally, and brought into a new kind of context. So behind that sort of textual um, uh, interpretive framework of, of, of the medieval world, there are certain unique characteristics of medieval society, and it's those unique characteristics which are really the origin of the rule of law, and that the Magna Carta is just one document that helps reflect, clarify, um, and in some small ways developed. And that is, of course, that, that feudal society is essentially pluralist. It's, it's divided in the first place between the Pope and the em Emperor, who are already described not as a sun and moon, but, in the words of Dante, as two suns. And the essence of, 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 their, of that idea of the power of the Pope and the power of the Emperor is that, is that each power is not derived, no power is derived from the other. They are independent sources of power. And similarly, there are two legal systems. There is a, a system of, of something like Roman law, and there is a system of canon law, and they are also independent. And then there's a third, third system of local custom um, and of pagan law, which is separate again from that. And indeed, the powers were themselves internally divided so that the emperor doesn't have power um, over all the kingdoms. The kings, the princes, the feudal lords claim their own independent source of power. And even within the Catholic Church, the pope claims an independent source of power, but so, does the, so do the bishops. The bishops say that their power derives not from the pope, but from God through the church. And this idea that the pope and the church are themselves independent sources of power um, creates this sense um, of law, uh, as a discourse and not as a fact, and law as a balance and not as a unity. So that, to that essential pluralism of feudal society, the competition between different sources of power, there is the great, I think the great gift, as, as uh, I think Pennington says, of medieval Europe to the world, which is the idea of the development of Roman ideas of the corporation. And the corporation is, gives a, a group of people an independent legal personality that is not simply derived from any one of its members. It's independent fr from that. And that's why we get this gr great flourishing of the corporatist principle right throughout medieval Europe. Universities are exactly an, an expression of that idea. Cities, guilds, monasteries, corporations, they all have in this common this, this idea of self-government independence and a separation between the people who are in charge and the body itself. And uh, eventually, that's what the state comes to represent as well. A separation between the independent power of the king, for example, and the corporate body that he is there as a custodian of, as someone to look after. Now, over the course of the 12th and into the 13th century, this idea of inherent legal limits between different, different parts of, of, of a society is mapped by new concepts that, that have in common the separation of a role from a person. And, and this is really, I think, the origin of, of the rule of law, is that idea of a separation between the role, what the king is doing, and the person of the king, so that the king is accountable for his role to something other than himself, to the community as a whole. 
And so we start getting phrases like the fisk never dies, which de develops in about 1300, or the idea of the crown, or the papacy, or the patria. All of these express this difference and this tension between the individual ruler and that for which, which they are ruling. So two, two words which become incredibly important in the 12th and the 13th century that reflect this development, one is the word office. We start to get this idea of an office so that one holds an office, but it's not us. It's not just our plaything or our toy or our, or our um, free for us to do whatever we want. An office respect reflects an abstracted responsibility that individuals uh, are accountable for in some way or other. And it's these abstractions that tell us something of the emergence of the rule of law, of a corporate identity, of a community, of a realm, of a people, separate from the individuals responsible for it and answerable to it in one way or another. So the first word is office. And the second word is jurisdiction. Because if we imagine this soup, this plural soup of, of rival sources of authority, none of them directly answerable to the other in any hierarchical way, the jurisdiction is the constitutional way of dealing with those conflicts, of working out whose decision a certain thing is. And the concept of right derives specifically from the idea of a jurisdiction. The claim of a right, still I think this, this is true at least, I think this is still true, and certainly it was true uh, then, that the claim of a right is a claim that something is outside the limited of authority of a particular person or group of persons to do. You can't do that, it's not your jurisdiction. And whether it's because it's the Pope's jurisdiction, or the Church's jurisdiction, or God's jurisdiction, or nature's jurisdiction, or the jurisdiction of mankind, they're all expressing that idea, that it's the idea of jurisdiction which actually gives birth to the concept of a right as a necessary implication for how you draw limits around what it is that people in authority are allowed to do. All the same, this delicately, finely balanced system of language and discourse and argument um, was coming under significant stress and change in um, the 12th and into the 13th century. And it, and it comes down to this, the development of modern law. That's what happens. Um, uh, Berman, I won't talk about this now, but Berman says law is the first science of the West, the first um, discipline that works on the basis of empirical proof, cases as a way of testing hypotheses in a kind of an, a secular, organised, testable, um, rational kind of way. And, and if law is the first science, let us say this, the first modern law was, ironically enough, the Catholic Church. Because it's the Catholic Church in 1075, in the Dictatus Papi of, of Gregory VII, that makes claims for its separation from the state, its independence authority, and in fact, you know, extremely um, bloated and caesarean claims for the power of the Pope um, over the rest of the world. And, and the separation of the Pope, that the Pope makes between church and state will, in the later Reformation, of course, come back. Um, to bite the church very, very badly. Um, but in amongst all of that is the Pope's claim to make new law. The Pope can make new law because he is the direct delegate of God and, you know, he, he has the um, telephone, the, the phone line to God. And, and that's a radical idea. That idea that, that the ruler, the Pope in this case, is not just the guardian of the law but the author of the law and can make new law creates a whole technology and, and that leads to the development of the legal profession, of professional judges, of administrators, of bureaucrats, of a paper trail, um, and so forth, right? right uh, that, that starts with the church. So rather than saying that the church is modelled on the state, the truth is the state is modelled on the church. It is the church that sets in train these motions in the 11th century. And then by the end of the um, 11th century, uh, particularly in a writer like Laurentius, actually writing in 1215, was the first to recognise that the attributes of a law were not its, for, were not its, um, uh, not its particular source, not its reason, not its justice, but simply its form. And what happens uh, at this time is that right across Europe, it's not just the Pope and the church, but secular jurisdictions, um, uh, feudal kings and princes, who begin to see 
that this is a very powerful instrument for the development of social power. That is, um, that kingdoms, particularly the Norman kingdoms from Sicily to, to England, that begin to see their prime function, not as military, but as administrative, legal and bureaucratic. And, and uh, in fact, the, the Angevin reforms prior to John in England are a classic example of that process. They are uh, the development of, of, of judges in Erie, of writs, of the jury process rather than trial by ordeal, and plea rolls are, are not a really so much about reason um, as about centralisation, administrative efficiency, routinisation, the power of lawyers, writing as the power of, of the king to enforce their will, and bureaucracy. And that is the development of modern law. Secular, independent sources posited the positivism that Laurentius already refers to in 1215, and in a system of uh, uh, instrumental power run by lawyers and leading to um, the development of new laws as the way of expressing kingly power. John was a very advanced uh, was very advanced in this process, uh, which was going on all over Europe. Um, but, and because he was particularly vigilant in getting his taxes amongst everything else, and because he was itinerant, so he went up to the north when the northern barons were used to being left alone, that suddenly the modernity of law, its innovation and its centralisation and its administrative power was brought home to those barons and that's why it becomes a northern rebellion. So the Magna Carta expresses grievances in the developments of the modernity of the state, the development of the modern state system. It appeals to ancient rights and privileges and to the existing fabric of constitutional limits, but it does so, and this is what's interesting about it, using the techniques and methods of modern law itself in a textual document which has all the trappings of law um, and uh, is used in writing to pin things down and, and as, as other speakers have said, to hold the king to the same processes of process and procedure that he was holding um, his vassals to. So the Magna Carta uses the technologies of modern law itself. It cites a corporate model that separates the person of the king from the interests of the community, that uses writing, and that focuses above all on consistency of procedures. And that became very important. As I've said, um, it was out of this idea of jurisdiction that the notion of right starts to emerge. And that jurisdiction was particularly concerned with the regular and rational application of new laws. Uh, so we get the development of concepts of property and of contract and above all due process. And the critical moment in the development of the idea of due process is the replacement of a divine procedure against which there could be no appeal with a system of rational and human processes. And I've forgotten all about my slides, which probably doesn't matter. That's Gregory. And that's what I'm up to. It's replacement with a rational and human process. This required a system and a question of, true, of proof that was not just about waiting for God to make their emergence to suddenly appear. And that's what led to the development of due process. And the critical moment for the development of due process, the movement away from divine law to human, secular, positive, made law, is 1215. But it's not the Magna Carta. It's the Fourth Lateran Council because it's the Fourth Lateran Council that means that the Catholic Church forbids the use of trial by ordeal in all its jurisdictions and requires its replacement by what is called the ordo judicarium. That is a judicial order, a legal process with all of those protections and limits built into the idea. Um, uh, now the ordo judicarium was already in the ascendancy, but Innocence III sounded the death knell by trial by ordeal. And not just in canon law, because in any legal system, you can't have trial by ordeal unless you have a priest who's there to organise it so that God will make an appearance and decide who's right and who's wrong, whether the witch floats or, si or sinks and so on. Without the church's involvement, trial by ordeal overnight became a dead letter. And, we, and the, the legal systems, the modern legal systems, had to work out how to replace that by secular human methods of um, finding truth, uh, of finding out the truth of what happened. That's what leads to the development of rights and procedures. It also 
um, leads to the development. Here's a wonderful picture by Bruegel, much later, um, 1500s. This is his critique of modern law, um, instrumentalised paper. All the lawyers are looking at their papers. And in the bottom left-hand corner, here's someone being tortured by the water cure. So the only point I want to just make about that is that torture was not an atavism. It was modern. The whole point of torture, in, um, particularly in Europe, and I'll just say a little bit about that in a second, the whole point of torture was that it was a way of finding out the truth of something when you couldn't rely on God to make an appearance. It was a way of the best proof was confession and torture was a way of getting from humans confession. So torture actually goes up significantly because it comes part of the legal system after the end um, of trial by ordeal um, in the late Middle Ages. And it becomes part of the legal texts actually in a very close connection. The legal texts published just a few years before Bruegel's image um, have this image almost identical to Bruegel's image, which is from a text on civil procedure. So um, torture is not an atavism, it's part of the modernity of law. Uh, on the other hand, as I'm sure many of you know, the thing that distinguished English is that it, England is that it never had torture as part of its civil or criminal procedure. Torture was done, but it was, it was an act of state. It wasn't part of natural legal procedure. And the reason for that is that in the, in the English system, they had already moved a long way and continued to move towards trial by jury, which is another way of developing human, secular, local judgments about proof without relying on trial by ordeal or trial by a battle or somewhere where God will make a miraculous um, appearance. So the, the importance of trial by jury is that it was, it was a way in which the English law then moved away from torture, um, which became quite important in, in many civil law systems, and it was able to connect an old practice to a new um, experience of modernity. So in this way, 1215 does mark the separation of England from Europe with a different response out of the same raw materials. That raw material is modern legality. But I think essentially what's significant about the Magna Carta is that its form and tenor reflect changing modern methods of government and a modern discourse of sovereignty and law. The barons are fighting modern legal technology with modern legal technology. Modernity is selling the guns to both sides. And it's highly significant in that context that the Magna Carta doesn't stay as a charter or an oath, but over time becomes understood as a law because that's the technique of modernity at work. Uh, it transcends personal promise and frames loyalty to the realm and the law, not to the individual person of the king. And this is already the case in 1215. Before 1215, King John was at war with the barons, and there are many documents that say that. After June 1215, even though the conflict is just as bad, they don't talk about being at war anymore. They, both sides say that they have a disagreement about legal interpretation. And that marks the movement from um, early feudal to early modern um, legal systems. Um, and, and so what's really significant, I think, about the, Mag about the Magna Carta is the way it takes its place with this, this dramatic change, changing from the system of balance to the new claims that systems of modern, secular, positivist law are beginning to make on what it is that a legal system does. The way in which that develops procedures through language like um, office, jurisdiction, and the corporation of the realm and how that in turn puts a pressure on ideas of due process, jurisdiction and, and restraint, which, which the Magna Carta uh, is, is part of that kind of development. The two events in 1215 were both vital way stations along that road. And, and there I would contrast the secular and evidential implications of the Ordo Judicarium with the procedural and legal expression, the language, style and form of the Magna Carta. And in, in that, in that uh, sense, what I think is that, that the, uh, the banishment of trial boy ordeal and the replacement with the Ordo Judicarium was a, was a critical cause of European change, right across Europe, a huge change in the development of legal systems. The Magna Carta was an English system, a symptom of that underlying cause. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Our, our final presentation before lunch uh, will be from Professor Nicholas Vincent. Now, I have to tell you that Professor Vincent is not here, uh, but he has delivered a presentation which has been recorded. We're not even crossing live to England for it. That's probably a good thing. We know what can go wrong with these things, but we have him recorded already and ready to play. So while that's being organised, let me tell you that Professor Vincent is Professor of Medieval History in the School of History at the University of East Anglia in England. He has published a dozen books and some hundred academic articles on various aspects of English and European history in the 12th and 13th centuries, including uh, a book that was published at the end of last year called Magna Carta, The Foundation of Freedom. Professor Vincent was the major contributor to that book. It's a very fine work if you happen to get hold of it. He's a, a major contributor to the Department of the Senate publication, Australia's Magna Carta, now in its second edition, $10 only. Don't leave without one. Uh, and he documents in, in that book the history and the provenance of Australia's 1297 Magna Carta down the corridor here. He currently leads the UK's major research project on Magna Carta to create clause-by-clause -clause commentaries on the Magna Carta and seek archival evidence on King John. He's a fellow of the British Academy. Uh, so with that introduction, we will hear from Professor Vincent. Good afternoon. I'm Nicholas Vincent, and I'm talking to you from a television studio. Good afternoon. I'm Nicholas Vincent, and I'm talking to you from a television studio in Norwich in England, which is rather a long way from you in Canberra. But uh, good day to you all. I should also say that this is uh, Tuesday, the 6th of October, three days after I watched the rugby match in the World Cup, where you thrashed us quite rightly. And if anyone should be elected to your Senate, I would immediately elect Bernard Foley. Uh, but that's another matter. I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about how your Magna Carta came to Canberra. It's an interesting story, and it's a story of at least three parts. I'm going to begin by introducing you to what's been going on in England over this anniversary year. I'm then going to talk about your Magna Carta. And then I'm going to end by showing you some of the new discoveries that have come to light in recent times over the last few months. Magna Carta was signed at Runnymede in June 1215. And Runnymede is a long way from Australia. But in June 2015, the Queen and other members of the royal family held a great celebration in Runnymede Meadow. There they are arriving. And here we are with what was described to me as, by a colleague as a mixture of scout jamboree and fascist flag rally. As everything to do with the royal family has to involve animals of some sort, we have a, a guide dog and we have um, the Archbishop of Canterbury and various members of the establishment there uh, listening to speeches by the great and the good, by the Prime Minister, on behalf of the Queen and by the Archbishop. And you can see the Duke of Edinburgh also, as ever, taking a keen interest in what is going on, or not, as the case may be. The heir to the throne, Prince William, uh, was there examining the flags produced by the schools of Surrey and meeting some of the local inhabitants of that part of the world. And as I hope that will show you already, we are in the world of paradox, as I hope has been explained to you this morning. Magna Carta is a highly contentious document. It's a document that in many ways places the sovereign power of the king under a degree of restraint. And yet here we are, 800 years later, using the royal family of England to advertise this document that is anything but royal. It wasn't just the uh, Queen and the future King, William, who were there. Uh, Princess Anne re-inaugurated the American Bar Association spaceship, which you can see in the background to this slide. 
uh, in the company of the Temple Choir, they're off there on the left, and on the right a bunch of people who call themselves Templars, who have obviously not been told that the Order of the Temple was suppressed for corruption as long ago as the 14th century. As that should also tell you, Magna Carta is as important, perhaps more important, in America than it is in England. And the Americans, indeed, in this anniversary year, have made an even greater jamboree of it. Now, 2015, the 800th anniversary, is the first time that Magna Carta has properly been celebrated in its anniversary year. In 1715, unfortunately, the British were rather too concerned with the possibility of a Stuart restoration and with the first of the Jacobite rebellions led by the Old Pretender. In 1815, they had the problems posed by this Corsican, um, and they were about to fight the Battle of Waterloo. And in 1915, they had the problems posed by this gentleman, who was busily trying to take over England, and was at that time fighting in Gallipoli against uh, soldiers from across the British Empire. As I hope that shows you, uh, it is perhaps no coincidence that 2015 is the first time in the last 400 years that in an anniversary year of Magna Carta, Great Britain has not been at war. Even so, at the end of the First World War, Winston Churchill made a speech in the Albert Hall to inaugurate a new Anglo-American Union. You can see Abraham Lincoln in the background there. He made a speech in which he described Magna Carta as one of the cornerstones of liberty, setting it alongside the American Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution as one of the great bulwarks of constitutionalism in the Western world. In this anniversary year, apart from the jamboree at Runnymede, there have been other attempts to celebrate the document, some of them less successful than others. The Royal Mint, responsible for the making of English coins, produced this anniversary £2 coin. It shows King John on one side, looking rather too happy, I would suggest, holding in one hand Magna Carta and in the other a large quill pen, obviously um, taking us back to that 19th century idea that King John at Runnymede got out his waterman or Parker pen and put his name at the bottom of the document. Of course, you know that he did no such thing. He sealed Magna Carta. Perhaps one of the least significant and certainly one of the least successful of the attempts to celebrate Magna Carta this year took the form of a giant and totally hideous bronze statue of the Queen that was opened... Uh, uh, inaugurated shortly before the Runnymede celebrations in the parish of Egham. Here we have the Egham Town Council with their utterly hideous model based on the Anigoni portrait. And here we have, as it were, Her Majesty half finished in what looks like a garage somewhere on the outskirts of Surrey. Now, all of that is all good fun, but it should not overshadow the fact that this document, as I hope again you've been shown this morning, for all the mythologizing of it, and for all the nonsense that's been talked about it, is of continuing constitutional significance. It does indeed represent an attempt to place the sovereign power of the state under the rule of law. And although a great deal of what is said about it is myth, the myths that people believe about themselves alter the way that they behave within the world. If you believe that you are a people born to world domination and conquest, then you are likely to behave accordingly. If you believe you are a people born to a degree of liberty, to a degree of rule under law, to a respect for the law and due process under the law, then you may behave in a rather different way. The four iconic Magna Cartas are those at Lincoln, at Salisbury, and then the two in the British Library, this one of unknown provenance, which lacks a seal, and this one whose provenance is now established, as I shall show you, which was severely burnt in the 1730s, and although it has a seal, its seal has been reduced to something looking a bit like a chewed-up toffee. We have a drawing made before the true damage to that document took place that shows us the handwriting of that, in many ways, the most iconic of all four of the surviving Magna Cartas of 1215. Now, as you should also know, and have heard already this morning, Magna Carta 1215 is only the beginning of a process in which the document changed over time as it was gradually reissued on successive occasions by successive 13th century kings, altered, 
as those changes were made. To begin with, it lasted as a legal settlement for less than 12 weeks. But within a very short period of the death of King John, the king who had put his seal to it, it was reissued again in November 1216, again a year later, again in 1225. The attempt to distinguish those various reissues really dates back to the days of this man, William Blackstone, who published a significant commentary on the Charter in 1759, in which he attempted to distinguish the various reissues of the document over time. That work enabled us, for example, to distinguish the Magna Carta of 1215 from the definitive form that it had reached by 1225. And on the way, it introduced us to the reissue of 1216 that was for the first time sealed by the Pope's legate in England. You can see one of the legatine seals attached to that document. That's a document in Oxford today. Um, the uh, legate seal, which was effectively the seal of the Pope, gave the Church's official imprimatur to the document. It was reissued again in 1225 in a definitive form when the King's son, Henry III, son of King John, came of age. Again, it was reissued in 1297 during a constitutional crisis at the end of the reign of Edward I, and again in a final form as a single sheet charter in 1300. Now, it's as a result of those various reissues that Magna Carta survives in so many different forms, so many different original single sheets scattered across the libraries, to begin with at least, of England, and now more widely around the world. The definitive attempt to collect, to assemble a list of those reissues, was made in the so-called Statutes of the Realm, published at the beginning of the 19th century as a multi-volume attempt to gather up the laws of England. The Statutes of the Realm claimed to have discovered all of the original surviving Magna Cartas, but it's been apparent for a very long time that that attempt was far from definitive. In this instance, for example, at Hereford, uh, I found more than 20 years ago now an example of the 1217 Magna Carta that was not listed in that listing in the Statutes of the Realm, that in many ways is as important as any of those that are so listed, and because Magna Carta is a text that was not printed in the Middle Ages, each individual variation between each individual original, in theory, can alter our understanding of the text. For a proper listing of the Magna Cartas that survived in the wild, we have to wait until 2007, when Ross Perot, two times presidential candidate, sold a Magna Carta that he'd bought in the 1980s from the Brudenell family of Dean Park, sold it at auction in Sotheby's in New York for $21.3 million. Now, as part of that sale, I was commissioned to go around hoovering up, collecting all of the surviving originals, all of the evidences for Magna Carta itself. What I think is most exciting there is that this is supposed to be the best known document in English history, and yet precisely because it is so well known, people have taken it for granted that all the work on it was done a long time ago. The result of that is that a lot of the work was never done at all. As part of those 2007 cataloguing efforts, we came upon a number of interesting stories. For example, the story of the attempt made by Winston Churchill in 1941 to give the Lincoln Cathedral Magna Carta of 1215 to the American people. This was an attempt to bring America in on the side of Britain against the Germans in the Second World War, shortly before Pearl Harbor, and it was an attempt that reached the cabinet where we see here Winston Churchill writing in red at the bottom of this document, instructing his ministers and civil servants that this gift of Magna Carta go ahead. Of course, it didn't take place because Winston Churchill nor the government did not own Magna Carta. Magna Carta belonged to the Dean and Chapter of Lincoln, who were not best pleased by Winston Churchill's attempts to give it away. It was also during the course of that 12, 1207, 1207, 2007 attempt to catalogue the Charter that I came upon the first strands of the story of your Magna Carta in Canberra. Now, your Magna Carta in Canberra is well known to have belonged in the 1930s to a minor public school in Somerset called King's School Bruton. 
Your Magna Carta comes from the 1297 issue of the document. And it's a very nice exemplar. It has a seal neatly attached to the bottom of the document, and the document itself has survived very well over the past seven centuries. The question here is, how did King's School Bruton come into possession of an original Magna Carta? King's School Bruton wasn't founded until the 1550s, and it's really a rather minor Elizabethan grammar school that only towards the last 100 years or so has developed pretensions as a public school. You can see here that at the turn of the 20th century, it was still a fairly limited building. This is the luxurious accommodation afforded the boys in the headmaster's house of King's School Bruton. This is the OTC who were at the beginning of the 20th century, who were about to go off and fight on Flanders fields in 1914. And here we have the magnificent school laboratory. In other words, what I'm trying to convey to you is that this was not by any means a very wealthy establishment. It was an establishment that when it realized it was in possession of a Magna Carta, thought the best thing to do was probably to pop it. The legends of Magna Carta at King's School Bruton include a story in which the Magna Carta of King's School Bruton was discovered in the 1930s by haphazard in the desk of one of the boys in the big schoolroom. I'm sure that that story is pure myth. However, the charter was listed in the 1930s in this hand list of the King's School charters as a 1297 Magna Carta, following discussions with Sir Hilary Jenkinson of the Public Record Office, who by the 1930s clearly knew of the existence of this document. What is most peculiar about it is it's the only truly medieval document in the entire school archive. The rest of the archive dates only from the 1550s and afterwards. In other words, what on earth was this much earlier document, this much earlier cuckoo, doing in the King's School nest? Now, immediately after the war, in 1951, the then headmaster of King's School Bruton, in consultation with Sir Hilary Jenkinson of the Public Record Office, decided to auction his Magna Carta. It was offered for sale to the British Library, who lacked any original of the 1297 issue. But the library was only prepared, at this time it was the British Museum, was only prepared to pay two and a half thousand pounds. So, the headmaster took the charter to Sotheby's, where it was valued at £10,000, with a further £2,500 in Sotheby's commission. The then High Commissioner of Australia was informed of the possibility of this sale, and negotiations began behind the scenes for Australia to acquire this iconic document, with Hilary Jenkinson clearly keen that the sale go ahead. The sale itself had to pass through a committee chaired by Edward Playfair, a junior official within the Treasury who was responsible for ensuring that works of significant artistic importance were not exported wrongly. But Playfair and his committee, responding very much to political pressure from the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rab Butler, decided that on the whole it was better that Magna Carta be sold to Australia and find a home in the Southern Hemisphere. There were, though, in the correspondence which I unearthed in 2007, various intriguing leads about how Magna Carta had first come to King's School Bruton. Here we see a letter from Rab Butler, or um, from Playfair to Rab Butler, annotated by Rab Butler, in which the admission is made that the best that anyone can come up with by way of explanation is that the Magna Carta now in Canberra did not really belong to King's School Bruton at all. We're told here, though with no names or details, that the charter was probably in the office of a solicitor in another deed box and in some way or another jumped from a deed box belonging to somebody completely different into the deed box of King's School Bruton. Although in 1952 Magna Carta was duly sold, here it is being delivered by the governor of the school, King's School Bruton, to the then Australian High Commissioner. It was transported to the Southern Hemisphere and fated on its arrival across Australia. 
even as late as 1957, we find the authorities in the Senate in Australia concerned about the exact provenance of their charter. If we get up close to this letter, you'll see that they're asking here in 1957 for any details of how the document in the first place had got into the archive of King's School Bruton. Any stories about it at all? What was done with it in the war? I believe that they received no very satisfactory response. And so we come to the sale of 2007. Now what became apparent then is that all the other 1297 Magna Cartas, like yours in Canberra, are annotated at the bottom with details of which counties they were sent to. This, for example, is the 1297 Charter in the archives of the Corporation of London, and at the bottom it duly says that this is the example sent to London, sent to Middlesex. Your Canberra Magna Carta, if we can call it that now, that it had left the possession of King's School Bruton, has similar annotations at the bottom. And they tell us that it was the exemplar of the charter sent to the southern English county of Surrey. Now, King's School Bruton lies in Somerset, a long way from Surrey. However, by pure and happy accident, I happened at more or less the same time that the sale went ahead, to be working on charters that were not properly catalogued in the British Library. And there I'd come upon a 1297 forest charter, that's the sort of junior Magna Carta. Now this, remarkably, which had not gone noticed before, was annotated at the bottom with details that said that it was the exemplar sent into Surrey. And if we show those details alongside your Canberra Magna Carta, it soon becomes apparent that these were once a pair. They had both been in the same archive. So what archive had the Forest Charter of Surrey been in? The answer here, and you can see this is me this morning taking a screenshot of the present online British Library catalogue, the answer was that the Surrey Forest Charter had been gifted to the British Library in 1905 by a man named F. Quecket Zooch. So you're told in that slide. And um, I thought immediately, well, there can't be that many F. Quecket Zooches out there. You know, there aren't that many Quecket Zooches in any telephone directory, let alone the London telephone directory. But I searched in vain for any sign of a Mr. Quecket Zooch. However, a good friend of mine, Christopher Whittick, who is the county archivist of Sussex, hit upon a brainwave. You can see where that brainwave originated if you look indeed at that screenshot, because you'll see that even the word charters has been misspelled by the person keying in the word for the purposes of this online catalogue. And precisely the same thing had happened to the name of Mr. Quecket Zooch. Into the shoes of Mr. Quicket Zooch, thanks to Christopher Whittick's brainwave, stepped a, a real person, a Mr. Quicket Looch. Now, he did indeed come from Somerset. He was indeed a solicitor, and he was closely related to a series of solicitors and bankers in that part of the West Country in which the Magna Carta from King's School Bruton eventually came to rest. They did indeed have a major bank and a major solicitor's practice at Langport and Drayton in Somerset. In 1905, Mr. Quecket Looch gave his charters, including the Forest Charter for Surrey, to the British Museum. But I am 99% sure that it was at that point that the Magna Carta that Mr. Quecket Looch, this solicitor, had in his strongbox, leapt from that strongbox into the strongbox of King's School Bruton, in due course to be offered for sale by the headmaster in 1951 and in 1952 transported to Australia. As for the real origin of these documents, that takes us to this place. This is Easebourne Priory in Surrey. On the, sorry, it's in Sussex. It's on the Surrey-Sussex border. Um, and the two counties of Surrey and Sussex shared a sheriff in the Middle Ages. So it's perfectly understandable that if the sheriff had used this as his archive, he would have deposited there charters directed both to Surrey and to Sussex. The Forest Charter survives in the British Museum, British Library today, alongside a whole series of deeds for this priory. 
And my guess, my certainty actually, is that your Magna Carta was originally deposited by the Sheriff of Sussex and Surrey in 1297 in the archives of this small Sussex nunnery. Well, so far so good. That does at least explain the rather strange anomaly of a Magna Carta of the 1297 issue ending up in Australia. But I want to show you now some things that have come to light more recently that may show the degree to which this story is still ongoing. Not necessarily your story, but the wider story of Magna Carta and its various exemplars. We've been running for the last few years a great big Magna Carta project based partly in my university in Norwich, the University of East Anglia, in Oxford, in London, at the British Library, in Canterbury and elsewhere. And a number of very interesting things have emerged from that. A number of books, and also a big British Library exhibition that was held throughout the summer of 2015 and attracted 130,000 visitors to the British Library. That exhibition was opened a few months ago by Prince Charles, yet another royal, as it were, bandwagoning on the back of Magna Carta. He gave a very good speech saying that in that damp meadow at Runnymede was lit a flame, the flame of liberty that burns still. And he was then shown round the exhibition by my colleague Claire Bray, there is Prince Charles, your future king, perhaps, looking at a statue of his great ancestor, his great-great-great-grandfather, King John. Prince Charles is looking a little bit winsome because what he's actually looking at, he's got his tongue in his cheek, he's looking at King John's teeth that were excavated from Worcester Cathedral in the 1790s when King John's body was disinterred. Not just his teeth, but his thumb bone. And were we of a 19th century imaginative bent, we might imagine, as in those illustrations, King John bearing down with his thumb on the charter and grinding his teeth in fury that he's been made to issue this most annoying document. As part of the celebrations for that exhibition, we were able to bring together all four of the 1215 Magna Cartas. And if I and others in that shot are looking a little bit worried, it's because there is a security man with a very large weapon standing at the end of the room. The value of those documents is simply unimaginable. Now that was all organized as a publicity stunt, but it did bring to light some very interesting new evidence. It enabled us, for example, to show that the, the burnt Cotton Magna Carta, the, the Magna Carta that ended up in the collections of Sir Robert Cotton, now in the British Library, originated in Canterbury. We can show that because it's exactly the same in form to a version of the Magna Carta copied into books at Canterbury. It enabled us to take a proper analysis of the unburnt charter in the British Library. Now that not only brought to light a whole series of words written on the back of the document, you can see them there, which one day will enable us to tell where that document came from. But it also showed up through spectrographic analysis, a whole series of writings in a 14th or 15th century hand running down the margins of the document that had previously been ignored. And what that shows is that even in the late Middle Ages, this document was being used. It was being practically employed in the drafting of attempts to limit the powers of King Richard II, King of England, many centuries after King John. In the course of our research, we've also brought to light in Lambeth Palace in London, the original publication schedule for Magna Carta in the summer of 1215. This is an extremely important document whose existence has been guessed at in the past, but which turned up on a wet day in November two years ago, again, simply as a result of happy accident and perhaps a little bit of clever detective work. It's perhaps the most important single document related to Magna Carta to have emerged in the last 50 years. It got some publicity, but the real publicity this year went to another Magna Carta. It's the discovery of an unknown Magna Carta that always brings in the media. In December last year, I was working late at night in Belfast, having given a talk to a Belfast human rights festival that some may think a contradiction in terms. However, late at night in Belfast. Belfast is not necessarily a city with a great deal of nightlife. Uh, I began trawling the internet, looking at the archives of the Maidstone Kent Record Office, where I knew I would be within a couple of weeks. And there I came, really a bit like entering the term into Google, I came upon a reference to a forest charter, not a Magna Carta yet, but a forest charter that belonged to the borough of Sandwich, of the issue of 1300. 
And I immediately emailed the archivist who went and looked in the box and said, yes, indeed, we do have a forest charter of 1300. It's in a pretty ropey state. But we also have this. This is Sandwich's Magna Carta of the 1300 issue, previously entirely unknown. And the story of that discovery went round the world and was covered by major media in your country, in Australia. I had the delight of speaking several times uh, to really charming people on Australian radio who took a great interest in this discovery. All of that to say that there are things out there still to be found and that the story of your King's Bruton Magna Carta is merely part of a much wider story that is ongoing. For example, we've been able to show, bringing together not just the Magna Cartas, but all the surviving charters of King John, we've been able to show that not only do we have over 250 charters of King John beyond Magna Carta, but that we can actually begin to pair them up and show who wrote which charter. This is the Lincoln Magna Carta, this is another charter granted to the Bishop of Lincoln by King John in 1215, and if you put them together, you'll see that they're written in the same hand. The Salisbury Magna Carta is written in a peculiar hand of the early 13th century, but we found a document that is written in a very similar, perhaps the same hand. If you put the two together, it's very difficult to tell them apart, and that too is a story that went round the world. Now I show you there the front page, I think it's not the front page, maybe it's the middle pages, of the San Paulo major daily newspaper of Brazil that carried that story in the summer of 2015, the Salisbury Magna Carta. But I show you that because, as I think you've already heard this morning, there's a great deal of myth-making and a great deal of misunderstanding about Magna Carta, and that too is busily continuing. So if you look in the background of that picture, you'll see a whole series of objects, tanks, aeroplanes, guns and things, which I'm not sure have a great deal to do with either Salisbury or its Magna Carta. Even so, if you want to find out more of this sort of thing, go on our website, type in Magna Carta Project or Magna Carta Research, and you'll find there a lot of materials, not just about your Magna Carta, though I hope, as I have hopefully shown you this lunchtime, and I wish you a very happy lunch. I hope that I've shown that your Magna Carta has a major part to play in a story that's gone round the world. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings an end the, uh, to the, the morning session. Um, according to the program, we should be back from lunch at uh, 20 to 2, but we've run a little over time. So uh, we'll start again at 10 to 2, um, and that will commence the afternoon session. Uh, just a reminder that the Queen's Terrace Cafe is uh, accessible via the public walkway towards the front of the building. Um, and I think that's all that needs to be covered there. So if we can see you back here at 10 to 2, that would be great. Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to take your seats, please, for the afternoon session? Now, I'm instructed to give you some further information about parking, because apparently, uh, if you spend $25 at the Parliament shop, you can validate your ticket and, it's, and the parking is, is free. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, 
so uh, while, I, while I'm not here to advertise any products, of course, there is our, our lovely little Magna Carta booklet, Australia's Magna Carta, which has a, as a centrepiece essay, uh, Nicholas Vincent's story of, of our Magna Carta. And our new edition has a number of other essays by eminent Australians and uh, is a very interesting read and a bargain at $10. Anyway, to kick off this afternoon's session, I am delighted to introduce Professor Stephanie Trigg. Stephanie is Professor in the School of Culture and Communications in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. She was editor of Medievalism and the Gothic in Australian Culture, published in 2005. And um, it, I think it was in that work that she took rather an interest in our, our um, office of the Usher of the Black Rod, which of course has medieval origins. Uh, she's also the author of a paper, Parliamentary Med Medievalism, the Australian Magna Carta as Secular Relic, which was published in Australian Literary Studies in 2011. She's currently a chief investigator and a program leader in the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for the History of Emotions at the University of Western Australia, where she leads the Melbourne node of the centre. And her topic this afternoon is Magna Carta in Print and English Translation. So please welcome Professor Stephanie Trigg. Hello, everyone. Um, my thanks to Rosemary, to Nicholas, and also to Tim and Marilyn, who've worked behind the scenes to make the day work very smoothly. And I must also thank my two fabulous research assistants in Melbourne, Dr. Anne McKendry and Dr. Helen Hickey, who make a lot of this work possible. I speak to you as a literary scholar, but one with a particular interest in the way that post-medieval culture remakes the medieval. And today in particular, I'm thinking about 16th century printed editions of Magna Carta. So my central question is really bringing those two historical periods together, the medieval and the early modern. And my central question is, what did printing do to Magna Carta? What's the effect of having this medieval text um, made available in printed form? I've chosen the 16th century to focus on as the period when the Charter was first printed, both in the original Latin in 1508 and also in English translation, partially in 1527 and in its entirety in 1534. These are key moments in the document's dissemination and its increased accessibility for a broader audience and in the transition of this medieval text into early modern culture, part of its long journey to the mythic status it enjoys today. The invention of print is often represented to us as one of the great steps forward out of the Middle Ages and into the light of modernity. According to conventional histories, print culture brings increased literacy, increased democracy, a growing sense of national identity in particular, as news and information can spread far more rapidly and bring people into greater connection with each other. This is the famous thesis of Benedict Anderson. Print is also seen, often wrongly I'm going to suggest, as establishing texts with security and into fixity beyond the vagaries of copying manuscripts out by hand, as of course medieval scribes did. Print is often regarded then as a transformative technology, that is a technological innovation that in part signals the end of the Middle Ages. That's, I think, a very common view. So what happens then to a medieval text when it is set into type and duplicated and printed to make many copies on the press with the aim of making the text clearer and more readily accessible, both to those who can read its Latin and also, later on, those who wish to read it in English. How many of the text's medieval qualities survive in the transformation into this new technology? And how do we read those printed editions today? There are a number of potential contradictions at play here. Printed editions of medieval texts, I think, strive quite hard to maintain the authority of their manuscript originals and their symbolic significance, especially when you are dealing with printing foundational texts like the Bible or legal statutes and charters. 
But at the same time, print needs to commend its commercial innovations to prospective purchases. That is, the discourse of printing, I'll argue, often treads quite a fine line between affirming on the one hand that the texts have not changed, that the texts will be presented to you with security and, and accuracy, but on the other hand, affirming that the new editions, the new technology, will offer you something new, something additional. And so this then becomes one of the key differences between the 13th century manuscript copies that were distributed all over England to inform and remind the people and the king of the terms of the Great Charter, and on the other hand, the printed editions in the 16th century that were offered for sale primarily to students of the law. We should not underestimate then the difference in the commercial structures at work in this later period and the changing role of these copies used now far more in a legal than in a political context in the 16th century. I think that there is sometimes an unspoken assumption in the early printed editions of many works, namely that you might actually need more than one copy yourself, where with a manuscript in the medieval period, you probably only own one copy, and then you will perhaps annotate it in the margins. Desmond talked this morning about the layers of textual apparatus that we're familiar with in medieval manuscripts. They were produced often with wide borders. They often incorporated commentaries on commentaries on biblical texts. And then if you had your own copy, you would add your own glosses into the margin. But the commercial discourse of print works in a completely different way. It often assumes, I think, implicitly, that you might actually want to buy another copy with the revisions and the corrections incorporated in the next updated edition, along with the assumption that printed texts are going to be cheaper, more readily available, more accessible. So I think that there is actually a ramping up, if anything, of the ratios of supply and demand in this period with printed texts. As we know, the Magna Carta was copied many times in manuscript form in the 13th century. The, the visual iconography of the ceiling, such as our poster here, is, is really, really crucial, and that's important to bear that in mind. But it's also important to remember that it is a text designed also to be read aloud to people who were not there at that signing. So copies were sent to cathedrals, to sheriff's offices, to the county courts, for example, as successive versions were made and then copied anew. As David Carpenter tells us, in 1265, the Montfort government sent the 1225 char in 1265, the Montfort government sent the 1225 charters to every cathedral, where they were to be read twice a year before the people. That is read aloud in oral form. In 1300, the sheriffs were still supposed to read the charter four times a year before the people in the county court. In French and possibly in English as well as Latin. Whether they did this or not, it's harder to be sure, but that, is the, that was the idea. There are some French manuscript translations that survive, but no English early manuscript translations. Interestingly, Carpenter cannot resist his own lighthearted invocation of the medieval in the midst of this very serious discussion. He says, <clears throat> pardon me, some in the county court may have listened with rapt attention Others probably went out to the alehouse. <laughs> so there's a suspicion that perhaps the, the reciting of the terms of Magna Carta, and it would have taken quite a long time to read it out, um, perhaps might have been regarded already in 1300 as a form of ritual practice to which perhaps you need not pay attention to every letter of every statute, of every, every chapter. And in that same year, 1300, Edward I ordered that Magna Carta be declaimed in Westminster Hall, both literally, that is in Latin, and also, he says, in the language of the country, that's translating lingua patria. Presumably that's French, but there is a question mark as whether the language of the country might be English. I mean, the common people were speaking English at this time, but all the language of the parliamentary and legal stuff was in French and Latin. So whether the Magna Carta was translated into English and read at this time, I'm, I'm not sure. One, of course, would like to think so in the spirit of increased democracy, but my hunch is that probably French was the language of that declamation. It's frustrating that the text doesn't specify, but in fact, it's also curious and important that it doesn't. The principle is clear that the text will be read aloud from the manuscript copies in the language to which people in the county court will have access, whether that be French or English. I think it's French, but we can't be sure. Carpenter has records of over 30 copies made in the century after Runnymede, and as we heard this morning from Nicholas Vincent, more are probably being discovered as we speak, particularly in this year. And while the practice of reading the Charter aloud gradually fell into abeyance, the Charter itself started to become incorporated into other written manuscript collections. 
But in the 14th and 15th centuries, as the English parliament became a rather more powerful political force, the charter became less seen as a political document and more of a legal one, as we've already heard this morning, used much more commonly, for example, in property law than in political practice. Magna Carta was still affirmed at the beginning of a parliamentary session, however, and it was confirmed again by Henry VI in 1423. But by the time Magna Carta was first printed in 1508, nearly 30 years after the arrival of print technology, it was primarily used to determine legal, not political issues. As we know, the first printer to set up a printing business in England was William Caxton, who, ex who established his press in Westminster in 1476, directing his business primarily to the royal court. But it was not until his successor, Wynkyn de Word, that's a great name for a printer, Wynkyn de Word, I love that. <laughs> he famously moved the press to the city of London, right into Fleet Street in 1500, and also set up a bookstall in St Paul's Churchyard, and that becomes a very common um, part of the imprimatur of many 16th century books, you know, available for sale in St Paul's Churchyard. That's where the books were sold. Fleet Street was where they were printed, of course, the origins of the Fleet Street Press now. So this shift from the Court of Westminster to the City of London was a real uh, sim significant symbolic idea that print was becoming increasingly commercial as an environment for textual production. Other printers soon set up business in London too, and one of these was Richard Pinson, who was born in 1448 in Normandy, who was the one who first printed the Magna Carta in 1500. He was actually named as the King's Printer, and he printed law texts and statutes, but he also present, uh, printed religious texts, romances, the travel book of Sir John Mandeville. He also printed three volumes of Geoffrey Chaucer's poetry. So I'm primarily a Chaucerian, so you're going to hear a little bit about Chaucer today, just, just for comparison. So this is uh, Pinson's uh, first page of the Magna Carta there, and I have a, another version of it here. Um, so that's just that first one of um, printed in 1508. His edition uses a font um, in here. You can see that Eduard was there that we call black letter or sometimes it's called textura or Gothic font. And I'm going to use those words loosely and interchangeably today is a, is a font that is modeled on some of the most formal and easiest to read medieval manuscript scripts. Be very grateful they did not model themselves on 15th century cursive handwriting, which is just horrible to read. Just be, be happy about that. Modern commentators often make very large claims for the transformative cultural capacity of print as an agent of change in economic, political, social, and cultural forms. But it's remarkable to me that these first printed editions did not signify their awareness of this change at all. If anything, they sought to minimise the differences in appearances of the books as they made that shift from manuscript to print. So the first fonts, like this one, are cut to imitate formal texture on manuscript hands. Title pages and initials were often rubricated by hand with red ink. Um, this next one from 1529 is another Latin text of the Magna Carta. The title page here is alternating the red and black ink. It's rather fetchingly on his title page. I'm not sure if you can read it there, but he says, um, the phrase, he says, Magna Carta, da -da, and is added more statutes than ever was imprinted in any one book before this time. We get this a lot in these editions, um, a very familiar appeal in these early modern printed texts. This one has more than the one that was previously available. Um, it's the same with the editions of Chaucer. More works by Chaucer than were in the last edition. Whether they were by Chaucer or not becomes immaterial. <laughs> more works associated with Chaucer become the vogue in the 16th century. This one is directed to, you can see there, to young studios of the law, the most up-to-date text that will give them the edge. And I was thinking this morning about um, Martin's comment about the whole point about law is learning to think like a lawyer. These texts play an important role in that. The idea is that you need the most up-to-date stuff and you need the most inclusive collections as a young studier of the law. But when he came to print the Magna Carta, he printed it in Roman, sorry, in printed in Gothic, but if you can see here, up at the top, up on the blue arrow there, he actually puts the title in Roman font. This is just a tiny, tiny um, moment, but it just really strikes me here, the distinction between the editorial comment or the titling using the more modern Roman font, but the text itself in the black letter. Now that is a tiny, tiny moment in most of the Magna Cartas in the 16th century. I mean, all of them are printed in this black letter font, but there's just a sense here that you can get a differentiation between Roman and black, and black letter font, very interesting. 
so we note the layout and presentation of the text on the page. This is the first time that different typefaces are used to mark that difference between the text itself and the surrounding introductory materials, the paratext. So Roman and italic types had been developed quite early in print history in the 15th century, and Wink and De Word was using an italic type by 1528. But the Gothic fonts were for very many centuries long preferred, especially for these older authoritative texts such as Bibles, legal statutes, and indeed the printing of Chaucer's medieval poetry. So even though in one sense this is utterly unremarkable, and it's just a tiny, tiny difference in font that I'm drawing attention to there, the differentiation is quite significant in the 16th century editorial presentation of the medieval effect, of medieval text with this effect. Magna Carta here is, it's re-medievalised, it's affirmed as a medieval text, it's still being printed in a medieval typeface, typeface, <laughs> distanced in opposition to the modern Roman font. And it's a pattern, I'm going to just jump ahead a little bit in time to show you a comparison. Um, the distinction in typefaces used by Thomas Specht in his edition of Geoffrey Chaucer's works in 1598. So we are jumping ahead to the end of the century. This is the title page of Specht's complete works of our ancient and learned English poet Geoffrey Chaucer, newly printed. Note, of course, Specht is not using the word medieval. This is not a 16th century word at all. Ancient is the word that we're using here. It's a very elaborate title page and the contents of the edition using um, both Roman and italic font. I'm sorry, it's so small there. But we have epigraphs from um, Chaucer up the top and Ovid down the bottom, so it's a classicising humanist work of recovering the medieval text. Um, later pages, we have on the left is a beautiful engraving of Chaucer and his family tree, an image of Chaucer's tomb on the bottom. The first page of the Canterbury Tales also invokes um, various aspects of Chaucer's family tree. I'll just, I just wanted to give you a sense of the complexity of what printing looked like in the 16th century. This is part of Speck's introduction, and this is a, it's a beautiful argument here. So he's writing in what we would now think of as the normative Roman font. He's using italics as part of that, but when he comes to Chaucer, he puts the Chaucer text back in that black letter font. So it's again this very strong distinction between the medieval black letter and the modern humanist um, discourse on the top. And finally, this is the, the Pierre de Resistance, really. Speck's edition of Chaucer is the first to include a glossary. So by 1598, he is saying, you do not understand medieval language. It's too hard for you. And so we have the old and obscure words in Chaucer explained. And also we get a little bit of work, a note about their etymology. So again, we see that the words themselves in Chaucer are in black letter, then F, I think it's the French and the italic, and then the meaning in, in modern English with the Roman font there. It's a clear demonstration that black letter, even in 1598, signifies them a medieval that is becoming unreadable, becoming unrecognisable, needing translation. The typographical marks then of linguistic and semantic otherness. And as the century went on, as the 16th century went on, the distinction between the medieval and the Gothic and the Roman and the modern became even clearer. So let me go back to Magna Carta and let me go back 60 years earlier to 1534. And this is the date of the first complete translation into modern English of Magna Carta by George Ferrers. Um, again, most of the text in the commentary still appears in black letter. The early discourse of the printer still wants to keep that medieval style. So this is the title page and the last page of the 1534 Magna Carta in English. Note again there, the Book of Magna Carta with divers other statutes whose names appear in the next leaf following translated into English. I'm very struck by that. There seems perhaps some residual anxiety here, but you're going to get Magna Carta and you're going to get other things as well. You've just got to turn the page and then consult the index. There's a, a lot of stuff in these editions about finding your way through the book. So there are lots of tables of statutes, indexes, um, laws put into alphabetical form, numbering and so forth. There's a great deal of um, machinery presenting the text at this point. Uh, note also that on the final page, this is where the name of the translator appears. Um, translated here by George Ferrers, but the word imprinted at London in Fleet Street by me, Robert Redmond, dwelling at the sign of the George next to St Dunstan's Church. Um, imprinted is the big word. So the role of the printer appears at the end of the book, but so also does the name of the translator. So in modern editions, we will put the name of the translator up at the front of the book, but here the translator, translator's name appears at the end, along with that of the printer. It's a sign of almost the translation as technical work, I think, technical work of the same order as uh, the printing work. Um, and then we have the next, uh, on the page to the left is the index. You can see at the top there, the Great Charter. And then here is the first page itself, again, completely in the Gothic font there. 
Um, I won't go into details about the translation. Um, everyone agrees it's a really bad translation. <laughs> and it was corrected and revised many, many times in the 16th and 17th century. So it's another question beyond the scope of this paper, just what we actually do with the text itself when we try and put it in English of successive centuries. Rather ironically, I think, still in this first edition in 1534, we have this beautiful page here, which is entitled, Faults Escaped in the Printing. <laughs> so by the time he was ready to bind it and have it ready for sale, he's realized that it's full of mistakes. And so he writes a beautiful, it's a lovely picture. Look at the lovely picture on the top there. We've got this sort of fancy business down here tapering off. This is just all a list of the Corrigenda. These are all the things that are wrong with his text. So it's again, very interesting. Like it's a, it's a new text, you need to have it because it's an English text, you need it and yet it's wrong, so you need the corrections as well. So it's a, it's a real double move there. Um, a great irony. So everyone wants to see print as fixing things, but texts are rarely fixed. Printers introduced errors just as often as medieval scribes did. And while the format of the printed book makes it a bit easier to find things, there's also a tremendous amount of energy that goes in these editions to making lists and indexes. But the texts themselves are often just as confusing and just as unstable and just as wrong as many of the manuscripts too. A famous example, um, a copy of the Sinner's Bible or the Wicked Bible is coming up for auction on November the 11th. This was printed in 1631 with the famous line, thou shalt commit adultery. <laughs> How can you make that mistake? I mean, there are a lot of conspiracy theories around that, but I think it's just human error. Printing is not, so it's all about adultery, it's always human. <laughs> okay, touche, I'm going home now, my work is done. <laughs> um, the printers lost their license, so it wasn't quite so funny for them, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In 1541, the translation was revised and reissued. Um, and I haven't got the original here because I think it's just interesting to read this text. And honestly, it's easy to read in my modern italic type. Redmond writes of how difficult it would be to cut the whole text again. Um, and he says, because the French and the terms as well French and Latin have become so far out of use by reason of their antiquity. Okay, so it's again, this is a medieval text, but we're calling it an antique test now. That scarcely those that best be best studied in the laws can understand them, much less then shall such as come rarely to the reading thereof perceive what they mean. It's really hard. This is a discourse of scholarly difficulty. Nevertheless, um, me thought it necessary to set them forth in such sort as men might best have knowledge of them, and knowledge can they have none except they read them. And what doth it avail to read if they understand not? And how shall they understand the meaning which understand not the text? It's a rather circular argument, I think. For this cause, I say, was this book translated into the English, which though per case it shall not satisfy the learned, yet shall it be a good help for the unlearned. Isn't that great? So it's kind of for the student of law, but perhaps one whose Latin wasn't perfect. Let's face it, not everyone's Latin is perfect. So we'll have the translation be useful for the unlearned as well as the learned. So Redmond is concerned about the comprehension of the text, yet he still preserves the black letter convention for medieval and legal texts. Humanist and classical works, however, almost always printed in Roman typeface. Famously, Richard Tottle, some of you who've done literary scholarship will know that Tottle printed the songs and sonnets of um, poets like Wyatt and Surrey, and he used a very elegant Roman and italic type for that, but his Magna Carta is still in resolute black letter. This is Tottle's edition from 1556. And this one is addressed to gentlemen studious of the laws of England. Um, and this is interesting because I think I've got a translation of that, yes. This is another advertisement for his text. Yet when you shall weigh how in sundry paces much here is added out of books of good credit, as examined by the rolls of parliament, how eck where the truth even of the best prince is overmatched by their faults, not few, not a little reformed, the light of pointing adjoined, it's punctuation, the chapters of statutes truly divided and noted with their due numbers, the alphabetical table justly ordered and quoted, the leaves not one falsely marked with many other help to correct it. This is the apparatus that uh, Tottle is adding to, to the text there. I hope your wisdoms will soon aspire that neither have I new printed it for you causeless, nor you shall buy of me fruitless, so it's, it's, worth, it's, it's worth the money. It's an advertisement, this is the commercial discourse. And now I cease further to trouble you from your more earnest studies, because of course you, my prospective buyers, are 
prospective lawyers or learning the discourse of the law. I pray God to send you most worshipful success to your own glory and profit, to the comfort of your friends and advancement of your country. So he's playing the national benefit card here very strongly. So the discourse of print, far from confirming certainty, is often the discourse of anxiety about trying to fix the text and find a way around it, even in this new medium and in translation. The printer here is adopting a very flattering tone while also trying to sell his new improvements. In technical terms, more things have been added. The texts have been compared with the roles of parliament. Punctuation has been added. Chapters have been divided and numbered. Alphabetical table has been added. The page is correctly numbered. And he also invokes, as I say, the national benefit for the advancement of your country. So avoiding the vagaries of the medieval roles, the unpunctuated, unnumbered, rolled up roles of parchment or medieval charters themselves. Here's the convenience of the book. And yet at the same point, at the same time, the authority of the medieval Gothic font holds firm. So it's guaranteeing its medievalness by being printed in black letter, but also with all this new technical apparatus. So print culture certainly made medieval texts like Magna Carta more available to greater numbers of more people, as well as rendering the text more comprehensible through the imposition of punctuation, capitalization, indexing, and so forth. But the vagaries of print technology, human error, and human interpretation inevitably creep in. After all, it was in the commercial interest of the printers not to fix the text, but to keep producing a market for new, improved, and revised editions. Magna Carta in the 16th century, black letter editions, was both reassuringly old, but also excitingly new again and again. Thank you. I'll leave it to somebody else to Thank you, Stephanie. That was fascinating. See how much more there is to a text than just the words on the page. Um, does anybody know anyone called Imogen? Well, I do. I've got a well, niece called Imogen. Yeah. Of course, it's, it's a Shakespearean misprint because when the um, typesetters were setting the, the uh, first folio of uh, Shakespeare's play Cymbeline, which is a play about an ancient British king and his daughter Imogen, I double N O G E N. Of course, the guys who did the the um, there was a particular set of a uh, particular uh, group of compositors who were famous for their foul type. When they were undoing pages and putting the type back in their boxes, they got their N's and M's mixed up, and we have the name Imogen instead of the um, what it originally was Imogen. Anyway, that's just one of many anecdotes I have about. Printing. I'd love to sit down with you, Stephanie, and have lunch and talk fonts and all of those things. Anyway, this is about Magna Carta. So I'd now like to invite our next three speakers, our, our panel, uh, who will be talking about Magna Carta, personal encounters, popular culture, and Australian links. I'd like to invite you to come up to the table. So Dr. Kathleen Neal, Dr. Professor Andrew Lynch, and uh, Dr. David Heaton who are going to be addressing us over the next session. So we're moving away from, from the more uh, legal, legal history um, encounters with Magna Carta into um, more cultural and popular and contemporary encounters. And for this session, we have three speakers who are all eminently qualified to, to speak to us about these things. Uh, we might save questions and comments until the end of the, the, the session. Um, but I will introduce them one by one. And first up, we have Dr. Kathleen Neal. Dr. Neal lectures in medieval history in the School of Philosophical, Historical and International Studies in the Faculty of Arts at Monash University. Her recent research has focused on the role of letters in political communication between the royal government and its subjects in 13th century England. And, you know, this sounds like one of the best jobs in the world. She also has a highly regarded academic blog in 13th century England. I just can't wait to get into that. But please uh, welcome Dr. Kathleen Neal to speak to us this afternoon. Thank you, Rosemary. And it is one of the best jobs in the world. Um, 
I speak to you as a historian of the medieval period, but I want to start in a very different moment. In the 1997 Australian film, The Castle, the helpless barrister, Dennis Denuto, concludes his case against a compulsory acquisition of his client's house with an immortal phrase. In summing up, it's the constitution, it's Marbo, it's justice, it's law, it's the vibe. <laughs> now the landmark High Court decision in the native title case Marbo and Queensland number no. two and its representation, or perhaps we should say misrepresentation in popular culture, seems a rather strange place, perhaps, to begin talking about encounters with Magna Carta in the Middle Ages. But I hope you'll agree with me by the end of this presentation that it has actually a very powerful bearing on both the medieval and indeed the modern reception of this iconic document that we celebrate today. The Marbo decision forms one of the running jokes of the castle, and if you haven't seen it, go and watch it on DVD this evening. Um, it becomes a shorthand for both the poor legal understanding of the Kerrigan family's counsel and the family's own naivety in trusting and engaging him. It also serves as a metaphor for the disconnection between what, what we might call the people, as represented by this salt of the earth family, and their simple wants and perhaps even simpler understanding on the one hand, and on the other, the threatening interests of big business with their better knowledge, their bigger lawyers, and by extension, the support of big policy makers. Perhaps more importantly, it becomes shorthand for the justice of the Kerrigan's case. The rightness, inherently speaking, of protecting a family's home from malign outside interests. Now, putting aside the fact that the Marbo decision never had any actual and relevant bearing on the case that forms the centre of that movie, appealing to iconic moments of rightness at law, like Marbo, like the Constitution, signalled in this popular culture moment the moral of the situation to the audience. And that was true even if the audience had no better legal understanding of the Marbo case than the Kerrigan family. And what I want to suggest today is that in a similar way throughout its history, Magna Carta has often functioned as a metaphor, as a signal, a shorthand, whether or not the average person had any close understanding of what it said or what it meant. And we've talked a lot today about the, the king and the barons and concepts of law, but now I want to really bring our perspective back down to the people. Mechanisms were put in place quite early on in Magna Carta's history to publicise it, as Nick showed us um, on his video in call, and to make sure that people heard about it and understood its significance and took note of its highlights, yet really understanding it in its legal and indeed political implications remained fairly privileged knowledge, as we've come to understand. In other words, English medieval people heard of it and they knew about it, but how well they understood it and the uses to which they thought it could be put varied widely and weren't always accurate. And beyond members of the legal fraternity and elites who came into contact with the Charter through their involvement in political and legal gatherings like parliaments or county courts perhaps, people tended to refer to the vibe of Magna Carta much more than its precise articles. So what I'd like to do in my presentation today is give you a little taste of the range of people who encountered Magna Carta in the Middle Ages and what they made of it when they did. Although, as I'll argue, uh, understanding of Magna Carta was neither universal nor complete, there is in fact a great deal of evidence for its currency in certain kinds of legal and political discussion in England in the Middle Ages, and we've already heard about some of these today. Indeed, this morning we um, heard a little bit about petitions, and many thousands of these were submitted for consideration by the King and his council in Parliament from the 13th century onwards. And among these documents, many thousands of which still survive, um, we have many instances of petitioners mentioning Magna Carta as part of the justification for their appeal. Now, these survived because in the 1270s, Edward I of England had introduced the parliamentary petition as a particular formal mechanism for seeking certain kinds of formal redress of grievance. And these petitions very quickly acquired formal 
forms that they must take and therefore they needed expert advice to draw up. So people called on specialist notaries and legally aware secretaries to undertake this task. And as a result, using petitions um, as evidence of a general legal awareness in the populace is a bit risky. However, since petitions were submitted to parliament by all sectors of society and not just the elites, the barons, the church, etc., they nevertheless provide a wonderful source for testing how widespread the knowledge of Magna Carta could be if it tried. So, when we look at these petitions, it seems extremely clear that when people needed legal remedy in the Middle Ages, specifically the 13th and 14th centuries, whether it was through their own knowledge or perhaps the advice of their clever legal team, Magna Carta was on their radar as an important basis of legal complaint. And we can tell that some petitioners, or certainly their counsel, were extremely well informed about this because they rested their cases in petitions on particular clauses of Magna Carta, which they explicitly discussed. And such was the case, for example, of the Abbot of Bury St Edmunds who in about 1289 petitioned the king to uphold the refusal of the abbot's own refusal to respond to a particular legal summons on the grounds that the issue of the relevant writ was against Magna Carta, specifically clause 34 of the 1215 edition. Similarly, when the citizenry of York petitioned for the river Ouse not to be put in defence, which is a technical term meaning that the fisheries had been taken into private hands, they cited specific clauses on river management, um, namely clauses 47 and 8 of the 1215 issue. Sometimes the legal uses to which Magna Carta was put in such petitions demonstrated not only an awareness of the Charter's contents, but a certain, shall we say, agility of legal reasoning, trying to push the boundaries of the Charter's interpretation. And we can see it evolving gradually as this happens. For instance, the liberties of the City of London had been specifically guaranteed in the Charter since 1215. But in petitions, we see other urban and civic communities attempting to refer to the general tone, perhaps the vibe of this grant, in trying to claim various liberties and freedoms for themselves. An example is the Men of Great Yarmouth, a significant trading port on the East Anglian coast. And they attempted to extend the concept of the city of London's liberties in Magna Carta to argue that cities like London, in which they included Great Yarmouth, should also have their independence recognised, even though the original grant pertained specifically to the only case of London. Similarly, the tinsmiths of Cornwall collectively attempted a rather ambitious claim to general freedoms by asserting that liberties given to any specific group in Magna Carta ought to apply to the entire realm, presumably on the basis that the opening clause addressed itself to all the king's free and loyal subjects. And I think um, perhaps in argument with some of our other speakers today, the, the word free men in this document really does mean subjects. Um, and we know that it did apply to women uh, because there are clauses that apply specifically to women. Anyway, however, just as common as these well-informed and very specific references to the Charter, if not more so, were petitions that cited the vibe of this document without demonstrating the kind of close legal reading that men like the, men, uh, the Abbot of Bury St Edmunds, for example, had achieved. For instance, in, 12, uh, in 1315, I'm sorry, when Lady Isabel Bardolph, widow of Sir Hugh Bardolph, petitioned the King and his council for redress concerning, and I quote, the suit of Robert Lua, who deprived her of her free tenement by means of a writ obtained by false accusation. And despite her, Isabel, producing her royal charters granting those same tenements, in this request, she, her petition cited the tenor of Magna Carta, rather than relying on any specific clause or point, despite the fact that there were such relevant and specific clauses on which she could have relied. We might say then that for Isabel, 
the vibe or tenor of Magna Carta was just one of a veritable barrage of justificationary rhetoric that she launched against her opponent, alleging that his offence against her stemmed from fraud, from undue process, and in contravention of the Charter as an iconic statement of the King's Pact with his people in that reciprocal way that's been emphasised. Now, outside Parliament and beyond the case of these petitions, reference to this tone or vibe of the Charter also formed part of legal argument. And we can see this, for instance, in a case that appeared at the King's Bench in 1384, in which certain townsmen of Padstow in Cornwall argued for their ancestral right to control their own maritime contracts with reference to Magna Carta's grant of ancient liberties to other maritime towns like the Sankports. Specifics of this clause in this case proved not as vital as the call on principle, that principle so long prized in England as we've seen, both before and after Magna Carta, of an appeal to ancient and continuous precedent. And yet in this case, the, uh, the men of Padstow clearly felt that it was beneficial and perhaps necessary to tie this strategy directly to the charter by name rather than by calling on custom in a nebulous sense. Even though effectively that's what Magna Carta is standing for here. So appeals to Magna Carta as a kind of symbolic legal authority outside of its specific legal significance had become almost stereotypical by the 1320s. And we can see this, for instance, in a petition from the townsmen of Oxford to the king in 1328. And this was part of their long running and one might even say still continuing conflict with the university. The townsmen held, and I quote, that grants have been made to the Chancellor and University of Oxford, which are contrary to the town's liberties, the law of the land, and the Great Charter, and are to the prejudice of the Crown, and which have thrown the townsmen into such a state of subjection and oppression that they cannot levy the king's farm, that is, collect a kind of tax, or keep the peace, and they will be compelled to abandon the town if they don't have the king's help. Um, well, this is rather hyperbolic, but we can see how appeals to the vibe of the Charter are becoming part of an, of an integral way in which medieval English people are seeking to express very slippery concepts of justice and injustice, and using these words as a way to it, of attempting to coax a favourable response politically as much as legally from the officers of royal government and the king himself. Perhaps most tellingly, even outside areas of formal legal dispute like this, we do find evidence of citation of Magna Carta coming to be part of the popular language um, as early as the early 14th century. And we can see this in a very neat little example of the reports of tax assessors who had been sent into the counties of Staffordshire and Shropshire in 1317. Their letters back to the Exchequer noted that their duties had been impeded by people, quote, under the pretext of the king failing to observe the great charter of liberties of England, the charters of the forest and the ordinances made by prelates, earls and barons, end quote. In other words, they're making a, a grab bag of grievances here and the great charter is first and foremost. And it seems to imply that local people in the counties knew very well how to adopt the appropriate language of rights and law, at least to delay, if not to prevent, unwelcome intrusions into their lives by the king's officers. And for all of these complainants, just as for the Kerrigans, I think it's the vibe of the thing that is most strongly conveying the moral rightness of their case, irrespective, in fact, of the specific clause on which they might rely. So I could go on, but I think that set of examples has furnished us with enough evidence of the widespread awareness of Magna Carta as a valuable basis of legal argument in the 13th and 14th centuries, and at least sometimes a detailed knowledge of its contents. Both geographically and socially, we can see that the individuals and groups whom we know to have cited, cited this in their legal affairs varied quite widely. We've got businessmen and local authorities from eastern ports like Yarmouth, western areas like Padstow, places close to London like Oxford, northern cities like York, 
relatively lowly people like the tinsmiths of Cornwall, right up to the baronial families like the Bardolfs, who incidentally had a hereditary right to provide the king with a certain dish at his coronation feast, so they're quite senior in the baronage. And so it would seem, therefore, that people from all walks of medieval English life had encountered Magna Carta. So was it merely through their pressing need of their legal business that this broad range of people had encountered the Charter at all? Should we simply conclude that references to Magna Carta in these petitions and cases came from the legal personnel and not from the people? Well, this represents what I call the minimalist view, and it's very hard to prove beyond doubt that anyone represented in a legal document and records of legal proceedings had any awareness of legal issues before they became embroiled in the specific issue that caused all of those things to be recorded, if you see what I mean. But I think that's an unnecessarily pessimistic point of view. We don't need to assume that only lawyers held the key although they may have been the main store of the specific legal knowledge that was necessary to turn it into an effective argument. It can easily be hypothesised, and Stephanie's given us some clues here, that, the, that most people, just like the Kerrigans, had some awareness of the vibe of this document, the gist of Magna Carta, even before their legal affairs presented them with the opportunity and necessity of becoming more closely acquainted with it. Right from the earliest editions of the Charter, we find evidence of a concern to ensure its dissemination. In the six weeks following the initial agreement of June 1215, copies were distributed widely with instructions to the sheriffs to arrange for the terms to be read aloud, as we've heard. And as we know, this need not have meant reading aloud in Latin alone. True, the surviving original charters were written in that language and it was the most official, most appropriate way to record and produce any legal document of the time. However, it's clear that even the barons who were involved in negotiating the charter worked in a local form of French, sometimes known as Anglo-Norman, and by happy chance, a copy of a set of working papers from that 1215 negotiating period survives to demonstrate this. And it suggests the possibility uh, that Magna Carta was first proclaimed in 1215 in not only Latin, but at least French and perhaps other languages as well, for the benefit of local understanding. And we know that by the 1260s, reissues of the Charter were being proclaimed in multiple languages. And as Stephanie's shown us, that certainly included French and possibly English as well. Um, and I'd like to think that it did. <laughs> When Edward I reissued the Charter in 1297 and again in 1300, he ordered it to be read aloud in full and in public, I quote, four times a year at the major feast days, therefore church ceremonial moments, which were also key moments in the Crown's legal and administrative calendar. That is Michaelmas, the 29th of September, Christmas, Easter, and the Nativity of John the Baptist, which is the 24th of June. I'll put it in your calendar. Public proclamation of this kind took place in towns and cities, at markets, at fairs, in the countryside, at major crossroads. In other words, in every public place. And later, the regular recitation of the charter in the county court itself was also mandated. And so, while not every English person attended the parliament, or was at Runnymede, or obtained a legal education, everyone in theory had an opportunity to be exposed to the Charter regularly and in some detail, even if some of them were sneaking out for a cheeky ale. Importantly, however, while these measures demonstrate the possibility of widespread awareness of the Charter's existence, they remained largely oral. Therefore, although the document survives to us today as a written material object, that is not how most medieval people encountered it. Aside from, as we've heard, copies being presented for display in some cathedrals and sometimes even being nailed to the door in a, a prefigurement of Luther's 95 Theses later, most people encountered Magna Carta in the Middle Ages by hearing it. 
And that means that in order to understand the meeting, meaning of the full charter, those listening had to be able to follow its intricate, complex and very varied legal terminology in real time and be able to commit it to memory. And I don't think everyone was really capable of that. In other words, this was a major obstacle to the widespread accurate and detailed understanding of the Charter. So it's no wonder that what people retained was a general significance of this thing as a powerful legal object, a gist, a vibe. Perhaps remembering vaguely one or two, or two points of most specific relevance to their own livelihoods. For example, we might think that the women would be most likely to recall the clauses on widows' financial rights or dower. Or fishermen might be those who are most likely to recall the clauses on those famous fishing traps and the river management. In other words, like the Kerrigans in 1997, acquiring a vague sense that Marbo has something to do with one's paramount right to ancestral land, people knew that Magna Carta mattered and they felt that it mattered to them, but they needed a legal specialist to turn that general sensation into a viable legal argument. So what of the lawyers then, these notaries and attorneys and so forth, how did they encounter it? Well, as we might expect, that was a very different situation, and we, as we also might expect, there's a lot of literary written evidence for it, and I'll just survey that briefly. It's clear that Magna Carta was afforded a prime place in legal instruction from the late 13th century on, and it takes pride of place at the beginning of every handbook of English law from this period that I've ever been privileged to see in any of the great libraries of the world, from Oxford's Bodleian Library to the Library of Congress in Washington to the State Library of Victoria in Melbourne. And these bespoke legal handbooks were commissioned or sometimes hand copied by trainee lawyers themselves in order to become their main reference works for their careers as well as for their training. And in these documents, the first page is almost inevitably Magna Carta, followed by the Charter of the Forest, and the articles on the charters instituted by Edward I to provide the specific remedies and processes for transgression of those two charters. And we can tell that these documents were not merely recorded out of historical interest because they don't tend to include the 1215 version, but the most up-to-date, most relevant clauses of the 1225 version prefaced by the inspeximous text of Edward I in 1297. That is, the we have looked at this and said that it is good. And that's the kind of document that you can see outside today. We also know from the records of moot courts and class debates and lectures of the time that by the mid 14th century, legal students were routinely being required to comment on and discuss the interpretation of specific clauses. And what this tells us, apart from reinforcing the notion that lawyers are the ones that really understood Magna Carta in the Middle Ages, is that they clearly considered it important enough and worthwhile to spend that time, those resources and that effort, obtaining a physical copy of the document, subjecting it to close examination and interrogation. And so in closing, given that both the legal fraternity and the English public at large have now been established as regarding Magna Carta as important in their albeit different ways, what can we say about the outcome of this widespread trust and reliance in the Charter? whether it be in general or specific significance in the Middle Ages. Well, as in the example of the Kerrigan family with which I began, cases that rested on Magna Carta did not automatically succeed. In fact, evidence shows that the Crown and its officials were just as capable as other medieval English people, if not more so, at manipulating the clause and the tenor of the Charter to their own ends. And in most of the petitions that I've mentioned today, the contemporary annotation indicates that the immediate outcome was some variation on this needs more investigation, or we can't do this, or it must be delayed, or it needs to be heard in another court, sometimes even because it is against Magna Carta. So, as we've seen in medieval times, just as now, appeals to the vibe, to the rightness of the thing, were powerful ways of thinking about and talking publicly about justice, about the rule of law. 
but they were not normally enough on their own to clinch the case. We may be forced to conclude overall that even in the Middle Ages, when people encountered Magna Carta, what they found was that it was a very powerful tool as legal language, but not always equally effective in law. Thank you. Another fabulous contribution. Thank you very much, Kathleen. We'll move on quickly to our second panel member, Professor Andrew Lynch. Andrew is a professor in English and Cultural Studies at the University of Western Australia and director of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for the History of Emotions. This year he has published Understanding Emotions in Early Europe, which he's co-edited with Michael Champion, and Emotions and War, Medieval to Romantic, literature co-edited with Stephanie Downs and Katrina O'Loughlin. So I'd now like you to welcome Professor Andrew Lynch to be our second contributor to this panel discussion. Thank you very much. At this stage of a conference, I feel I should say, stop me if you've heard this one, because I've been listening to some of my um, fine lines being taken by other people. But, um, I'm talking about Magna Carta, the view from popular culture. And I'll start with um, a book you may know. In 1930, Seller and Yatman made the definitive statement in 1066 and all that, that history is not what you thought, it is what you can remember. So my, my talk is about what have, some of what has been popularly remembered and forgotten about Magna Carta over eight centuries and how popular culture has shaped its significance. I've divided this material under four headings. Doesn't seem to work. Oh, here we are, good. A brave new beginning, a people's charter, never forgotten, and a good thing from a bad king. So. Magna Carta is a brave new start. Um, we're often told, and we had many quotes today from the true believers, that Magna Carta was a startlingly original document, the, the end of royal absolutism, the beginning of modern rights and liberties. But of course, Magna Carta was in some ways already consciously old when it began, because it owed a lot to older forms of popular belief and shared cultural memory. And as you've heard, that's not surprising because it comes from a time when very few outside uh, trained clergy could read official documents in Latin, including the barons who had the greatest interest in them. To be widely effective documents, and they were becoming very important in this period, as the number of charters we've seen testifies, documents still needed um, the support of public rituals, like that very memorable event at Runnymede. And you might say that in a sense, Magna Carta still does need these constant reenactments to keep it in the popular mind. It's a very reenacted and replayed event. Also, they needed the support of shared popular beliefs about the way things ought to be. Um, the written document drew some of its strength from a popular myth that you've heard mentioned, which was that England had been better off in the past, in the days of Henry I, and before that, in the far off time of King Edward the Confessor, who died in 1066 and was by the time of Magna Carta already a canonized saint and renowned as a great lawgiver. Um, in cultural memory, the so-called laws of King Edward loomed very large. In reality, these were a mid 12th century um, compilation, but they were associated with an imagined golden age, um, the immediate pre-conquest period of 1052 to 1065 which even the modern dictionary of national biography calls an oasis of peace and prosperity. The prelude to these laws tells a story of a previous occasion. It says, four years after the conquest in 1070, William I, on the advice of his barons, had these laws written down under oath. They were taken under oath from 12 Anglo-Saxon men, survivors from each shire. There's no evidence for that actually happening, but it indicates a shared belief that good laws come from a legendary king accepting the counsel of his barons and listening to popular tradition. Um, and that, that is exactly, I think, what Magna Carta has been represented as in, in later years. And it seems to have been operative at the time. According to the chronicler Roger of Wendover, 
when the barons met secretly late in 1214 to work out what they were going to do about King John, they discussed the Charter of Liberties granted by Henry I at his coronation 100 years before, in 1100, which promised to restore the laws of King Edward the Confessor. So to be conceivable, Magna Carta needed um, a long pedigree of that kind. It didn't represent itself as a totally new start. If it had, that would have been very damaging to its status in, in medieval eyes. It had to be seen as restoring the ancient and customary ways to which it frequently refers, while removing um, abuses, evil customs that has seen as having um, crept in since the good old days. And that view um, became standard in the later medieval period. Perhaps the most popular history of the later Middle Ages is the, the chronicle known as the Brute, the Prose Brute, of which 181 manuscripts still survive. So that, that gives you an idea of, um, oops, that's a charter of Henry I. Gives, gives you the idea of um, how popular it is. And it attributes all John, John's problems with the barons to his breaking an age-old tradition. A great dispute began between King John and the Lords of England because he would not respect and uphold the laws which Sir Edward had ordained, which had been in use and upheld up to the time that he had broken them. And it adds that after John's death, this is the 15th century version, Henry III and the Archbishop and Earls and Barons gathered at London, the next Michaelmas, and King Henry confirmed by his charter all the liberties that King John had granted at Runnymede, and they are still current throughout England. So a sense of um, the torch being passed on from the Anglo-Saxon period and then um, renewed uh, by Magna Carta and still current throughout England in something that's apparently written between 1400 and 1450, that manuscript. So although Magna Carta wasn't presented as a novelty in its own time, the popular image has persisted for a long time of an ancient legacy which is still current and operative throughout England and now beyond it in the present day. Um, Claire Bray, the curator of the British Library's wonderful exhibition this year, was rung up by a man asking if Magna Carta could get him off his traffic fines. And uh, some of you may remember Hancock's half hour and Tony Hancock's impassioned plea to the jury. What about Magna Carta? Did she die in vain? <laughs> <laughs> My second point, Magna Carta was a people's charter. Um, as, as you've heard, it, it wasn't invented as a people's charter. It was won by baronial and church coercion at a critical stage in a complex struggle between the king, his barons, the English church, the papacy, and the crown of France. It, it, it didn't have any input from the great mass of the population at the time. But historians tell us that it did have an effect in moderating the future financial demands of kings, and it gave people a, a yardstick. It created a kind of popular yardstick for measuring royal actions, as we've just heard from Kathleen. And subsequent translations and publicising of the terms of a charter put into wide circulation the view that the king was not above the law, as we heard from, say, Fortescue's comments on, in, in the 15th century on the difference between England and France. So I think these, these factors all lie behind the, the long-term and persistent popular belief that Magna Carta at the time was a charter for the people and has remained so ever since. And that's taken many forms in the, in the period. So one of them is, you've heard a lot about, Edward Cook and his struggles with James I. Um, he got the sack, he was put in the tower um, for, for his attitudes. Um, a second version is the deliberate association of later progressive political views with Magna Carta. Here's the radical John Wilkes, pictured in 1770, referred to as the uh, defender of his country's rights in the script below, um, holding Magna Carta and trying to look as if he's just written it, I think, <laughs> um, sort of taking it over. And then the Reform Acts of 1830 were, were publicised, published as um, the Great Charter, the three reform bills. And of course, in, in 1839, um, 
the, the start of the Chartist movement had the People's Charter. And by the way, that, um, that illustration at the top is a, is a secret ballot voting machine, which uh, was one of, the, one of the things that they were proposing, and which uh, we realised uh, before the English did, as, uh, as you heard. And of course, the point about the People's Charter is quite interesting in that it's, um, it's suggesting we need a real People's Charter, we need a Magna Carta for the present day, because Parliament isn't doing its job, Parliament isn't representing the people properly. And the, the most extreme version, the, the third version of the Magna Carta as a People's Charter, is to represent it as actually having emanated from the people in 1215. And a version of that is in the film Robin Hood, directed by Ridley Scott from 2010, starring Russell Crowe. And you can see there that um, Robin says, if your majesty would all have justice, justice in the form of a charter of liberties, allowing every man to forage for his hearth, to be safe for conviction without cause or prison without charge, to work, eat and live on the sweat of his own brow, then that king would be great. What we would ask your majesty is liberty, liberty by law. And we're told, in fact, that this charter, um, there's been a charter written by Robin's father, um, who was a stonemason and Robert of Loxley in the in the film is actually a plain archer um, disguising himself as a member of the baronage. John pretends to agree, but he betrays his word to Robin, just as King Richard has betrayed um, Robin before. So at the film's end, the dream of a people's contract with monarchy is dead, and Robin goes off to an outlaw socialist collective in the forest. <laughs> is a suggestion that Magna Carta would um, realise Robin's hopes in a few years, um, or is the suggestion that no, that the people will never receive uh, goodies from on high, but they will have to fight for them. And if you look at the picture of Wilkes there, you can see behind an image of um, Hercules with his club fighting the Hydra, the many-headed monster, suggesting, I think, that, you know, that the champion of the people has to fight power you can't just expect the king to grant power to you. It won't work. And my, next, my next point is that Magna Carta has never been forgotten. Um, and we heard that that architectural metaphor is so often used of Magna Carta being the foundation, which is clearly a historic. It's also called the fountainhead of freedom, which implies a stream continuously flowing from it to the present day. In fact, I'd say the popular view of Magna Carta depends upon people forgetting most of the things about it. Um, no, nobody talks about Magna Carta's and its provision, for example, about um, debts owed to the Jews and, and what, you would, what would happen at that time. It's not the sort of thing people want to remember. After all, the, the 13th century was a time, or 12th and 13th century was a time of appalling pogroms against um, the Jews in England, the invention of uh, the first so-called blood libel, the story of Jewish uh, ritual sacrifice of a young boy, and the, of course under um, Edward I, the expulsion of the Jews from England. So that's not the sort of thing people want to associate with Magna Carta. They've completely buried that, as far as I know. And the most radical thing in Magna Carta at the time was the committee of 25 barons to oversee Prince John and do him harm if he didn't live up to the terms of the charter. Um, to distrain upon and assail us in every way possible with the support of the whole community of the land, except he adds upon his person and that of his family. So he's making that distinction between himself as monarch and himself as person. John bound himself by those terms, he clearly had no intention of keeping them, uh, to um, give over his sovereignty as king. But of course, when that charter was reissued by Henry III and later on, all of that went by the board though that was really the radical uh, thing about Magna Carta, the, the situational thing. Secondly, um, Magna Carta now stands unrivaled as what is popularly remembered about the reign of King John. And I think, apart from Robin Hood, who is mythical, um, I can't think anything else would rival it. But that's not always been the case, at least up to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, in the 16th century, in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, I think John was probably better known outside legal circles for his troubled relationship with Pope Innocent III. England was placed under a papal interdict from 1208 to 1214, 
John was excommunicated in 1209. Apparently he made so much money from this situation by keeping the revenues of vacant bishoprics that had quite suited him for a long time because he was amassing a stockpile of money in order to try and win his French lands back. But eventually, as a strategic move to get the Pope back on his side, um, he surrendered the crown to the papal legate, Pandolf, in 1213 and formally did homage to the Pope for it. And I've got a, an image from a much later text. Uh, with the promise of a thousand marks per annum and restitution to the church, which he very soon stopped paying. And this is probably a good idea at the time, but it became notorious in later centuries. So any enemy of the Pope was a friend to early Protestant writers like John Bale in the play King Johann in 1540. This is at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries. Henry VIII has made himself supreme head of the church in England. And in Bale's play, uh, John is a hero. He bravely defies the Roman church, which he calls the captivity of whorish Babylon. Um, Bale tells us that John has been maligned by the Italian-born Tudor historian uh, Polydor Virgil, the damn foreigner. And he says, uh, King John was a man both valiant and godly. What though Polydorus reported him very ill at the suggestions of the malicious clergy, think you a Roman with the Romans cannot lie? Magna Carta doesn't get mentioned here. He doesn't feature in popular history plays of a later 16th century. Shakespeare's King John, for example, around 1596, didn't mention it, though we know Shakespeare knew of it from Hollinshed's Chronicle. The hot topics in Shakespeare are the anti-papal theme, the untrustworthiness of the French, which is always a good one, and the, the military greatness of a united England. The John is a bad character, but the real villain is Pandolf, the manipulative papal legate. And John gets some good lines um, defying him. No Italian priest shall tithe or toll in our dominions, but as we under heaven are supreme head, so under him that great supremacy where we do reign, we will alone uphold without the assistance of a mortal hand. And it's interesting that contemporary portrait by Elstrak there, by far the most regal and lofty image of King John that I've come across. Um, John's denying the Pope's right or anyone's right to question or judge his actions except God. So these, are, these look like crowd-pleasing sentiments in 1596, but their tendency is not at all towards popular restraint on the monarch's power. Um, Magna Carta would have seemed out of place in this context, I think. Rather, the, the, the emphasis is on um, monarchical power. Anti-Catholic anti sentiments um, also made King John popular in later periods, that is Shakespeare's play. When it was staged by McCready at Drury Lane in the mid-19th century, um, Catholic emancipation in 1838 and the restoration of the Catholic hierarchy in 1850 were hot topics. And as McCready, McCready reports, part of the audience came to the play not to see it, but to act themselves in a foolish demonstration of hostility of papistry. So John was cheered, the cardinal was hissed. They turned it into a kind of pantomime. And when Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree staged it in 1899, and you can see how incredibly lavish this production was. 170,000 people are believed to have seen um, this, this production. He put in this tableau of Magna Carta. Um, of course, it's not in Shakespeare's play. Um, but at the time, which is the beginning of the Second Boer War, I think it was only six weeks old, the real relevance of the play, as noted at the time, was a uh, call to national unity and patriotism. On the first night, a reviewer noted um, heads turned to where the colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain, was sitting at these concluding lines. This England never did nor never shall lie at the proud foot of a conqueror. Come the three corners of the world in arms and we shall shock them. Naught shall make us rue if England to itself do rest but true. And this interests me because I think it shows a way in which the pride of England in Magna Carta as a champion of or a, a model of British freedom can easily degenerate into a kind of jingoism. We're free, you're not, we're better. Uh, and some of the quotes um, from the true believers have a little bit of um, that about them, I think. 
So Magna Carta is never fully forgotten, but under the pressure of war and civil unrest, uh, its importance can be played down in the popular mind. Lastly, Magna Carta is a good thing from a bad king. And if you remember 1066 and all that, it contains a certain number of good things and five bad kings. And chapter 16 is headed King John, an awful king. And the two judgments, I think, um, go together. Uh, Magna Carta is an occasion of fun. Uh, Magna Carta is, is fun. And it's fun because it gives people the opportunity to enjoy the nastiness and rage of King John, secure in the knowledge that he's going to get his. Um, King John has a, a long tradition in popular history as an absurd, absurdly angry figure, a pantomime villain. I think a bit of Daffy Duck, actually. <laughs> so, this is Holinshed in 1577. The king, having condescended to make such grant of liberties far contrary to his mind, was right sorrowful in his heart, cursed his mother that bare him, the hour that he was born, and the paps that gave him suck, wishing that he had received death by violence of sword or knife instead of natural nourishment. He wetted his teeth, he did bite now on one staff and now on another as he walked, and oft break the same in pieces when he had done. Henrietta Marshall in Our Island Story, David Cameron's favourite childhood book, apparently, um, when the meeting was over and John went back to his palace, his anger was terrible. He threw himself on the floor, foaming with passion. He cursed the barons and the people with terrible curses. He tore and bit the rushes with which the floor was covered. He gnashed his teeth, growling and snarling like a wild animal mad with rage. I find this very enjoyable. And <laughs> <laughs> from 1969, the ladybird King John and Magna Carta book, which has been reissued this year and you can buy it with all the exhibitions. The king sat biting his nails in sullen fury. We were told that this was a bad habit which he had acquired as a boy and never lost. If, if it had been his only bad habit, he would not have been in the situation in which he now found himself. I like that sort of moralizing suggestion. That John, is, John is a naughty boy and that comes across. Um, and also his unfitness for um, his unfitness for rule has a long history in his problem with ill-fitting accessories. So, Matthew Paris in the Chronicle of St Albans, mid 13th century, shows the crown slipping from his head. Um, and the, the Walt Disney film um, picked up on this and also gave it a kind of a, a Freudian um, connection. The crown's too big. And of course, John was the pet child of Eleanor of Aquitaine. And um, that comes out quite strongly in a number of texts about him. John Newbery in A New History of England in 1763 pictured him with his sword behind him to indicate a cowardice and unmanliness and with his royal mantle too big for him, trailing on the ground because he wasn't big enough to wear it. It's as if the mantle of Richard I could never be worn by, by, by John. And there you see um, two images from the Robin Hood film of 2010. I think the helmet absurdly too big for John in that top picture and the, the picture at the bottom, dare I say, reminiscent of Blackadder, <laughs> or even Mr. Bean. So we laugh at King John, and I think taking pleasure in his discomfort has a political point. The king's power is in inverse proportion to his maniacal claim to dominance. The fun of despising John uh, provides a comedic victory of the people over the monarch. Um, a kind of affirmation that executive power is accountable to public opinion. And laughter at King John um, by the audience unites the people as a people. It sort of creates a oneness in those who, who look on and laugh or despise. Now, the, the politics of that comedy are a bit questionable and ambivalent, perhaps, because other people really all made a people just by the fact that King John was a bad king. And depending on your views, John can be taken as an example of the vileness of all monarchy, or as a monarch so totally bad that he exonerates the rest by comparison. There's never been another King John. Nobody ever wants um, to be like him. Whichever way, I think the horrible history of King John remains vital in giving Magna Carta its present status as a good thing from which everybody else continues to benefit. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Andrew. That, that was all new to, to me. That was no crossover whatsoever. And I think the, all the papers today have been um, very skillful in weaving uh, amongst each other and, and um, not duplicating any of the material. Our final speaker today is Dr. David Heaton. David's a visiting fellow in the Research School of Arts and Humanities at the Australian National <coughs> University and a parliamentary library associate. As a cultural historian, he was formerly director of the Centre for Australian Cultural Studies in Canberra, cultural advisor to the National Capital Authority, history and heritage advisor for the centenary of Canberra. So I wonder if we are going to hear about Magna Carta and Canberra. <laughs> Not sure, but please welcome Dr. David Heaton. Thanks, Rosemary. And yes, we are going to hear about Magna Carta and, uh, and Canberra. Can I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting, and I acknowledge uh, their elders past and present. Uh, alas, what I can't do is avoid repetition, uh, but there will only be a couple of moments. So I was hoping that Martin hadn't, have, hadn't uh, distributed the uh, true believers and skeptics, uh, skeptics quotes. Uh, there are a couple, but they are only of the very minor variety. When the clerk of the Senate invited me to present a paper at this symposium for the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, I was flattered to be included, genuinely flattered, uh, in such a distinguished lineup of speakers, but also a little apprehensive about the subject itself. 13th century England and the so-called Great Charter are just two of many notable absences in my CV. I was conscious as well of Lord Jonathan Sumptions, and I will refer to him a few times early, abrupt opening sentence we did hear it this morning in his speech in March this year to the Friends of the British Museum when he remarked that it is impossible to say anything new about Magna Carta unless you do say something mad. And yet despite this cautionary observation from one so well qualified to shape one's thinking about the famed charter, when I found myself slotted into this session with Kathleen and uh, Andrew, the brief from Rosemary being personal encounters, popular culture and Australian links, a few possibilities crystallised and uh, I'm confident that none of them are particularly loopy. So let me begin with the personal encounter and work my way into popular culture, political culture, ever so briefly, the history of constitutionalism and finally Magna Carta's Australian links, its Australian story. Because it's a story which continues to have new and perhaps abrasive chapters added to it right up to the present day, the present minute. First then, the personal encounter. When the host of interstate federal politicians occupying this superb Aldo Jurgler building that we are meeting in, take the opportunity to seek out the cultural fabric of their, of our, capital city during sitting period downtime, I know that some, not nearly enough, but some, head down the grassy hill of the National Mall on foot, past the old Parliament House and into the symbolic heart of the Parliamentary Triangle. There is much to take in, aesthetic, historic and symbolic. One side of cultural significance on the western side of the triangle, the Commonwealth Avenue, Commonwealth Bridge side, for those of you uh, who don't know too much about Canberra, is Magna Carta Place, with its distinctive low bronze dome. From the year 2000 to 2007, as Rosary mentioned, I had the privilege of working for the National Capital Authority as its cultural advisor. One of the first major projects with which I had direct involvement was the Magna Carta Place competition. First conceived in 1995, worked up into a proposal submitted to the NCA by the Australia Britain Society in late 1996 as that group's centenary of federation project. An international competition was eventually announced in August of 1999 with a rather flash 23-page booklet, and then some two years after that, the competition run and won, and construction complete, the opening of the monument at Magna Carta Place, appropriately on Langton Crescent in Parks, by the then Prime Minister John Howard on the 26th of September 2001. My personal involvement with the project concerned the preparation of the text 
for the accompanying six bronze panels and the choice of visual material. Now, as national capital realists in this audience are aware, a substantial project on this scale was only ever going to get legs if it had a sponsoring private organisation willing to provide additional financial support to match the Commonwealth's contribution. And that group, the Australia Britain Society, did assert itself confidently in the whole process, led by its president, I'm sure she's known to a number of people in this audience, led by its president, the formidable Mrs Marjorie Tabane, MBE OAM. Those selected to represent the society in discussions proved to be hands-on advocates. I feel it's fair to say that those same society representatives and Mrs Tabane would never want to be thought of as social and cultural progressives. Not surprisingly, our discussions concerning the textual visual material for the monument proved to be, in a word favoured by former Prime Minister Howard, robust indeed. In my role as cultural advisor and, I guess, in-house historian, I was determined to ensure that the history panels featured in the monument's attractive open space not only engaged with the Australian context, but made it the central narrative element. Canberra's Magna Carta commemoration was not going to be yet another ill-informed Great Charter hagiography exercise, um, a lazy birthday puff piece of the kind that has often been expressed throughout the Western world over the past few hundred years. And I'm pleased to record that the end result here in Canberra was an intelligent, scholarly and accessible set of text panels, the wording largely supplied by John Williams, these days Professor John Williams, the Dean of Law at the University of Adelaide, with whom I did uh, two Melbourne University Press books some years ago, one, Makers of Miracles, the cast of the Federation story, and in close collaboration with a mutual dear friend, the late Dimfna Clark, uh, a, a, a volume called The Ideal of Alexis de Tocqueville, which was a first publication, a jointly edited publication, of Manning Clark's, the only piece of, uh, substantial piece of writing of Manning's that had never been published, and that was his 19, uh, 1940s, I think 1944 for memory, thesis on Tocqueville. The big fella, John Williams, I knew was the right choice for the Magna Carta Canberra job, and he did his work with the dedication that I expected. The only hitch in the process that I can recall concerned the reproduction of an image of Tasmanian Supreme Court Judge Andrew Inglis Clark, now recognised as the primary author of the Australian Constitution. And the Republican bits got pulled. The representative of the Australia Britain Society with whom I was dealing objected to Inglis Clark's image being used at all, having found out belatedly that he was, shock and horror, a Republican, the R word. The ensuing discussion of the stated objection was polite but firm, and I'm pleased to say that it concluded with Clark taking his place amidst the splendid Magna Carta collage of relevant images on the monument's east-facing wall. If you haven't seen the site yet, uh, it's definitely worth a visit and, of course, straight down the road. I should also place on the record, perhaps as a code to the whole experience, that the actual text for the six panels produced no substantive disagreements at all. Uh, I was at the time very pleasantly surprised. Before moving on to the text of the various panels and the related speeches and written material that accompanied the September 2001 monument opening, I need to establish first a wider context with a quick summary of Magna Carta's global reception over eight centuries. Now, don't balk, don't worry, Rosemary. Uh, it will be very brief. Um, uh, and of course, you've heard so much today. In providing this context though, and it sets up for what I'm gonna say, um, I intend to rely on the deliberations of two experts of recent decades. Britain's Lord Sumption, whom I quoted at the outset and, and from whom you've heard from various speakers today, and the Senate's own Harry Evans, who also got a mention, the late Harry Evans, Rosemary's predecessor, a fine historian who was never afraid to take on the politicians when they tried to exaggerate their importance, that's often, uh, nor was he reluctant to go public on matters of principle uh, and concern. In, his, uh, in the recent British Museum speech, Jonathan Sumption summarises Magna Carta's historic reception with characteristic bluntness. Like many commentators over the last hundreds of years, he enlarges on two contrasting schools of thought, a version basically of Martin this morning. 
Firstly, the lawyer's view, Magna Carta as, Assumption's words, a major constitutional document, the foundation of law and liberty of the subject in England a view adhered to by historians up to about the time of Australian Federation, in world terms, the turn of the 19th, 20th century. A view, view which became emboldened over time as it developed, we've heard a bit about that today, much about it, into the myth of Magna Carta and made an important contribution, uh, that was mentioned in a throwaway as well, to the entrenchment of British um, Empire exceptionalism uh, during its expansion period. And secondly, what Sumption discusses as the historian's view, first articulated in numbers in the early years of the 20th century, a view which has, as he says, tended to emphasise the self-interested motives of the barons and has generally been sceptical about the Charter's constitutional significance. You've heard quite a bit today. Until the 20th century, most commentators were perfectly content to ratify the myth. First and famously promoted, we've heard his name, his name many times, by Sir Edward Cook, with his gaze firmly on charters, statutes and yearbooks, and embraced with enthusiasm by, amongst others, the early American colonists, and developed with zeal by their revolutionary descendants. Cook's narrow emphasis on legal sources, with no regard for cultural context, would eventually be challenged when English historians, for example, such as Oxford academic Edward Jenks in 1904, and soon after the likes of W.S. McKechnie and Morris Poick, exposed an array of Magna Carta misconceptions. The Great Charter was confirmed as a deeply conservative, dated document. You've heard that many times today. As Sumption summarises, I love this bit of the writing, or at least the talk, where Magna Carta is concerned, there are no high-flown declarations of principle. No truths are held to be self-evident. Indeed, there are hardly any provisions that can be called constitutional at all. Magna Carta, he concludes, guarantees very little. Though he makes no attempt to emphasise the point in his long British Museum speech, Lord Sumption does pro pro propose um, what I think is a distinct third school of thought um, uh, about which we have heard uh, a, a bit variously today. Those who acknowledge that Magna Carta matters all right, but not, as Sumption puts it, for the reasons commonly put forward, some doc documents are less important for what they say than for what people wrongly think they say. Some legislation has a symbolic significance quite distinct from any principle which it actually enacts. Thus it is with Magna Carta. Canvassing the same broad issues as Sumption, yet coming at them in a wholly different way, Harry Evans, in an excellent paper entitled Bad King John and the Australian Constitution, presented in the Australian Senate's occasional lecture series in 1997 in the book, of course, as we know, and he expands on the myth-making school, which, as he points out, perhaps reached a crescendo of intensity in the 18th and 19th centuries when the Charter was routinely referred to as the Palladium of English-British liberty. Harry can't resist instancing perhaps the most famous, uh, the most renowned sceptic, Oliver Cromwell, a frustrated Oliver Cromwell, who he informs us was, in Harry's words, very rude about Magna Carta. Well, of course, you've got the actual words you heard them earlier today. I wanted to say Magna Carta in the parliament, but uh, uh, I was, I was gazumped. More purposefully, Evans also maintains that Magna Carta's ultimate significance is not dependent on its content. And it is this line of inquiry, the third school of thought, if you like, that I intend to follow for the rest of this paper within a, an Australian context. Harry Evans concentrates his attention exclusively on the Charter and Covenant traditions, keen to explain the explicit combination of these two traditions in the Australian example. What I wish to explore are just some of the fascinating ways in which Magna Carta has been applied in the unique Australian setting past and right up to the present. Magna Carta surfaced as a reference point on a number of occasions, you heard a bit about that earlier, in the 19th century. Among them in 1848, when Henry Park's Constitutional Association took root. The following year, 1849, as the anti-transportation debates in New South Wales flared up. In 1853-54, as W.C. Wentworth tried on the idea of a hereditary New South Wales upper house, a sort of homegrown house of lords. And of course, in the 1890s Federation debates. But easily the most creative, and thank heavens he didn't get a mention this morning uh, or earlier, the most creative 19th century example of the Charter's application to an Australian setting 
and the most celebrated, certainly in literary circles, has to be Eureka, the short-lived rebellion that reached its tragic conclusion in Ballarat in the early hours of a Sunday morning on the 3rd of December, 1854. A quick plug, the Federation Press, which I know publishes heaps of law books, charges 200 bucks a time, uh, is doing Eureka, uh, a book called Eureka, Australia's Greatest Story, intentionally iconoclastic, and that will be launched uh, by the Eureka's Children Group uh, here in Canberra on the 3rd of December coming up. That's providing everything goes smoothly. I'll be reading the proofs this weekend. Keep your eye out for that. With this educated audience, I'm taking it as a given that you are all familiar with Eureka's basic narrative detail. So I'll move straight to the invocation of Magna Carta, or if you like, the most notable invocation, and that by an American, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, who visited our shores in 1895 as part of a world tour that he turned into a memorable work of nonfiction called Following the Equator, it came out in 1897. The book is chock-a-block full of acute observations. But where Australia is concerned, and it's of course worldwide uh, observations, where Australia is concerned, Twain excelled himself with so many genuinely perceptive remarks on subjects as diverse as Aboriginal law. Australian writers such as Clark, Kendall, Balderwood and Gordon, black-white relations, kookaburras, dingoes, and the Melbourne Cup. And remember, he visited in 1895 when he described Cup Day as, quote, the Australasian National Day. It would be difficult, Twain wrote, to overstate its importance, 1895. As he wrote, it overshadows all other holidays and specialised days of whatever sort in that conjuries of colonies. Overshadows them? I would almost say it blots them out. Cup Day and Cup Day only commands an attention, an interest and an enthusiasm which is universal. Cup Day is supreme. I can call to mind no specialised annual day in any country, and he, and he thinks of, 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 of uh, the Nash America's uh, Fourth of July as well, in any country, including my own, whose approach fires the whole land with a conflagration of conversation, and preparation and anticipation and jubilation. No one saved this one, but this one does it. Well, with the Melbourne Cup, what, four days away, uh, I thought a passing reference since my brief was Australian Lynx uh, to the Melbourne Cup wouldn't go astray. And just in case you're interested, a horse called Auraria won the 1895 Cup over a horse called Hover by a neck, uh, and Auraria was South Australian bred. Despite spending only months in Australia, Twain understood the subtle nuances of Australian history for which he provided this classic description. Australian history is almost always picturesque. Indeed, it is so curious and strange that it is itself the chiefest novelty the country has to offer, and so it pushes the other novelties into second and third place. It does not read like history, but like the most beautiful lies and all of a fresh new sort, no mouldy old stale ones. It is full of surprises and adventures and incongruities and contradictions and incredibilities, but they are all true. They all happened. The ANU's Dean of Arts historian Paul Pickering in a chapter in the Eureka book I just mentioned, discusses the 1850s mood in Ballarat and after the Eureka Rebellion, the mood among liberals in England, a mood which, pr which prompted a number of individuals in both countries to discuss the events before the murderous assault and after with the myth of the Great Charter firmly in mind. As Pickering writes, Magna Carta itself could be pressed into service in defence of lawful rebellion. In the 1890s, Twain couldn't resist the link as he soared into another reverie of high excitement at the prospect of having discovered another America in the South. I wrote a thesis on this way back when, and Twain was one of many, many, many uh, who were looking for that, but certainly Twain was one of them. Eureka, he writes, was simply the finest thing in Australasian history. It was a revolution, small in size, but great politically. It was a strike for liberty, a struggle for a principle, a stand against injustice and oppression. It was, Twain writes, hence bringing him into this talk, the Barons and John over again. 
It was Hampton and ship money. It was Concord and Lexington. Small beginnings, all of them. But all of them great in political results. All of them epoch making. Fast forward exactly 100 years to the year after the publication of Following the Equator to Magna Park Carter Place, Canberra, on the 12th of October, my birthday, 1997, as the Honourable Sir Gerard Brennan delivers an address at the naming ceremony, the naming ceremony for Magna Carta Place, some four years before the finished product opened to the public. While first providing his audience with an obligatory history lesson on Magna Carta, Chief Justice Brennan made his own thoughts very clear. The original text itself, he said, was seriously dated. What was far more important was what he called the beneficial misinterpretations with which from age to age the text has been invested. Brennan asserted that Magna Carta today was a traditional mandate for trial by jury, equal and incorrupt justice for all, no arbitrary imprisonment and no taxes without Parliament's approval. But it is his conclusion that resonates in, for me, an uncomfortable way in 2015. Justice Brennan said, above all, Magna Carta has lived in the hearts and minds of our people, the Australian people. It is an incantation of the spirit of liberty. I believe that's in Martin's list. Whatever its text or meaning, it has become the talisman of a society in which tolerance and democracy reside, a society in which power and privilege do not produce tyranny and oppression. It matters not that this is the myth of Magna Carta, for the myth is the reality that continues to infuse the deepest aspirations of the Australian people. Those aspirations are our surest guarantee of a free and confident society. John Williams' well-chosen words for the monument panels, while not quite matching the eloquence of Chief Justice Brennan, nonetheless assert the same argument. He describes Magna Carta as the people's touchstone, an enduring legacy of humanity's determination to protect fundamental human rights and human dignity. I will return to that in a moment. Brennan and Williams are on the same moral and ethical page. Prime Minister Howard, former Prime Minister Howard now, spoke at the September 2001 opening, contributing to what I consider to be a milestone moment in the history of the Great Charter and its unfolding Australian story. Mr Howard spoke a bare 15 days after 9-11. As one might expect, he made reference to the assault by the terrorists, as he said, on those principles and those freedoms that the Australian and British peoples uh, have always stood for, including freedom from arbitrary arrest, opposition to detention without trial, and the right of all people charged with crimes to be judged by their peers according to the evidence available. Now, the day before the monument opening in 2001, former Canberra Times editor Ian Matthews had a piece under his own byline in the Canberra Times headed, The Betrayal of a cornerstone of justice and fairness. In the article, intentionally placed to anticipate the con content of the Prime Minister's Magna Carta address the next day, Matthews took prime the Prime Minister to task as someone actively eroding the ethos of Magna Carta. And he cited recent migration laws then, the Tampa case, and what he, Matthews, described as the Prime Minister's determination to acquire more power for the executive. And that, of course, at the, well, as he wrote, at the expense of judicial review through court action. Matthews quotes approvingly the Tampa judgment of Federal Court Justice Anthony North, including the judge's specific reference to Magna Carta and several references to ancient rights. Matthews, too, enlists Magna Carta for his own argument in, in, in the article, accusing the Howard government and the cowering Labor opposition at the time of a betrayal of Magna Carta's principles. Matthews encapsulates um, his understanding of Magna Carta in what I find to be one utterly compelling sentence. What distinguishes Magna Carta as a document of worth is its attempt to set down the parameters of fairness. For Matthews in 2001, both sides of Parliament had failed the test of fairness. 
In the 14 years since the Magna Carta monument uh, opening in Canberra, neither the Coalition nor the Labor Party, our two major parties, each variously in government and in opposition, famously and infamously, has managed to pass this test where the treatment of refugees and related issues, one thinks of detention, etc., are concerned. Nor it must be said as a majority of Australians, if the polls are to be believed, if they're correct, and I suspect they are. During this period, fairness has not been one of the deepest aspirations of the Australian people. Our governments have failed the test. We have failed the fairness test. In my concluding remarks, I only have time to refer briefly to the truly disturbing catalogue of assaults on individual liberty and fundamental human rights in Australia post 9-11. As a hitherto tolerant community, a society that Chief Justice Brennan assessed with considerable pride in 1997, has given way to a society so poorly led by its elected federal representatives, where anxiety and fear have replaced confidence and compassion. As bad as the human rights record in Australia was in the decade following 9-11, a subject exhaustively documented in a succession of books and journal articles, the last two or three years, two or three years, have plumbed new depths. We have had a Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who stated that everyone has got to be on Team Australia, has got to put this country, its interests, its values and its people first. And, as he also said, you don't migrate to this country unless you want to join our team. In announcing the new Governor-General, Mr Abbott referred to Peter Cosgrove as Australia's cheerleader-in-chief. A hundred years ago, George Bernard Shaw, I think it was Shaw, caustically labelled patriotism as the last refuge of a scoundrel. And it's hard to argue with as we have observed Mr Abbott in office accuse the ABC of taking everyone's side but our own of dividing the world, in his words, into goodies and baddies, of parading and ultimately, surely humiliating the Director General of ASIO, Duncan Lewis, um, in a disgraceful terrorist briefing in front of the TV cameras that was nothing more than a, pro a propaganda exercise in the process degrading the important role of the organisation at a time when it can least afford it. We have witnessed Mr Abbott boisterously joining in the attack by his government on the Human Rights Commission President, Gillian Triggs. And just six months ago, following the publication of a report entitled Forgotten Children, commissioned by Professor Triggs on the subject of children in detention and the accompanying UN report by its special rapporteur on torture, Juan Mendez, the then Prime Minister accused Professor Triggs of a political stitch-up a term he appears to have lifted from Channel 9's footy show. When confronted by Mr Mendez's finding that Australia was violating the rights of asylum seekers on multiple human rights fronts, Mr Abbott stated that Australians are, his words exactly, sick of being lectured by the United Nations. Could our political life, our international reputation on human rights sink to a more debased level? Well, yes. On the watch of our present number one law officer, Attorney General George Brandis, from whom we heard by proxy this morning, we have endured the awful spectacle of the attorney having to back down on the rewrite to section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act after he stated infamously that people do have a right to be bigots, you know. People have the right to say things that other people would find insulting, offensive or bigoted. When the proposed 18C changes were publicly circulated, the government received over 5,000 submissions, some approximately three quarters of which were critical. New South Wales Government SC Arthur Moses wrote, with respect to the Attorney General for Australia, his statement is misconceived and plainly wrong. No wonder that Professor Dev Desmond Manderson, from whom you heard earlier, wrote an article in February this year entitled Unsigning the Magna Carta. Little wonder that Crispin Hull, in an article for the Fairfax Press in June this year, assessing the intense citizenship debate occurring, could write that, in the week of the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, the illiberal shabbiness of the whole idea is the most dispiriting thing. In the same month, Professor Triggs warned that there was, her words, 
a growing threat to democracy, with the government's move to expand ministerial powers that could be, that, that, that could be exercised with little or no judicial scrutiny. And a letter writer to the Canberra Times in August, August just gone, reacted with hostility to the Attorney General's proposed legislation intended to prevent ordinary members of the community from challenging the decisions of executive government. The letter ran under the heading, Reconfigured Principles of Rule of Law, if it argues, muzzle it. And yet, moving towards a conclusion, and yet maybe, just possibly, there are small signs of hope. When, race, when Australia's race commissioner, uh, Tim Soot from uh, Assan, responded to the quashing of the proposed 18C changes, he opted for the high road in his comments, noting that the undignified debate has united Australians in one sense. There has been an emphatic affirmation of our commitment to racial tolerance. And this is where I'd like to finish today. With a new Prime Minister, a population which, according to the polls, has gone from overtly pessimistic about the future in the first months of this year to an endorsement of the new Prime Minister, in part based on the fact that he has a clear vision for Australia's future. That's what we're reading. That vision must incorporate, must incorporate a rediscovery and a reassertion of the country's moral comp compass, its moral bearings, so that we never again have to listen to three-word slogans masquerading as government policy. I take it as a promising sign that the Attorney General's proposed legislation to remove conservationists' legal right to challenge environmental approvals for major developments has been delayed in the Senate, leastwise up till a few weeks ago. I take it as another promising sign that, as reported in the Canberra Times on the 27th of last month, the Australian delegation to the United Nations General Assembly in New York received a warm response to the power shift. According to the Canberra Times, doors that were recently firmly closed have mysteriously swung open. In the year of the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, let us hope that this metaphor, doors mysteriously swinging open, assumes real meaning in both the corridors of government and the homes and hearts of the Australian community. A final a footnote, if you like, and I bring us right up to date, the last 24 hours, or indeed only early this morning. If any of you are listening to ABC News, you would have heard that there is a, an international gathering in Paris uh, on climate uh, attended by the Prince of Wales. What you mightn't have heard, or perhaps you did, um, was that the French Minister for Ecology, Sustainable Development and Energy, one Ségolène Royal, looking firmly at the Prince of Wales, himself, of course, a great advocate uh, of the reality of climate change, and said that what we need is, in her words, a Magna Carta for the Earth. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much to all our speakers today. We've probably got less time left than we would had hoped because um, we had the idea of, of closing the session with, with questions and comments from the audience, including a, a number of um, perhaps personal stories from, from the audience in relation to their own encounters with, with Magna Carta. Um, and I, I wonder if we could perhaps start that off with... Um, our parliamentary librarian, Diane Herriot, who has a very interesting um, addition to uh, Professor Nicholas Vincent's um, paper in our booklet, Australia's Magna Carta, and in his translation of uh, the Magna Carta into modern English. And take it away, Diane Herriot. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, as, as Rosemary mentioned, I am the parliamentary librarian, which is um, a great honour and a great joy to me. But my first encounter with the Magna Carta was as a young student at the wonderfully named Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies at the um, University of Toronto, where as part of my exam prep, I prepared for my current role by trans transcribing and translating the um, um, 1215 and 1297 texts of the Magna Carta, driven, I must say, 
not by a passionate interest in the evolution of the rule of law, but by an equally passionate interest in the evolution of feudal taxation systems and customary dues, all of which are occasioned by the fact that my name, Harriet, is in fact the term for a medieval death duty. <laughs> And, and as I worked clause by clause through the two versions, or those two versions of the Magna Carta, I was struck by three things. One was how much had gone missing between 1215 and 1297 in terms of specific clauses addressing contemporary grievances. The second, um, the second issue was how little what was said in the Magna Carta was ever talked about by people who talked about the Magna Carta, who seemed to go much more with, as our learned speaker said, the vibe. And the third was that despite all the focus on the barons, the role of the church and the um, significance of the Magna Carta in the tussle between the papacy and the English crown was perhaps one of the more interesting stories. But all this was, of course, but an early preparation for my work earlier this year when I set about the task of indeed transcribing and retranslating the Parliament's own copy, the Magna Carta, to find to my delight that we'd missed two lines. <laughs> so I now have a legacy. Indeed, and, and you can't tell us, you can't stop without telling us what the two lines were about. <laughs> the two lines were, ironically, about the ability of, the inability of the king to continue to, um, to randomly attribute fines to churchmen. So it's stipulated that churchmen would suffer fines based on the degree of their delinquency and on their own personal wealth rather than upon the wealth of their benefice or their office. Thank you. And what, what a legacy that is, to find the, find the missing lines in Australia's Magna Carta. It, it could well be. Now, yes. <laughs> While I'm quite happy to put my parliamentary colleague on the spot, um, I, I do not, don't want to um, put the rest of the audience in that position. But if there is anybody who would like to come forward with, with a, a short story or, or, a, or indeed ask a, a question of any of our speakers here today, I'd invite you to do so if you'd like to come to the microphone. Yes, oh, hello. Uh, my name's Anthony Heiser. I'm the Vice President of the Canberra Fishermen's Club. Um, Everyone here enjoys a, uh, a public right to go fishing in all tidal waters in Australia except the Northern Territory, and uh, not many pastimes enjoy that legal status. Um, and I've, I've been interested in this topic since uh, my uni days, but my understanding is that this is all, that the Magna Carta has contributed uh, to the recognition of this right, and I've never quite put my finger on it, but I believe there's two things. There's a clause 33, which called for the removal of fish weirs, which were huge fish traps in the Thames and other waterways. Um, and then since the 13th century, judges and courts have written that the Magna Carta somehow stopped the king from granting private fisheries. But I can't find anywhere in the Magna Carta that actually says that. Well, there, there's yeah. a challenge, there's yeah. a challenge. There's certainly a vibe there, isn't there? Yes, but mm. uh, I think, um, and I've just sort of, while I was sort of waiting, I did some more reading, and it might have been that this, that uh, allowing people to fish in tidal waters was to ensure that they could meet their sort of religious needs of eating fish three, three and a half times a day a year. So, yeah. Very interesting. And Anthony, I believe you wrote an article this year for the Canberra Fishermen's Club on the Magna Carta right. and fishing yeah. rights. Yes, which I'm sure you could Google. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> Sir, would you like to come to the microphone? Just a couple of observations in how far I feel that we have deviated from the Magna Carta. And we'll start off with the pencil. No one will sell, no one deny or delay right of justice. Justice, unfortunately, as a result of, of um, of resource restraints is, is rationed. And uh, we're in a situation where we can have as much justice as we can afford. And uh, when we look at point one on the rule of law, 
all persons and organizations are subject to and accountable to the law. Well, it looks like our governments, as mentioned already, has no accountability to anybody as far as law is concerned, either, either national law or international law. And we look at the final three points and we see that all those points are completely overridden by the anti-terrorism legislation, that about 60 individual pieces of legislation altogether, which deprives people of their liberty and the right to habeas corpus. The only convergence I see with the, with the Magna Carta and the present day is that the warlords and the barons continue to exist in the form of the plutocrats on whose behalf and benefit the legislation is implemented these days. I think we'll take that as a comment, but um, <laughs> the, let, let me also stress the importance of organisations like the Rule of Law Institute of Australia and indeed the Australian Senate in acting as watchdogs on the exercise of executive and other power. Do we have any other contributions from the audience? Yes. I think this is going to be a good one. <laughs> I'm out of my depth, I'm sorry. I'm, um, <clears throat> my dad was the scientist who was um, responsible for preserving the Magna Carta and using, well, part of the team anyway, of preserving it using argon gas. And uh, my name's James and hello to everyone here and thank you for your very learned and um, amazing contributions to, to today. I'm very humbled, I don't have this knowledge, I don't have, I can remember about 1% of what I was taught at school concerning maths and science. So. I'm well and truly out of my depth, but I, I remember my dad and I remember the burden that he carried to do this job. And over a period of eight years, I believe, he was, um, he was very much involved um, as a one, on his own, really, to, to try and solve this problem and um, of preserving the, the document. He, um, he got to the point where it was completed um, after many years of working in science for CSIRO, his heart gave way, um, not terminally at that point, but he was certainly very ill and needed to retire from CSIRO. He'd carried many burdens throughout his life as a younger man too. His dad died when he was only, I think, 14, and he'd had a lot of responsibility to carry and shoulder um, throughout his life during the war years in England where things were pretty horrible and he was experiencing bombs raining down on him and various other horrible things going on. But he got to the point where, you know, he, he died last year and, you know, I see my dad as someone who had great faith and not in Magna Carta, not in the law, but he had faith in his risen saviour and his, his Messiah. Um, he knew Jesus personally and when he died, he has the hope and we had the hope of that eternal life which Jesus came to give us, each one of us. And I'm very thankful that God has given all of you special gifts and, and me too. And he loves us all. And I'm so thankful that we have that loving God who has given us everything and much more than the law, much more than the law. He's given us forgiveness for our sins and salvation. And I'm humbled to be able to just acknowledge that here in the House of, the House of Parliament and give thanks for a life that was lived, um, I believe, to um, a way that honoured God mostly. And I thank my dad for the example he gave me. Um, I believe also, my wife does, we're fervent believers that um, not in Magna Carta again. It's not about the law. It's about but, but the we law come of back love. To Magna Carta. Yes, but I'm very back. thankful for the law because I know that there are so many things that we have in Australia that um, the fence of the law has has pr helped to protect to some extent. But I'm always questioning what happens when we die and um, when the law no longer stands as such. Who preserves us? Who protects our soul? Uh, where, where do we go? These questions are big questions and they're not answered by the law. So I come to you all and I just humbly suggest that um, as the, the time clicks on, we don't know how long we have, but um, I hope and pray that you will have the peace and assurance of knowing that uh, Jesus is in control of all things. Thank and you. I give you thanks and, and uh, Rosemary for your 
opportunity to speak and also for everyone here who's patiently listened to me. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you to your father for all those years of work to make sure that our Magna Carta will be preserved for long beyond the time of any of, any of us. Um, at the New South Wales History Conference in, in May this year at the State Library in Sydney, I was also delighted that um, a person in the audience who stood up and said, well, my dad made the wooden case that Australia's Magna Carta is housed in. So we've been able to you know, identify um, not only some of the story of, of how Australia's Magna Carta came here, but also at a very practical level, uh, we've had translators, we've had people working hard to, to preserve the physical object. But I, I think also today at this conference, we've been able to demonstrate how scholarship and the um, study of so many people so many people think about Magna Carta and its principles that um, we have 800 years later uh, an enduring something, whether it's a document, whether it's a vibe, whether it's a set of ideas, whether it's an inspiration to this kind of society we all aspire to. So on that note, I'd like to thank you all so very much for coming today. I think we've, it's been a fabulous day with its many stimulating papers that um, I hope that we will have an opportunity to, to sit down later and, and read and, and savour. And to all of our, our presenters, speakers, thank you so much. It's been a, a really wonderful day. And to thank all of you, the audience, for making it a wonderful day. Thank you very much. <laughs>